Um, but I also teach a class called History of the Feminine Divine, uh, and we do uh, get into issues regarding South Asia and gender. But I want to make a disclaimer, I am no means an expert on this topic, um, but I do want to talk to you about some trends uh, and mention an author that we utilize in my classes. So now I'm going to bravely share my PowerPoint <laughs> with you uh, in hopes that this works. <laughs> So let's do the entire screen, okay, and is it doing okay? Stop sharing, okay. Yes, uh, Professor. Okay. We can. You can, you can see, okay, so let me just take one second more and I think I've got this right. Uh, Professor, to... I, I, I just uh, very humbly uh, would, would like to interrupt a bit because <laughs> I have my very esteemed colleague here who are also the <laughs> resource persons of the seminar. I have Professor, <laughs> I have Professor Nijhar Sharkar with me, who's uh, my colleague at the Department of English Raigunj University. And he is also an esteemed resource person today. So well, nice to meet you. Glad to meet you, ma'am. Yes. Have a nice day. It's good Thank morning. You. Calling you. From yeah, good evening. Yeah, it's it's late here, but I'm a night yeah. owl, so that's good. Here is good morning. Yes, good, good morning to you. <laughs> good night. Good evening. Okay. To, good to morning. Me. Good evening. Okay. Ma'am, all, all so, the best. Um, so thank you all again. So I'm just going to go ahead and read this. I don't know if the PowerPoint can be shared correctly, so I'm a little bit. You try. Concerned. You try. We are, we are looking into it. Uh, okay, so I'll just go ahead and talk then because um, I think it's a pretty interesting lecture even without it. It's more so you can read some of the poetry um, and things like that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get uh, started. Again, I'm no, my, by no means an expert, but I want to talk to you about some trends um, and some things that you probably know and some things maybe that we can learn together. Um, so the, until the last few decades, as I'm sure everyone in here knows, uh, we've seen this largely male-centric narrative, right, regarding Indian diaspora, um, and even in those experiences of um, Indian men in the diaspora, it's been very homogenous an experience. Um, and we know that these narratives do not take into account intersectionality, um, which is an idea coined in 1989 by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, um, which states discusses uh, oppressions of race, gender, and sexuality, uh, and nation are intersecting, right? And there are these mutually constructing systems of power. We can't talk about race without talking about gender. We can't talk about class without talking about gender, sexuality, race. All of these things are intertwining. So we see in this historiography, right, this change to, um, to try and include this intersectionality and these constructing systems of power. Um, so, feminist migration, um, who here, and I'm not even going to be able to see you raise your hand, but who in the room has heard of feminist migration studies is familiar with it? Pardon, ma'am? We didn't get you. Uh, I said, who in the room is familiar with feminist migration studies? Okay, okay. Is yes. anyone fam familiar here with feminist migration studies? Professor Churchill is asking. Anybody wants to take that? Okay, I don't think so. I th okay, <laughs> it great. would be nice so to. I'm excited. Yes, um, so I'm excited to talk to you about it um, in the context of what we talk about in the United States. Um, so, feminist migration studies sought and seeks to do uh, to study these how power structures are organized and then how they reorganize through forms of migration and diaspora. So, in the 1980s and the historiography in the United States there's this acknowledgement of women's experiences within migration, right? But it's focused largely on labor. Um, and one thing I really love about feminist migration research is this idea of geographic boundaries as socially constructed like gender. Um, so they see these similarities, right? That um, gender can be socially constructed, geographic boundaries can also be constructed. Um, but one thing I do like to say 
similarly to when I talk about gender being socially constructed, is that even though gender is constructed, there are real world consequences that are felt and experienced because of gender. And the same goes for borders, right, and boundaries. Um, they may be socially constructed. Um, as we have seen time and again, though, borders, boundaries, uh, nations have real world consequences and they can create these painful symptoms, you know, systems of oppression, right? So I think it's a really important thing to ponder that we can see these boundaries and constructions within gender, within the nation, within the household, the region, the body, et cetera, and how they're all laden with power. And that power uh, can be specific to various geopolitical regions, right? How that power is constructed. And a question that I want to ask um, and questions to ponder as we're looking at how these historiographies compare. Uh, and as I said, I've my research focuses on the Americas, right? So the United States, Latin America, for the most part. But I see a lot of similarities in uh, traditional discourse uh, and how it portrayed women of African descent um, and also how you know, older migration studies conceptualize, uh, especially Indian women in the diaspora. Um, so we have in the past this very um, limiting, narrow view, if we look at um, how the historiography portrayed enslaved women of African descent without much agency. Um, there was this idea in some historiography of slavery regarding the transatlantic slave trade uh, that the forced migration and movement of human beings uh, in the Atlantic slave trade was so traumatic that Africans, quote, forgot their culture. Well, we know this obviously isn't true, uh, and that women of African descent frequently subverted power relations and found ways to keep their existing culture alive uh, while integrating other aspects of new cultures. Um, so as we look then to more modern studies, uh, we see these complex dynamics of the diaspora and Indian women in the diaspora. And one important notion has been this holding on to culture, um, but obvious also configuring new ways to adapt and change uh, in the diaspora. And now I really want to show you some of these images. So I'm going to try and, and do this. Let's see if I can. Um, just a second. I usually, we always use Zoom, usually in the United States or Teams, so I am like trying with this one with y'all. Um, let me see. Entire screen. Let's see if I can pull this up. Okay, so at least y'all can see this, right? No, you can't. Share. Yes, it's it's coming, ma'am. Okay. I just want it where I can see what I'm doing, though. Okay. Don't share your entire screen. Okay. How about there? Yes, yes. Yay! Okay, awesome. <laughs> so, so we'll go back through some of the things that we talked about, right? The largely male-centric narrative in the diaspora. I'm not going to share the full PowerPoint because then I won't be able to see. Um, and then this idea that I asked you if you had heard of feminist migration theory, um, which is um, something that I think I'm is not really sure. exciting. I'm not sure, but I'm, an, I'm at just a, uh, is it coming, the inverted thing is coming here. The image is inverted. Oh, really? That's so weird. That's very weird. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, should I, I should know. I, should I just... Uh, Ask him. I emailed. Yeah, I emailed. I think you. Doctor. Yeah, sorry to yeah. interrupt, uh, Lindsay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, uh, Lindsay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask this person to show us the slides that you have sent me, and in the right. hall we can see that while you carry on with your uh, own presentation, with your own slides on your own computer. I think that would that be the would, best thing. That would be awesome. Yes. Thank you. That would be perfect. I that would be perfect. That. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, just give me two minutes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm going to slides forward. I'm going to go to the slides. 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 I'
বুঝতে পারছি না আমি কেন হলো তোমার ইমেল আইডি কি গো এখানে কোন ইমেল আইডি খোলা আছে সর্বনাশ করেছো এটা নাও কিভাবে নেবে হোয়াটসঅ্যাপে দেখো এটা নিয়ে নাও তো হোয়াটসঅ্যাপে ইয়া উই উড জাস্ট বি আমরা So if we we start with the second slide right to talk about yes, yes. Um, until the last few decades we see this largely um male centric narrative regarding the Indian diaspora right um and even in those experiences we see a lot of homogenous or similar writings right we don't see a lot of uh diversity in these experiences um and that's why we talk so much uh in the united states and historiography especially in feminist writings about intersectionality which is this idea that race gender sexuality um region national origin immigration status all of these identities work together you know to form this holistic person to to inform how others are perceived how others are oppressed how others um may have privilege right um and so there was kind of a disregard uh in the if you're looking at gender and the indian diaspora and especially women about these experiences or they focused a lot on labor more traditionally then by the 1990s 2000s if we go to the feminist migration slide um we can see uh that there's this change right that there's this move to say okay we need to talk about how borders and how nations can be constructed in similar ways that gender uh can be constructed so the theory of uh feminist migration studies or research um it examines the construction the persistence the reorganizations of relations of gender and difference as they shape unequal geographies of mobility and displacement um and one thing i like to say is we can talk about let me go to the next slide um the 90s 1990s through 2000s um, we talk about these boundaries as socially constructed um but i always like to say and i say this in my classes and different speeches that i've given um there are real world consequences um and things that happen because of gender so it's not just this postmodern concept floating it also is performed in the body and there are consequences sometimes violent consequences the same thing with boundaries and borders right we know that they are socially constructed um but we also know that there are real world consequences um and sometimes very painful consequences um for these experiences and um those who live within these borders so traditionally then in migration scholarship and this is in the United States and elsewhere and this is really before that move to feminist migration research um Indian women are often seen solely as victims uh, especially those who are immigrants or passive agents who are kind of carrying on this culture which we know is not true but this is how they're portrayed right um and it's very similar to what we see in the historiography um 
regarding women of color in the United States and in Latin America, um, which is this idea specifically women who were forcibly removed from Africa to the Americas and the transatlantic slave trade, they're often at this time as well, um, kind of seen as victims or not being able to keep their culture um, because some studies even said that the trauma of the slave trade destroyed this for them, which we know once again is not true, but this is what the scholarship was. And that's why feminist migration research is so important. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the transnational spaces often give Indian women a freedom for self exploration and deliberation to conceive new identities and move beyond the fixed definitions of femininity. Women have shown considerable agency and inventive tactics to transform the lives of their own and those of their family, holding onto tradition with one hand, um, while also grasping change uh, and modernity with the other and the conditions. So I think this is a really uh, important thing to talk about, right? This, these complex dynamics um, and the way that um, we're seeing uh, uh, Indian women in diaspora as multifaceted. Um, and I wanna talk about two examples um, of Indian women organizations and um, Indian women in the diaspora. Um, and one of these organizations is called Saki for South Asian Women and that's based in New York City. And it's actually the second South Asian women's organization ever in the United States to fight against domestic violence. Um, but it also does wider work um, for fighting for what the organization calls uh, gender justice. Go to the next slide, please. We could go to the next slide, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, so just before we talk about uh, Saki, which I think is really interesting, um, an organization called Manavi was actually the first uh, established in the U.S., the first, first organization ever established um, specifically to help South Asian immigrant women facing domestic violence. And it was founded by six South Asian women in 1985. And it had this goal of empowering women you know, who are of South Asian backgrounds. The organization still exists today. It helps about 300 people per year uh, in the New Jersey area, which is a state in the Eastern part of the United States. Um, but SAC is really interesting and exciting um, because it's very unique in what it does, right? It began in 1989. It's created by a group of five South Asian women. And you can see it, it talks about building power, right? Um, uh, and it builds power for survivors of gender-based violence in New York City, and it serves uh, survivors of all genders who are of South Asian descent from Bangladesh, the Caribbean, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, as well as the larger global South Asian diaspora in the United States. Um, and I think if we look here how it talks about it's a survivor-centered movement, for gender justice, but also honoring the collective and inherent power of all survivors uh, of violence. And I wanna take a minute to talk about how powerful of a statement this is and how this also ties into ideas of the diaspora. So we have this broader goal of gender justice, but we're also looking to the community. So it's not just about the individual power for survivors, which is kind of more of a Western construct, more individualistic, um, it's about collective power for survivors, right? The importance of community. And I also think it's important to note that this organization serves uh, survivors of all genders, um, which would include gender diverse individuals. Um, so in 2016, they also started a youth empowerment program. And this is very sad, but needed for survivors as young as six years old. So this group has worked to change laws, created education programs, worked on issues of food insecurity during COVID, um, and they have a crisis hotline and they do so many different things. Um, so they have this view that empowers women and encourages their agency. And that kind of mirrors and is similar to what the historiography and what the writing um, has done as well. Um, but next slide, please. Um, yes, yeah, so 
the resistance in the US, it mirrors so much of this amazing gender justice and anti-sexual assault and domestic violence activism that has happened and is happening in India. And this shows uh, Indian women in the diaspora being agents of change and resistance and not just passive, mm -hmm. right? Not, not the way that the older historiography, the older writing um, tried to make it seem like, right? That we know is not true. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is Nikita Gill. You could go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so Nikita Gill is an author I assigned for my class, The History of the Divine Feminine. Um, and so we have a portion for several weeks where we talk about um, the Divine Feminine in Hinduism. Um, and we talk about her book, uh, The Girl and the Goddess. We actually talked about it this semester. But she does some really interesting things regarding Indian women and the diaspora. So uh, Gill is a British Indian poet, and she has written, as you can see, uh, many volumes of poetry. And she has been described as one of the most successful uh, Insta poets or Instagram poets and has one of the largest followings on Instagram for any poet. Uh, and this may seem kind of silly to talk about her Instagram, but the internet, as we know, uh, can be a very powerful tool for sharing stories, right? And for talking about that um, empowerment that we've mentioned. Um, and Gill's work, well, she was published at a very young age, and her work was rejected 137 times for publication. So all you writers, don't give up. Uh, you can see, obviously, as I said, some of her publications here. Um, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. And then Girl and God, the Goddess, and what she does is she mixes stories of Hindu gods and goddesses with her own experiences. Technically, it's not an autobiography, but it's very thinly veiled. Um, Haro, who is the protagonist in the story, she travels to various cities and goes to college in London. Um, she experiences many hardships growing up, including racism, bullying, and sexual assault. Um, but she has the foundation of her family and heals through her love of poetry and art. And we're just going to read a couple of her poems, and then I will open it up so we can have a discussion. Um, but I think poems reflect a lot as we're talking about of these themes of, you know, Indian women in the diaspora. So if you want to go to the next slide, please. Say, okay. um, So this first one, Tell Your Daughters, um, is a great example of um, talking about the past and talking about culture and then empowerment. Um, these are universal themes, but they're also very specific in what Gil writes about to her experience, you know, being an Indian woman in the diaspora. So I'll just read it to you quickly. Uh, tell your daughters how you love your body. Tell them how they must love theirs. Tell them to be proud of every bit of themselves from their tiger stripes to the soft flesh of their thighs, whether there is a little of them or a lot whether freckles cover their face or not, whether their curves are plentiful or slim, whether their hair is thick, curly, straight, long, or short. Tell them how they inherited their ancestors' souls and their smiles, that their eyes carry countries that breathe life into history, that the swing of their hips does not determine their destiny. Tell them never to listen when bodies are critiqued. Tell them every woman's body is beautiful because every woman's soul is unique. Uh, I, I think that's a great one. And then this next final one um, is published in a poetry journal called After the Pause. It's now a defunct poetry journal, um, but encapsulates many of the issues involved in the immigrant experience, the racism, the sexism, that intersection that we talked about of racism and sexism, um, and that feeling of displacement. Um, so next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Go back to the other one. Sorry, you, you did right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I do not, you're, it's called second generation immigrant. I do not use the word home anymore. Too many lands have rooted themselves inside these sinews, weeds, and this bone marrow. I do not know when the word belong began to feel like a stranger sneering instead of a homespun being taking my hand. Mother tells me the strangeness in my pupils that found its way under my blood, 
began when I was born in extraterritorial land. When the pale doctor who was bringing me into this earth from her womb world botched the epidural and blamed her, quote, dark chocolate skin. Mother does not weep when she says this. Uh, instead, I'm sorry, that distracted me on the side. Sorry. The story brings forth a version of her that has not yet healed, yet endured on fury. Something doomed has been crawling somewhere inside my mind ever since, calling my name in the darkness like it belongs. No one told me this would haunt my feet when I reached the shores of this land again. No one warned me to teach my outer coating the shade of silence. Wearing the skin is rebellious. No one told me this. Speaking this foreign tongue is a battle cry. No one told me this. Carrying my heritage is a soldier's march. No one told me this. And I'll let you read the last pair, the last three lines yourself. Okay. So as you can see, um, in closing, we see this move in the historiography, the studies uh, in the United States regarding South Asian women from being seen as more passive or solely victims to taking this more active role. And feminist migration theory, feminist migration research helps with this shift. Um, and we see examples of this move to empowerment and activism and poetry, such as in the group Sakti for South Asian women that I spoke about and in the poetry of Nikita Gill. Um, so thank you for listening today. And like I said, I love collaboration. I would love to um, come and visit you and have you come and visit us at the University of Central Oklahoma. Uh, and I'm happy to open it up now for further discussion. Thank you so much. Hello, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I think we have you there. Uh, yes. Yes, thank you so much for such a wonderful and insightful lecture. And uh, we really enjoyed it. And uh, I must say that we have uh, very few participants here as far as the physical presence is concerned, because this is an online session. So we do have mm -hmm. people listening in online. And we are also recording this for our students. Um, we, are, we are very grateful to you for this. Now, uh, would you like to take a few questions? Shall we go for the interaction? Absolutely. I, this is my favorite part. Yes. So uh, any uh, questions from the people here? Anyone would like to observations, questions? Participants? She has spoken on OK, I guess uh, if you want, you can uh, ask the questions in Bangla or Hindi, and I can translate them to Madam. That won't be a problem. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. We have the head of the Department of English, Chachal College, here with us, uh, Shomrita Mishra. Uh, yes, she's here. Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I. Uh, couldn't listen to some of the some parts of your lecture because I was uh, kind of caught up in some work. But I really uh, loved the way you presented. Uh, oh. Especially, I think you spoke on uh, feminist uh, migration. So, uh, would you just uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Because I missed some parts of it. No, yes. actually, she um, has spoken on feminist migrations. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I can actually, and we can. Uh, I can send uh, yes, you we can. We can take the questions. We can. I can send the questions to you over email. Absolutely. Um, but I can. I can talk a little bit more um, about it. I know you said you missed some of it. I can kind of quickly. There's one that really encapsulates it that I can say to you, and I can send some of this other information that I have. But sure. there's a great article. Um, uh, in the book, In Minding the Gap, Bridging Feminist and Political Geography Through Geopolitics. Uh, and Jay Heinemann in 20, 2004, she basically said um, that, that feminist, uh, hold on, I, I lost my place. I want to be able to read it to you. Hold on. Um, <laughs> feminist migration theory uh, examines the social and political constructedness of boundaries, borders, and scales, and allows researchers to interrogate the taken for granted meanings of dominant discourse to challenge these assumptions, constructions, and power relations 
So there we can see the boundaries and constructions within the na nation and the household kind of mirror each other, right? In the region and the body, how these are all laden with power and they're all specific to these various geopolitical regions, right? So um, they're socially constructed, they're specific, right? And we have to look at them through these intersecting identities. We can't just look at them through just all women one way, all South Asian women. There are so many different issues, even with that, right? With ideas of class, immigration status, sexuality. Um, so there's all these different levels within femini feminist migration studies that we need to um, kind of deconstruct how we're looking at gender and borders. And we can kind of do that in a parallel sense, right? Where we can see that borders are constructed even though, like I said, there are real world consequences to these constructions, there's also constructions of gender. Okay, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, Lindsay, we have some questions. Can you see on the screen? Yes, screen to dekhano jatse, madam ke? yes absolutely. Um, uh, the first question is a really good question. Yes. Uh, yes. Shift for South Asian women and their stories, there is a risk of appropriating their histories and experiences as well. This is something we talk about quite a lot uh, in women's gender and sexuality studies here in the United States. Um, the precautions that we take, uh, we I have an entire session in my history of the feminine divine class um, about appropriation versus appreciation. Um, and the idea of what appropriation is, which is taking on a culture that is not your own, not understanding it, not respecting it, and not listening to the people who are involved in that culture. Um, and as I said, this is not specifically my area of study, but it's something that I talk about in my class, which is appreciation would be understanding, right? Um, talking to the people who are actually in the culture you're speaking about and letting them obviously speak for themselves. Um, so I think if we need to really distinguish for our students, for ourselves, what the difference between appropriation and appreciation is, right? Um, and that's a whole entire uh, discussion, I think, that is super important um, with these stories because when my students read The Girl and the Goddess, um, they see a lot of similarities in their own experiences, but I also tell them, you know, this is a specific experience, right, to this specific person with all of those intersections of identity that we've been talking about. Uh, and. And I, I th thank you, thank yeah. you, Linsa. There's another one. I think you, if we can just scroll up, scroll yeah. up, Karoto. I have a question. Uh, yeah. This is a request to the organizers to share Linsa Mam's email. Yes, that is there. Yes. Linsa Mam's email yes. is there yes. on the last slide. Oh, and I'll put it in the chat too. Uh, yes, I would love for y'all to email me. There's a question from Shilpa just before this. No, 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 no. Scroll Karo, niche Karo. Shilpa, will ask you a question. Karo, Karo. Okay, IJ, IJ. There's the question. I would like I to would ask, like, how do you see the migration of girls of Punjab to Canada, where their partners fail to acquire the eligibility to reach themselves in feminist migration framework? Wow. Oh. Yeah. So, um, I, I let me make sure I understand the question. So, um, you're talking about girls and women going to Canada, and then their partners, their husbands, they can't. Um, uh, can someone you can someone break it down for me maybe yeah yeah i am i am um it's a um i would like to ask how do you see the migration of girls of punjab to canada when their partners fail to acquire the eligibility to reach themselves in feminist migration network i think i think it's a it's a just a the structuring is a problem there. I think what she wanted to mean were the girls who, how they could reach out to the feminist migration uh, frameworks or something, or how do you place them and their um, condition? Hello, I think that's what, I see. Uh, as far as I understand. Hi. When you frame hello, questions, hello, we have uh, our very esteemed resource person, Professor Himadri Roy from uh, IGNU New Delhi and uh, if you can just stand up, sir, so you can say hi to ma'am from with that camera. <laughs> hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So this is the question. I think uh, after this, the questions you can send them to me uh, to the to the organizers by email. This is a request to all the participants, and um, I think uh, I, yeah. Well, I, I think uh, for and I don't know your last name, so I'm, or Shilpa, were you gonna say something? I think you turned off. 
on your mic if you wanted to clarify, but yeah. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Yeah, I, I would like to see that the question is that there is a kind of scenario where the boys of Punjab are not able to acquire the bands they want to reach Canada. So when mm -hmm. they are searching for the girls, whom they'll marry, but the first condition is that they should have that specific bands. They'll go to Canada and settle there, and then the partner will marry a person. So I was asking that how do you see this scenario in the feminist framework? Mm -hmm. That girl, uh, the marrying of the partner due to this thing. Right, and I think that's a perfect uh, scenario. And I don't know a ton about Canada, so I apologize. Um, but I think it's a great question. And I think it's something that would be, um, would fit well into feminist migration theory or research because it's all about power, right? Um, so you have these relationships forming, right? For, I'm assuming, right, in part to get these visas, to get this access um, to Canada, to get to um, move to Canada. So I think it's laden with a lot of power relations, the power of, and in the United States, as, as many of you probably know, uh, our immigration is a mess, right? It is, there are so many issues. There are so many issues with power, with racism, with um, politics. And I don't know as much about Canada, right? I, so I can't speak as much to it, but I know that we can see similarities in gender relations and to how relations with borders and with visas uh, and with immigration status, right? Okay, thank you. And uh, are there more questions or we can end this? Okay, so we have uh, Dr. Joita Rai, who is the head of the Department of English at Robindra Bharati University, and she is a participant here. Joita has asked a question. Uh, I, I think you can re read that, uh, um, Lindsay. Yeah. And I, yes, so your lecture focused on the diaspora mm -hmm. issues of South Asian women. Could you elaborate on the issues of migration of women from other parts of the world? Um, are there any differences? I mm -hmm. can definitely speak to that in the U.S. context. Um, so we have a lot of, um, especially with I'm trying to be as apolitical as possible with the, the rise of Trump mm -hmm. and um, trying to strengthen borders, right? We have, there's an increased discourse uh, in our country uh, about issues, particularly with immigrants from uh, Mexico, Central America, um, and the idea of what a good immigrant is and a bad immigrant. Um, so I think we can see these stereotypes, right, throughout the United States with various immigrant groups, right? So we have specific stereotypes for Asian immigrants, for immigrants from Mexico and Central America, right? And those, once again, are laden with those intersecting issues of power um, of racism, of status, right? Who is the quote model immigrant? Um, so this, as I said, it's not my area of study, but I think it's so fascinating and there's so much that we can do with it and so much we can talk about. This is just, you know, an hour of a discussion, but there are so many different comparisons that can be made and so many also differences, right? Depending on how different immigrant groups are stereotyped or perceived. Um, so it's a great question. It's a question we could have a whole conference about, right? Yes. And there are Thank you, Joita. Yeah. I think you're hearing. Yeah. Thank you so much for this question, actually. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Churchill. But um, before I sign off, I would like to take the opportunity to tell you that um, we had a discussion, um, a very informal one, uh, about yeah. you coming to India next year yeah. around March. And since yes. I'm the chair of the Department of English at Raiganj University and two of my very esteemed colleagues are present here, the invitation <laughs> is there from our part. Uh, it would be wonderful if you uh, really are coming to India, then do visit us. Yes, I would love to. Let's talk and let's set that up because I would love to see all of you in person and we can continue these discussions. I think there's a lot we could talk about. So I will be in contact and we will plan that. My university says they can pay for me to come out. So yes, as yes. long as you can get me to the uni yes, university. Yes, we would require that yes. <laughs> for you to travel can, funding from your there. side. <laughs> and that's yes. official because it's a, it's a, yeah. we would be really honored. But uh, I actually, uh, though I was speaking, the chair was being, uh, the, the, the session, we have uh, our uh, esteemed head of the institution where we are hosting this seminar, uh, Sri Ajit Bishash. And uh, he would like to thank you before we end the session. Hello, madam. Hi. Hello, good morning. Good morning. 
uh, we are uh, uh, really proud of uh, being having you in, the, in this seminar beautiful seminar and uh, thank you very much uh, for your informative and interactive session and uh, with all the audiences uh, all over the world uh, it delighted uh, to have your uh, beautiful lecture and uh, we invite you physically uh, in future uh, if you come in india please do come uh, in our institution our institution as well as our university raiganj university uh, government of india all are delighted to have you in this beautiful session thank you very much madam thank you so much i'm honored to be here and thank you for the invitation i will definitely take you up on that and i look forward to to meeting all of you in person thank you so much thank you thank you thank you madam thank you take good care thank you Lindsay. You. bye yes thank you for all that organization and you have my email so feel free to reach out sure okay. take care bye. thank you bye Good morning, everyone. Uh, that was the end of the first uh, session today. And before we move on to the second session, we will have a small felicitation ceremony for the two new resource persons who have joined us today. We are very happy to have with us Dr. Nidjar Sharkar, Professor Department. Uh, Achha, professor, professor Nejo Shaka, Department of English, Raiganj University, and Professor Pinaki Roy, Department of English, again, Raiganj University. So, welcome, sir. And uh, I would request Dr. Debojati Torovda to please felicitate Professor Pinaki Roy. Uh, he's also the Dean of Students' Welfare at Raiganj University. So, Debojati, please uh, felicitate, sir. Uh, can our NSS volunteers or anybody who is here assist Debojati, please? with the tray yeah sir if you could come forward and we will huh. uh, pl uh, yeah please do Give a huge round of applause and welcome, sir, to the historic, to our almost historic college. <laughs> and I know for a fact that sir lectures wonderfully. I have heard him talk at so many universities, grown up reading his articles. So everybody, please listen to sir's talk. Uh, now I would request uh, Dr. Shaurabh Jha from the Department of Sanskrit to please felicitate Professor Nidja Sharkar. A round of applause please, it's early morning. Why is everyone so, <laughs> so very dull? <laughs> so we should all cheer him on. <laughs> Thank you so much to Dr. Devajati Tarovdar and Dr. Shaurabh Jha and welcome once again. Yes, yes, I know, I know Pinaki sir's uh, views a little but I'll be hearing Nidhar sir for the first time. So we look forward to hearing both of you sir and thank you very much.
Hello, I'm Jerice Herndon at Nebraska Wesleyan University in the US. Uh, I am excited to share with you queer identities across continents, Wubi Shefi and Mihidra Milakshmi. I am looking at Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi's memoir. I'm reading it in translation, not in the original Marathi, so please uh, pardon my pronunciation. Uh, and a documentary from Cote d'Ivoire called Wubi Shefi, looking at gender fluidity and the way that these pieces reclaim uh, gender identities as natural, beloved, and even patriotic. So in order to begin looking at the foundation of how gender fluidity Hello, can reclaim uh, a national US, identity. We have to look at the uh, colonial gender uh, identity. Uh, Ivory Coast in Post Francophone Post West Africa okay. um, and India share gender. Well, our next uh, speaker is Professor Jerry Herndon, and she is the identity. professor of English, a professor of English, gender studies. Nebraska Wesleyan University, Lincoln, USA. And she has had a lot of experience with uh, gender issues and gender empowerment. And she Hello. has uh, delivered Herndon. lectures, published papers on this. And she has always um, tried to put the idea of gendering, how this, you know, this thing can be dealt with within the institutions and within academia. And uh, Professor Herndon has sent a recorded lecture because she would not be able to be present right now in online mode. So she has made it very clear that we uh, send the questions to her by email. So you can send the questions in the group, the WhatsApp group that we have, and I shall mail it to her or I shall send it to her in WhatsApp because I'm connected with her that way. And uh, Professor Herndon has also said that she is delighted to be a part of this conference with so many, uh, you know, wonderful research resource persons and research scholars gracing. So um, Professor Herndon has lastly said that uh, she extends her uh, cooperation if anyone wants to reach out to her <laughs> via email, she would like to, you know, uh, talk about, um, you know, various issues, whatever you feel free to tell her. Okay, so with those words, I would like to uh, ask our technical team to play the video. 
Um, I'm Therese Herndon at Nebraska Wesleyan University in New York. Uh, I am excited to share with you queer identities across continents, Ruby Sheffi and Hidra Milakshmi. I am looking at Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi's memoir. I'm reading it in translation, not in the original Marathi, so please uh, pardon my pronunciation. Uh, and a documentary from Cote d'Ivoire called Wubi Sheffi, looking at gender fluidity and the way that these pieces reclaim uh, gender identities as natural, beloved, and even patriotic. So in order to begin looking at the foundation of how gender fluidity can reclaim uh, a national identity, we have to look at the pre-colonial gender identities, Cote d'Ivoire, or what could be translated as Ivory Coast in Francophone West Africa and in India share gender expression from pre-colonial history that survived European settler impositions of heteronormative gender identities. Both this documentary about what would be considered gay or trans and trans identities in West Africa, both this documentary and uh, Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi's memoir reclaim conservative rhetoric about religion, patriotism, and family, and both insist that Wubi and Hitra gender identities are grounded in nature and created by loving gods. So we inherited, many of us inherited from, uh, whether it be England or France, uh, European legacies of a two-sex binary system. And what both of these pieces insist is that gender is not binary. It is not either male or female. Gender is not the same as sex. Gender is not natural or innate. Gender is not the same as sexual orientation or desire. And in these anti-colonial uh, representations, gender is fluid, changeable, it operates on a spectrum or a continuum. It is an identity, how we feel inside, along with many intersecting elements. It is an expression or presentation, how we may appear. So we, many of us would probably agree that gender is socially constructed, and you can look at social science studies that show that toy preference becomes more stereotyped by age four. For two-year-olds, they'll select any kind of toy, whether it's targeted towards their presumed gender or not, girl, boy, or neutral. But after being socialized is when toy preference becomes more stereotyped, and we can see that as evidence of the social construction of gender. Some would even argue that sex is socially constructed. Anne Fausto Sterling, a biologist and feminist in Sexing the Body, writes that there is no necessary connection between chromosomes of a fetus and later gender identity, which does not start to become clear until about age three. An infant born with XX chromosomes can come to feel male and vice versa. And so I would argue that European colonialism shaped these binary notions of the two-sex system. The assignment and classification of people as male, female, intersex, or another sex assigned at birth is based on physical anatomy and, or possibly a chromosome test. But sex assigned at birth does not equal gender identity. Gender does not equal sex. And intersex people uh, give us an example of that. They have what are considered ambiguous genitals or hormones, uh, and a person with a less common combination of hormones, chromosomes, and anatomy used to assign sex at birth uh, can fall under the categories of Klinefelter syndrome, androgen insensitivity syndrome, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Parents, medical professionals may assign intersex infants as sex and perform surgical operations to conform the infant's genitalia to that assignment. But uh, then as the child grows, they may say, you've mutilated me. This is not uh, who I am. And why do I have to choose one or the other? Uh, 
so to get beyond the colonial binary of the two sex system, we can look at gender identity as internal, emotional, psychological, psychological sense of being male, female, neither both or other genders, such as transgender, hetra, kinar, two-spirit, or wubi identities. In those cases, sex assigned at birth and gender identity are not the same. We can look at non-binary individuals who identify as neither male nor female. And then of course, cisgender individuals identify sex assigned at birth with how they feel inside. I, for example, am female. I feel female, that was my sex assigned at birth. So I use she, her pronouns. Gender expression and presentation, on the other hand, is a physical manifestation or communication of one's gender identity through clothing, hairstyle, voice, body shape, etc. And trans persons and hedra seek to make their gender expression or how they look match their gender identity or who, who they are and rather than the sex assigned at birth. We would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge queer theories, influence on these understandings, Michel Foucault's um, assertion that sexuality and desire are historical and cultural discourse and not identity, and Judith Butler's work on in gender trouble as gen showing that gender is socially learned, a repeated performance. And Butler asks, what can or should bodies do and what happens when people do things with their bodies that violate the norm? We can see that gender intersects with sexual orientation, desire, or attraction, but it's not the same. There are many different orientations that have nothing to do with gender identity. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, asexual, demisexual, sapiosexual, heterosexual, but that doesn't mean those orientations aren't the same as whether one feels male, female, non-binary, transgender, etc. We can look at gender identity, one's innermost concept of self as male, female, a blend of both or neither, and see that that's different from gender expression or presentation, the external appearance of one's gender identity expressed through behavior, clothing, haircut, or voice. Those are not the same as sex assigned at birth, the physical, biological, chromosomal, genetic, and, genetic and anatomical makeup of a body, which as Fausto Sterling says, she argues that those are even socially constructed, that those are constructed um, categories, that nature is much messier than, than those uh, assignations of male or female. Sexual attraction or desire is something else, and then even romantic uh, attraction is a different category. So in terms of gender expression, someone like RuPaul can express himself as male or herself as female, and uh, he, she shows a fluid gender expression. Ethnic and cultural heritage also shapes gender expression. Uh, one example is the Wadabe, a nomadic group in Western Africa, whose men in a heterosexual pairing, men wear makeup and dance in order to attract women. And it is the women who choose their partners to have sex with for the evening and then decide if they want to stay with them. Um, so in the case of the text that interests me, in Lakshmi's memoir, uh, Mahidra Malakshmi, she argues that her identity is very much rooted in ancient Indian traditions and that she is beloved by God. So she takes conservative discourse and turns it around and applies it to herself and claims it. She writes about the proud history of Hedras in sacred texts that are millennia old, way before the British colonial anti-sodomy laws that changed um, the traditional culture. Uh, she said, I was proud to be part of the community. I knew about Arjuna who had become Gruhanada and the Mahabharata. I know about the Kojas who guarded the harems of the kings. Um, and there are many, of course, that all of you uh, know about how the, um, you know, the very, the many stories of Hedras in sacred texts of gods that change genders, of the acknowledgement of the eunuchs um, there are, you know, there's a, there's a fine, proud tradition 
way before British colonialism, and that is part of what Lakshmi draws on. Um, she says that her identity is spiritual and divine. She writes that in India, becoming Hedra is a spiritual process. She argues that the word Hedra refers to the soul, a holy soul, soul, and the body in which the holy soul resides is called a Hedra. And she claims God loves the Hedra community and has created a special place for it outside the man-woman frame. So she takes religious discourse and rewrites it, making space for herself. Uh, she has a couple of TED Talks on YouTube that I would recommend. Uh, and in one of them, she says, our culture accepted everybody. Our ancestors in India created a space for us, but after colonization, we forgot. She said everything was in Indian culture. She cites courtesans, sex workers, but we have started listening to leaders who don't know what is Indian. So she's really making a patriotic argument for her identity as having a rightful place within the nation. And she notes that there is no word in English for our community. And this is also true of Ruby Shabri. Um, in the TED Talk, she also says, the Brahma is in me, the eternal cosmic energy I am part of. I was normal. It was the world who thought I was different. She was asked when she came out and she said, I, excuse me, I only came out one time and that's when I came out of my mother's womb. Uh, I was always me. She said, my spirituality is to my soul and it is for me. It should work for me. The world cannot have a say in that. And finally, she says, my sexuality is like the Ganges, pure. It can take many turns in life, arguing for sexual fluidity as natural. Now, how does this relate to uh, a West African documentary from Cote d'Ivoire? And, you know, why compare something that is so very different culturally? This documentary deals with uh, what in the U.S. we would call gay or trans community, but those words don't actually work uh, in quite the same way. Similarly to how hedras don't exactly translate to transgender identity in the U.S. because of the the cultural specificity of the hedra community, um, the gurus, the the chelas, the um, the houses, uh, the the families, the new families that they form. Unlike in India, which was shaped by colonial British Victorian culture's fear of same-sex desire, the anti-sodomy laws that were so influential that um, criminalized uh, what was not criminalized before. In Cote d'Ivoire, the penal code was influenced by France, by French, coloniza French colonizations, which did not have quite the same um, anxiety, shall we say, as uh, Victorian England. And so following independence from France in 1960, Cote d'Ivoire never outlawed or even mentioned same-sex behavior. Now that does not mean that it is protected, that there is not discrimination. There certainly is. There's not the same, not the kind of equality that one would like to see, but um, it it's a little freer than the the African countries that were colonized by Great Britain, like Uganda, for example, or Nigeria, which have uh, draconian laws against the expression of same-sex desire. In the case of Ruby Sherry in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, in this documentary, there are different uh, people who are interviewed. And again, their identities don't really fit um, understanding of trans identities in other cultures. They say it's a different, some of the interviewees say, it's a different community with our own coded language and our own dictionary. A wubi is a boy who plays the role of a woman. Uh, a yossi remains a boy who sleeps with women, transvestites and homosexuals. Yossis are wubi's husbands. They play the man. And I think play is kind of an important word here. They're bisexual. If they sleep with a boy, they don't think of it as such. For them, wubis are like girls. You have to look like a girl for them to get it up for you. And tusu bakaris are women who love women or lele. So there's a whole subculture creating its own language and its own um, its own sense of identity 
uh, that doesn't necessarily work in other cultural contexts. And it's very powerful to create language and to step into that language and inhabit it, and then to uh, to create identity in that cultural context. Uh, Wubi could be translated as bat. Uh, and Barbara, the main uh, one of the main interviewees in the film, who whose charisma really carries the film. She goes out into uh, communities and talks to people who are against her identity. And uh, she convinces them through her humor and through her conversation that, you know, she uh, is just the same as they are. She says, bats live by night. In Cote d'Ivoire, we, we do everything back to front and they don't know how to classify us. When I was little, I heard a story and that's how I knew that bats are our friends. They had to classify the bat, but she didn't belong anywhere. The wee thing said to herself, since that's the way it is, I'll belong to my own group. I'll sleep by day, upside down, and I'll live by night. Bats have adapted and so have we. So she takes what is considered an abnormal um, or inverse identity uh, that's considered perhaps backwards or upside down to the culture. And she says, oh, you know, I'll, I'll do that. I'll adapt yeah. and I'll inhabit that identity. It's very playful. The interviewees, other, Barbara and other interviewees in this documentary uh, say, um, Things, they really insist on the uh, the fact that God loves them, that their identity is uh, spiritual, that it's natural, and that it's patriotic. They say, if two men live together, it's because God wants it. Otherwise, it's not possible. If God loves me and my mother loves me, that's what matters. I'm proud of my nature, not just physically, but because it is so different. You're true to your real nature and you're happy. That's just how we were born. And they talk about woobies being like bats hidden in trees. They gather bit by bit till suddenly the tree is teeming with them, talking about how they come together as a community and support each other. Uh, Barbara says, Cote d'Ivoire is my country. I need to be here to speak my own language. There are so many homophobes. There's always work to be done. So many towns in which to spread the word. It's like cleaning a house that's constantly dirty. You just have to keep cleaning. And without the right to be different, Africa is going nowhere. And so she insists, this is my nation. This is my heritage. And I'm going to work towards equality right here. I'm not going anywhere. So I would like to conclude by saying that uh, both of these texts, while you know very far apart geographically and culturally, they both redefine gender, reclaim religion, and patriotism. Both Barbara in Bubi Shefi and Lakshmi in the Hijra and Lakshmi proudly center feminine gender identities that the dominant cultures frame as marginal. And they argue that fluid gender identities beyond a simple two sex binary are both natural and spiritual. They say that their subjectivity meets with divine approval. Both skillfully deploy language, although I must rely on translation while reconstructing their identities and communities for straight audiences, and they make themselves vulnerable with courage and humor. Both narrators redefine identity, family, community, and assert their rightful place in the public, public realm. Language moves their identities from private to public, earning respect, asserting pride, recreating family, and claiming the right to differ from the majority while insisting on a place within the evolving nation and resisting the colonial two-sex binary. And with that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. I thank you for the invitation and uh, I wish you a fabulous conference. Thank you.
Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening in to Professor Jerry's Herndon. It was a very insightful talk, and he really tried to, uh, she really tried. I'm sorry. She really tried to uh, get into the, uh, you know, the theme of this conference from the perspective of, uh, let's say, what is gender actually when we talk about it. So thank you, um, Professor Herndon, and uh, we shall move on with our next speaker. So we are very delighted to announce that we have Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay, who is the professor, Department of Economics, and former director, Center for Women's Studies at Calcutta University. So we are just waiting for her to join. Has ma'am joined? She shall be joining in a while. And as she joins, um, we shall also very humbly request the chairperson of this session, Professor Dr. Pinaki Roy, Dean Students Welfare, and Professor at the Department of English, Raigunj University, to kindly come on stage. So, yeah, okay, okay. So we shall just wait for Madam to join. Oh, huh. okay, okay. So I have actually shared, uh, I would like to say a few things right now. I have actually shared the link uh, long ago. So I would have uh, been happier if uh, more participants would have joined in, especially people who have presented yesterday. They should have been joined by now. Anyway, uh, what I want to say is that um, we have an announcement that 12 p.m. onwards today, 12 p.m. onwards today, we have the online sessions and the link has already been posted in the group yesterday. So you go to the WhatsApp group, find the link and join in. Okay, And <clears throat> the same link will be applicable and uh, we shall let you know about the nuances in the WhatsApp group itself. So the online sessions, online technical sessions will start from 12 p.m. Please join that and do the paper presentations as part the instructions. Thank you. Now I hand over the uh, microphone to the convener of the conference, Dr. Tulika Kaur. All right, so Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay has informed that due to technical glitches, she shall be joining within five to seven minutes. She's trying to join within five to seven minutes. Kindly bear with us.
Welcome, madam. Ishita, madam. Yes. Can you hear me? It's been Koro. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can, uh, and we all can hear you. Welcome Thank to the international conference, and we are so honored to have you as a resource person out here. Thank you so much for taking time off from your busy schedule. But we have would have been happier if you would have come here in person. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That I would also have uh, enjoyed it, and I'm missing the whole. Okay, uh, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, very uh, humbly, I would like to introduce our uh, chairperson. Camera te dikhe kado. Chairperson uh, for the session, Professor Pinaki Roy, Dean Students Welfare and Professor at the Department of English, Raigand University, which is the collaborative partner of this particular uh, conference. So I hand over the microphone to, uh, and oh, yes, yes, I definitely have the convener with us who's going to introduce herself. Hello, ma'am. I'm Tulika Kaur. You know me, ma'am? I know you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. It would be a delight to chair your session, madam. Welcome. Uh, I would li now like to request Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay, who is a noted economist, to present her paper or uh, give her invited lecture. Please, ma'am. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me and today 
I would be speaking on rethinking the question of women's empowerment in 2023. As we know from 1995 onwards through Beijing and then before that signing of CEDAW, Convention of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Violence and dis Against Women. So there have been attempts throughout the world, not only in South Asia, but throughout the world there has been attempts to mainstream or to be or to make aware the concept of gender discrimination and an absolute consensus on the fact that this discrimination is to end. I would recall the journey from the 80s to 2023 and we also coined the word gender empowerment which is still a policy document, which is still present in a policy document, that gender empowerment, women empowerment, and we have policies for women empowerment. How far have we gone? I would just look into this journey of women empowerment. Now, this concept of empowerment, women empowerment, and before that, this concept of empowerment, came in terms of uh, from UNDP or United Nations consideration of this word of empowerment, which means that women are to take decisions. Now, if we try to look into this women's empowerment, there were several ideas and several researches going on during those times which coined the word women's empowerment. There was a relationship between education and women's empowerment, which particularly coming from India, within South Asia, our history of women's movement has recorded this uh, version of women's empowerment, that empowerment comes through education. Right from the colonial period, India's way of looking at women's empowerment has been particularly with respect to women's education. Educate women and then after that, uh, that she will be empowered. How empowered are the educated women? Our history would tell. So one uh, of these variants was empowerment. The second is participation of women in work. Now, while we were uh, talking about women and work, working women, employed women is empowered. Empowered means taking, uh, taking decisions on their own. So there was absolute consensus on these two grounds, at least, that education and uh, participation in work they pointed out that economic dependence and dependence in terms of knowledge is a way in which power is taught. So if we look at the corresponding flow from 1995 onwards to the youth development reports, they reported these facts with respect to these countries and particularly if we talk about South Asia. But South Asia, while since this conference is focusing on South Asia, we have another very important factor in South Asia, which is now a pronounced factor in the entire world. That South Asia is a region which also hosted unpaid work for women for over centuries. Now, what is this unpaid work? I'm not talking about the domestic household work, which for which the unpaid work is normally being talked about and it is talked about also in other countries. But this is part of the household production system that I'm talking about. We have occupational households, mostly occupational households in all the countries in South Asia. And these occupational households 
mostly remain tilted with my public occupation. And when we talk about this occupational household, uh, then participation of women's work is very crucial and important and also uh, this um, participation increases the household income but the women doesn't get wages as part of this income so can you hear me or would i switch off the video can you hear me it is raining outside so can you hear me can you hear me we can hear you ma'am clearly <laughs> okay. Oh, okay thank you so now what happens is this that participation in south asian occupational households they are half contributed to the unpaid work of women now this has become part of a general consensus now that there has been a too much discussion of the unpaid work that unpaid work is now within the main, main domain as far as the uh, women's work participation is concerned as far as the concept of empowerment is also concerned now if we look at the human development report from 2010 there has been a deviation in understanding of the uh, word empowerment and uh, with particularly this kind of experience in South Asia it was a kind of a, a provocation to do it was in fact making people to understand making people to understand more the concept of information from 2010 onwards the UNDP is now talking about gender inequality if we look into the world economic forum Davos Davos is giving us the gender gap so we are now talking about the gap or inequality so now we do not talk about this uh, it's not we don't talk about empowerment, but we talk about empowerment, but mostly we are concerned again back to the gender discrimination pattern or to the gender gap or the inequality. Inequality in all of its terms. So when we first of all, if you look into the history of development of empowerment to measuring it, the empowerment was measured in several ways and now empowerment is measured in terms of decision making uh, decision making process so instead of making it a quantitative measure now empowerment is seen more as part of a process this was hinted by Martha Nosbaum in uh, earlier when uh, when Nosbaum was looking at the capability idea now it is clear from the research literature on gender and empowerment that the role of gender in development cannot be understood without understanding the socio-cultural as well as the political and economic contexts in which the development exists. The way in which this unpaid work has unfold, unfolded itself, there are this unpaid work was there without recognizing that it is a part of the work. But if we do not recognize this as a part of the work, <coughs> sorry, if we do not recognize this as part of the work, so how can empowerment come through work? How can empowerment come through education also? So gender is often looked upon as a category when we look into these quantitative measures. But when we look into this category, it assigns different role types. And this means status or empowerment is a function of the power attached to that role. As women fill in a number of roles, 
it is misleading to talk about the status of women or empowerment if we try to look at it. Now, many researchers have earlier pointed out that this phenomenon of gender inequality is inherently complex because it is institutionalized. <coughs> Sorry for my cough. So, it is institutionalized, meaning it is a part of the norm or the institution in through which the unfolding of gender empowerment also takes place. And this is the reason why we have poverty in the country, we have many poor households in the country, and still in terms of quantitative indices, you can find the women empowerment indices going up. So it is a contradiction that you do not improve the social well-being of this individual. You can then still have in quantitative indices, you have empowerment. You can have violence against women increasing in a situation. You can have violence means the public violence against women uh, increasing, meaning you have more reports of rapes, you have more reports of unrapes, you have more reports of this sexual violence against women in institutions that is in workplace violence. You can have public violence in the streets and the roads and the vehicles, but still you may have an in quantitative increase in the measure of empowerment. So as you can see, the question boils down to where lies power. That is why we didn't see the unfolding of the unpaid work itself while it was there for long, long ago. So me measuring empowerment requires making judgments about what are appropriate indicators for measuring changes in people's capacity for choice or action in their lives and so is difficult. If we continue to use indicators that look at how many or the quantity May not we may not process a size. Sorry, I lost my uh, network connection. That's right. So I lost my network connection. Sorry. So as you can see that uh, after if we identify empowerment, the development agency has done it, World Bank has done it, UNDP has done it, and if we plot also that the quantitative graphs have been there. As if we recall the weight gap debate, we are back to square one after so long decades of these women empowerment, we still have the problem of falling rate of women's labor force participation, even if they're educated. We have educated employment. We still have poor households and we find unpaid work increasing to a large extent. So then what are these empowerment? And there have been debates on this new way under this new situation and the concept of empowerment. If we look into the microfinance models, the way the way in which we also have suicides are in, in uh, with the, within this framework, the way in which exploitation for women have unfolded in terms of that. A family's indebtedness have been falling on the women's indebtedness and how women are gaining out of this process. So as you can see, these investigations, these developments came up very recently in a number of cases. So as you can see that the, with the word empowerment also, we haven't proceeded to the desired directions. Because we always try to look into quantify or quantitative indicators, more stress on quantitative indicators was there. I am not trying to say that you don't need quantitative indicators. But we try to take now the decision-making scenario. 
like the uh, what we see in all of the cases, the, the question of empowerment cannot be seen as macro aggregative concept. The concept of empowerment, empowerment is dissimilar with respect to women in faculty positions, in colleges and universities, and even in a livestock profession, or women in a home-based production, or a peasant women, or a midday mail worker. The question of empowerment, or the issues related to empowerment, or the quantitative indicators of this empowerment will not be the same for all of these categories. In fact, if we look into the demographic divide, India is passing through a demographic, div uh, demographic transition. And in this transition today, the number of young women is much larger. Uh, young men and women are much larger in population. And in this kind of our status, this is not true of all countries in South Asia. But in South Asia, there is the phenomena, the change in the, the change in the attitude towards life of young people in the country. And this is true for the whole uh, uh, South Asian countries as a whole. And this change in the attitude towards life in the country has been changing has been affecting the gender norms mm. and patriarchy. I'm using this word for the first time in this lecture, but it was at the background of each of these thoughts. That patriarchy mm. is one of the equations that dominated even the concept of mm. women. It internalized the concept of the, the women empowerment you have a dominant patriarchy with your quantitative indicators of women empowerment increasing, showing increasing, while the lives of women may tell a quite different narrative. So uh, the, there are several models of empowerment. And empowerment in agriculture of women in agriculture, empowerment of the, uh, women in livestock, there has been separate, separate ways in which people have tried to look into these indicators. And I'm not going to the literature talking about power within and power outside, so where the sources of power lies, both access and control in decision making are influencing the process of empowerment. Control over household resources are based on whether women have a say in household expenses, cash to spend on household expenses, and freedom to purchase commodities. While freedom to purchase commodities, commodities are also having gender characteristics like masculinity and femininity. So clothes relative and others are sometimes taken to be women's prerogative while taking financial bonds or financial decisions are taken to be men's prerogative. So throughout the night, the journey, we haven't been able to change these uh, questions of power. So without questioning this power situation, the, the empowerment needs a total rethinking. The incidence of violence against women also sees a new paradigm of increasing sexual acts on women. The question of women's body has to be seen in the light of the paradox of women's economic empowerment and violence coexisting with each other. That is, you cannot have increasing quantity on quantitative in, uh, indicators increasing in women's empowerment and also increasing violence against women. So women's bodies are also becoming a question. So this has been there in these questions in Bangladesh and also in other countries of the world. As you can see, that in all of the South Asia, this is a very important crucial question, which some researchers are being able to tackle. I'm not going to give you a general better with all the researchers, but this is an overview that I'm trying to give you. So how has mainstreaming gender helped us look into the work 
to the opposite of women and poverty. That is basically the kind of present. There is a dialogue, and we cannot move away from the dialogue. Whether we are to look into our equations, our understanding, whether we are to rethink this, and whether we have to look into these questions in a proper design, and whether we have to look at the way in which mainstreaming gender and uh, the way in which mainstream also discuss her because of the critical voice of the past. That mainstreaming gender has corrupted many of the agencies, many of the agendas. So actually, what has happened to women's empowerment needs a rethinking from the very ground reality of the question. Uh, this uh, discussion is taking place in North Bengal and the tea gardens are an, a site which is an evolving issue with respect to, not only with respect to women's empowerment, but migrant labor, but several other dimensions. The caste, the regions are throwing up several dimensions of women's empowerment, which we haven't been able to look at this macro-aggregative framework. So we have to go apart from this macro-aggregative framework and try to look at these situations in a way in which the time demands. Time demands a re-look and rethinking of the whole process because what we have got what we have experienced is not the kind of expectation out of these situations. So this is rethinking the word of women's empowerment and mainstreaming gender. We have come a long way out from the mainstreaming gender. Now a policy or a, a gender policy or any other policy doesn't remain the same throughout. So a policy has to be put into the light of the present circumstances and trying to see whether this is possible to re-look at the, uh, the women's empowerment question. So this has been also the tendency of co-option by patriarchy, tendency of putting in gender norms even to men, uh, gender mainstreaming policies is a big question. And the future world is to solve this dilemma and with expectations that deliberations in this conference have indeed gone into evidence-based studies, more evidence-based studies to take us away from the and to do in the concept of women empowerment. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I wish I could have been with you uh, during these days, but I'm sorry, my work here has limited my mobility. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sure it is going to raise some questions. So if you have any question, please ask, ma'am. Yeah, those people who are online, that may type their questions in the, the, in the question box provided over there. Okay, there do not seem to be any question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to provoke you all the lot. <laughs> no, ma'am. Basically, everyone was listening to you attentively, and so probably they have understood what they have said. What you have said. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for organizing this wonderful conference. Thank for thanks to the organ organizers. Ma'am, ma 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 just a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt. We'll just see if there are questions in the online thing. Gobindo, yeah. the online question. No, I don't see anyone. I don't see any messages. But yes. uh, there are. I'm uh, okay. 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 The migration question is for the previous speaker. So now yeah. we don't have. 
Uh, well, ma'am, uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, wonderful privilege hearing you, and we have with us today. I took camera to the Ghorano Jamena because it's fixed there. We have Professor Shantari Rai Mukherjee with us. Oh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, ma'am, if you can just yes, yes. hi, hi, hello, hello, Shantari. Hi. Sorry, Ishita, I just walked in. Actually, I missed your lecture. So, I mean, I was sure on a and I know how you speak and what you have to say. And uh, thanks a lot for, uh, you know, like making some time for us. And uh, it's really been a privilege. Kalke session toku bhalo hoche shabkota. And today, of course, it's a good start with you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't be there with you all, but I hope to be with you all next time in North Bengal. Uh, next time. Yeah. I'll meet you in Kolkata. Huh? Okay. Okay. Good to see you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. On behalf of the organizers, I wholeheartedly thank you for a wonderful lecture. So I hope you shall be able to come here in person sometime. We also have yes. Professor Fozia Mandan. And, uh, yes. okay. and um, all the resource persons are here. But we have the camera fixed there so that they can come. I, can. I can't see the house. That is yeah. not that. But there is a house full here, full house. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, ma'am. Signing off. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you. Hello, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Dr. Deepa Joshi, can you hear me? Hi, ma'am. Good morning. It was sound about it. Ma'am, you can unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. I can see a mute sign on your screen. Oh, yeah. so sorry, sorry. I was mute, on mute. Hi, hi. Good morning, ma'am. So happy to Hi. have you here early in the morning. We are so glad. And uh, we just uh, have with us our uh, former Vice Chancellor, Raigand University, Dokhin Dinajpur University, and University of North Bengal, Professor Shantari Ramukherjee. So just a hi from her, please. And she's going to chair this session also. Hi, Deepa. Good to see you. And, Hi. Uh, and uh, for the audience, uh, I must say that the, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Deepa Joshi was supposed to come here from Sri Lanka, but unfortunately, she fractured her leg, and she, uh, she's in the process of recovery. So we couldn't bring her down, but uh, she's here online, and you're going to listen to her. OK, I'm going to chair the session. So Deepa, I'm handing it over to Shanjukta. Oh, and uh, Tulika also. Hello, ma'am. I'm Tulika. I called you. Mm, Hi, yes, Hi. yes, yes. And uh, I think you know me very well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, ma'am, how are you now? Uh, I'm good, thank you so much. And oh. I'm so sorry for not being no, there. No, 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 ma'am, no issue, no issue. Okay, ma'am, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So should I proceed? Um, I'm just checking my... Yes, ma'am. Just, uh, just, uh, just a brief, uh, just a brief uh, th uh, thing about uh, your introduction to uh, our audience for the records, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Because you oh, need okay. no introduction, sure. but we need to do a bit of formality. So we have to, ma'am. Uh, sure. I take your time sure. for that. Sure. Should I introduce myself? Is that what you're saying? No, no. I will introduce you, ma'am. Oh, you will. Okay. Okay. In absolutely. a brief, just a brief introduction. <clears throat> oh, camera somewhere. We keep forgetting the camera. We are so engrossed in managing the thing, we keep forgetting the camera. <laughs> just before you start, um, Dr. Tulika, can I just check? Are you able to see my I'm screen? I'm Dr. Sanjukta, ma'am. I'm the joint convener. Oh, Dr. Sanjukta. Okay. 
Okay, can you see my screen? Is it visible? Uh, yes, uh, you are visible, but you are presenting something, ma'am? Yeah, I was trying to present. Please, please try. We are, we are, we are going for, for a check. I'm going to check for an itchy. Because I also don't see my presentation online. So. But you have logged in. Like We can see that you are there in two windows. So I think if you start presenting, there is a... Yeah. Hi, Deepa. This is Fauzia. So you can't see me, but in the bottom of the, you know, your uh, computer, you can see a sign of a, a sign of what to call it the right way. So if you can click it and then you can share your PowerPoint, I think. No, I did start sharing, but then uh, it is not. It will take a little bit of time, I think. OK. OK. Ma'am, uh, shall I proceed with your introduction? Or please, please. Okay. Dr. Deepa Joshi is the Gender, Youth and Social Inclusion Leads Specialist at uh, the Inland Water Management Institute, Colombo, Sri Lanka. She is a feminist, political ecology and economy specialist. Her expertise is in water, sanitation and hygiene, um, mm -hmm. natural resource governance, policy and institutional analysis. Deepa has worked primarily in, in South Asia and also in Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Before joining IWMI, she worked at the Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience at Coventry University, UK and earlier at Wageningen University, Netherlands and the UK Department for International Development. It's an honor to have ma'am here and I hand over the microphone to the chairperson of the session, Professor Shanchari Rai Mukherjee. Ma'am. Thank you. So in Dr. Joshi, yes, your presentation is visible. So I would request you to make it full screen. And although I can't see the title of your so you you can proceed. You can proceed. Sure. Okay. Is the presentation visible? Yes, the presentation is visible. So Deepa, you can proceed. It's not on presentation mode. Is that what you're saying? No, no, it's visible. We are going to make it full screen. Okay. Okay. And you is can. Is that okay? Yes, it's visible and you can Should proceed. I proceed? Yeah. Yes, please start. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and I am sincerely apologetic for not being there with you in person. I had really looked forward to doing that. And, you know, it's therefore really unfortunate that I am talking about, <laughs> about gender equality and women's rights virtually over the screen. So my apologies for that. So I'm focusing really today, the talk that I have is focusing on the very sort of um, topic of your meeting, gender equality, women's rights, and you know what do we know about these issues from women's voices in South Asia? So I want to narrow down and look at how do we measure gender equality and are women's voices adequately heard in these measures and estimations of gender equality. Let me give you an example from Bangladesh. So how many of you would agree in the audience that Bangladesh is the most gender equal country in South Asia? It would be nice to have some response actually. Do you agree that Bangladesh is the most gender equal country in South Asia? Anybody? Okay, so it's this is certainly you know something that Bangladesh uh, is really uh, proud. We have Fozia, ma'am, here, so I would like to <laughs> pass it on to Fozia, ma'am. Perhaps she'd be able to. Okay, sure, sure, sure. 
no i'm just uh, saying that statistically there is actually bangladesh actually lead to in south asia but i think reality is different i think deepa will explain it a little bit more on that okay thank you for the man thanks so you know what where where does this measurement come from and it's not just in 2023 that bangladesh has been identified as the most gender equal country in south asia in fact this is a you know title that bangladesh has held and um, had for the last couple of years according to the world economic forums global gender gap index benchmark which measures uh, gender parity across four key dimensions um, as you can see economic participation and opportunity educational attainment health and survival and political empowerment now these are four pretty relevant uh, criteria anyway so you know on the one hand bangladesh rightfully has the you know privilege of being proud of this but my question is you know how do how do such global measures really reflect on ground reality and you know how do they contrast with what women are actually saying about their lives um what's also interesting to note is that you know these these big estimates and statistics these global statistics you know which are so much in fashion so much in use it's it's what we use to quote um, and and uh, make statements you know there's so much contradiction between these different measurements um so for example the world according to the world economic forum measurement the global gender gap index bangladesh leads across south asia however um as per the U undp's gender social norms index bangladesh um, does not do so well and it's well below bhutan sri lanka so what do we make of these different estimates and measurements but much more importantly you know what how do they resonate with women's experiences and women's voice but first before that um how is it that you know what are the main contributory factors for bangladesh being ranked so high on the world economic forum's measurement of gender parity so of course the political empowerment the fact that bangladesh has consistently had female prime ministers is one key issue but also what is really a key contributory factor is the fact that you know 3.2 million marginalized women are employed in bangladesh's ready made garment industry and this is an industry that is really strategic to the country's national economic measurement it contributes 9.5% of bangladesh's gdp and consistently even across covid um, you know when most uh, economic staggered bangladesh's economy you know had very good variation and continued to do well across south asia so the reason that i emphasize this is that also the fact that you know there is some sort of a politics between these type of estimates the industry um you know measurements of national economic growth which feminist researchers have long questioned and what is also really contrasting then is you know that on the one hand you have such statistics and on the other hand this is a 2022 publication by farida akhtar of opinik um, for those of you who know bangladesh so it's a membership based organization so um, what farida speaks about in this particular um, article which is peter doya for a long time i thought it was peter day and i kept looking for that name but then i realized what what the term means is peter doya which is you know which all of you are bengali i think in the hall there or most of you so you i would not need to explain the term but what it means is that you know the obligation of the poor to find any job to keep surviving and so contrasting with these global statistics are local voices saying that actually you know most women and most poor people work very long hours on low wages in bad working conditions face human rights violations gender discrimination harassment and still don't have enough to eat 
you know so it makes for a very strange contradiction um, with these global statistics and also really asks us to question you know why is there this consistent mismatch between wage and food so building on these types of assessments and the questioning of these sort of econometric models to measure empowerment you know what we did was zoom down into the ground and did a very granular study with um, women working in the Bangladesh's uh, ready-made garment industry. And we did this as a longitudinal study. We first went there in 2017, and then we went there again in 2022. And over a long period of time, you know, staying two months to three months in, in the locality themselves, uh, our young career researchers were there working and living you know in in the community so and meeting with these women to really find out what do they make of their lives um, in you know as as factory workers how do they see this as empowerment or not and so these are some of the findings that we had um, and which which also have not changed at all from 2017 to 2022 so what's you know first of all the first point is that Paid work in the RMG industry often helps mitigate financial and social crises. But it's not aspirational. Nobody dreams of being a garment factory worker. In fact, it's a position, you know, that's very much looked down upon by women, by their families, um, by it, within the society in which they live. So we question, you know, how, how can such measures of paid work really count as empowerment? And, and also what is um, interesting is that, you know, people turn to such types of opportunities, employment opportunities um, in, in the formal industry here in the garment factories, but also in many, many informally, you know, work around um, Dhaka and peri-urban Dhaka. Is the, is the, you know, financial, social, and sometimes personal crises that women and their families are unable to escape and you know and have to sort of uh, find a way to mitigate so that was the first thing that this job is not aspirational nobody wants to stay here every single woman that we met you know met wanted to go back home sometime some point with some savings but that brings me to my next point but is there really any savings and is there any you know economic uh, longer term stability for these women and that brings us to this question about you know the wages that the women are receiving and are these are these really living wages and i know that there've been a series of improvement in wages in bangladesh in fact there was uh, a big political strike and i think um, you know a lot of contestation by the workers the unions and um, the factory owners and the government board that meets every 5 years to revise these wages so even though there have been incremental increases in wages, it hardly matters because there is a proportionate increase in inflation, you know, which makes for a zero uh, difference in, in the lives of these women. So what we found that, you know, they, it, it's sort of like a trap. They come here hoping for, you know, making some money and finding a way to go back home again, but then they get stuck in this trap, you know, with, with absolutely no savings at all or very little savings that that makes them unable to go home and what is interesting is that while many of the women and the families escape the rural areas um, to meet sometimes food and income insecurity issues you know their food security has not improved by coming here so one is about the cost of food the type of food that is available and much more um, the quality of food that is available. And the women were very emphatic about this. They kept thinking, you know, all in all our conversations, the food, the, the quality of food back home was really important to them. And, and how they sort of recognized and, and lived with the fact that they were eating very poor quality food. But what is also really important in this issue is that it's also about the whole timing of, of uh, you know, the, the demand on women's domestic care work. 
and as well as on the reliance on women to earn income and how women get sort of squeezed in between these domestic and productive work demands, which definitely impacts how women, their relationship with food. And then the other issue was the quality of life or what we call livability in these peri-urban areas or urban fringes of Dhaka city where these ready-made garment industries are set up where there is you know, very little formal services that migrant workers are entitled to and how they rely on, they live in rented accommodation, very poor rental accommodation, um, and pay disproportionate amounts as rent, um, which includes food, um, sorry, water, water supply, and sometimes even the energy gas um, services and how you know, they struggle with so many families living around and sharing one bathroom, one cooking point, etc. And this, and this, how this struggle is intensified also because they are bound by a very rigorous work demand where they have to reach the factories by 8 a.m. Otherwise, they are not allowed to enter and they lose the day's wage. So this, this overall the pollution that that uh, you know that that is also really. Um, visible in, in these areas because the factory waste, you know, pour into the local water bodies. And so this, the, the living quality of life in these areas is something that, that really, you know, that women are very well aware of, but have so little option to negotiate. And, and what was also really interesting and what we wanted to look at uh, in 2017 and 2022 is that when you earn wages, you know, within the household at least, does your status improve? Does your, you know, what, does your social relationships with men improve? And I think many researchers like Professor Naila Kabir have pointed out that when women start earning money and income, you know, that can be a first step towards better negotiating uh, relationships at the household level. But what we find is that, you know, that this does not really happen. And despite the fact that women are the main bread earners in these households, and entrenched masculinity persists in these areas, and you know that it is, and and what we also found is that sometimes uh, you know there is this this happens because this notion of the men as breadwinner. Um, it's challenged, and so men want to exercise their their you know masculinity in other ways through social control, through violence sometimes, through really you know regulating the lives of their wives, and and so it is like some sort of a very dubious trap where you know female workers are preferred in the ready-made garment industry at least at the starting level as as floor workers because they are more docile, they are you know better workers than men, but at the same time, you know, so it's easier for a woman to find a job, so much so that, uh, you know, men have no qualms about saying that that women, you know, the factories prefer women, so why should I work? You know, my wife, my wife is a better eligible candidate. But then you see these, the fact that you know, this really hasn't changed women's negotiating ability. So women have very little control about um, on their income um, through the work that they do. And, and, you know, just as men exercise their masculinity by exercising control over women's lives, women have to work extra harder to be, you know, good wives because of the fact that they've already broken a social norm by going out of the house, you know, and, and entering public spaces, working with other men and women in the factory floor space. So you see this issue is much more than women and men. It's mm. like you elements of masculinity, femininity, the social norms around these issues that come into play here. So I think Sylvia Chan, who works at um, the London School of Economics, she really sort of hits the nail on the head when she says that you know what 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 is increasingly visible globally is this intensified reliance on women's domestic and productive work which translates to you know reliance on women's time labor and lives and in ways in which the women themselves are largely unable to negotiate the terms and conditions of these demands 
and the ways in which their lives are being pulled in so many different directions. So, I think the important issue that I want to point here is that, you know, what, what, I mean, how, how do we contribute as feminist, uh, you know, researchers into, into these um, assessments of economic growth or empowerment? So I think um, what's really important to remember is that, you know, what, what remains visible in most measures and economic measures of, um, you know, growth and em empowerment and, em and economic empowerment is we look at wage lab labor, right? And, and we often that is driven in a very capitalistic market economy globally across the world, not just in Bangladesh. And we really forget that, you know, the contribution to this economic uh, growth lies on so many un, un, you know, seen hidden parts of the informal economy which is, you know, the fact that families need to make so many arrangements to make it possible for these women to work. There's unpaid work, let's say, of mother-in-laws looking after children so that their daughter-in-laws are freed for domestic work. You know, there's so many under-the-table arrangements that you have to do. The friendship between women that makes it possible for them to do this work. Different contexts, different issues. but. The visible economy is supported by so much more larger and invisible informal care economy that we fail to recognize and measure. Um, that's the point that I want to make here. And Maria Mies, um, you know, emphasizes that um, this further by saying that, you know, it's it's also the the invisibility of women's subsistence work which continues or which makes it possible for men to work in cases where women don't work, you know, because women are taking on responsibilities of the household. But in the case of the RMG workers, it's both the subsistence and the productive work, the visible and the invisible work that women, you know, are, are, are expected to fulfill. So, the, the point that I really want to emphasize here is that if we want to really understand gender equality and um, you know, bring new, new thinking um, into this area, then we have to challenge the status quo of science of, and of theory and policy and practice. So, which includes, you know, challenging, you know, the principles of economics. So, dismantling these assumptions of economy as productive, as, you know, only relating to wage labor, only what is visible on, on the surface, etc. So that is the important, I think, larger message that we want to take away from, from this work. And, and fundamentally, how do we do that, you know? Um, and, and also, it, it really comes down to, you know, how do we want to do our research and how do we want to do our science? And um, what's really important now and which has gained global sort of recognition is this whole aspect of, you know, for the fact that science is very patriarchal, very colonized. And if we really want to understand and see things differently, then we need to decolonize the way that we've been doing our research, our science, thinking of economics, for example, as a practice. And and so sort of relying less on expert-driven parachute science. You know, here's a colonial picture of uh, uh, study of cholera in Calcutta. Uh, but then I think, you know, is, is there any difference in the way in which we do our science? You know, we as researchers, expert researchers, sitting here in comfortable places, going occasionally to the field to gather data through survey and formats, etc. How do we change this? How do we bring more experiential uh, knowledge? How do we recognize the power dynamics in knowledge, but also in the way in which we think about science? the way in which we do our science. So I think that is fundamentally also a key message that you know emerges from, from the work that we did in Bangladesh. That actually, you know, the expert assessments of economic empowerment have so little complementarity with women's experiences of their own lives and their own um, economic situation. So what I do want to add here is that 
you know, in the case of Bangladesh, interesting to point out that there were recent struggles for, you know, increasing the wages. But I want to, and a lot of women workers participated and contributed to that. But the argument that we want to make is, is this the only thing that women should really be fighting about, you know, as, as wage laborers? What about the whole unseen part of their life, the struggles they have as migrant workers living in these, you know, very difficult to live, challenging areas, coping with domestic and productive work. If if women were given a chance to, you know, you know, fight for the things that matter to them, would it only be wages? Yes, of course, wages matter, but would it only be wages? So, you know, how do we think? How do we broaden our our idea of of uh, economy? And I think many of you are already aware that you know that that. There are now, there is now significant uh, emphasis on the care economy of recognizing this invisible part of the economy, which helps the formal economy, the visible, the very economic, econometric measure of economy to, you know, to, to, to continue to grow. So I think those are things that we need to really be um, aware of. And and so I work within the CGIAR, which focuses on you know, um, agriculture and food security. So the message that we have been making from this study for my own institution is also to recognize the, the rural to urban continuum and food security, so migration and how things change. And, and so really looking, broadening the horizon of looking at food and food security, you know, beyond, uh, beyond production. And also thinking of like even if we are thinking, for example, of urban agriculture or, or urban, you know, food initiatives, recognizing that for marginalized women, you know, maybe fundamentally we need to begin with social protection initiatives you know, that ensure a better quality of life for these women. So this is this is my presentation um, i've made it deliberately short so that i can hopefully have interesting conversations with all of you um, i can stop sharing my screen and maybe we can have questions thank you dr joshi for enlightening us on the garment industry in bangladesh and um, if there's any kind of questions or um, even the people who are online, if you want to know a little more or if you had to have any queries, please do so. I think her presentation was very clear about the women's position, economic position or economic empowerment, the so-called economic empowerment of women in the garments factory in Bangladesh. In fact, Dr. Joshi, we were talking about the garments factory yesterday also. And uh, in the keynote, I made a reference to that. And while saying, also saying that uh, we are not sure whether women are really empowered and uh, by uh, being a part of the financial sector, because whatever uh, provisions have been made for them might not be very conducive for their well-being. That is exactly what my, in, I'm, I did not get into the garment industry, but then you complimented everything, whatever was said yesterday. Anyway, since uh, nobody is responding, I'd just like to add, um, Dr. Joshi, actually, basically, this is a, a part of South Asia in Bangladesh, where these women's voices, whether they are heard or not, uh, that's a different question. But recently, there has been strikes and all for wage revisions. And um, what I find from uh, your discussion on the garments factory, it's very similar to our women workers present in the tea gardens, actually, tea plantations where it is also, um, you know, there's, it's, it's been really highlighted that uh, s such great number of women are being employed in the tea, tea industry or the tea plantations 
that uh, that they are economically empowered and therefore and there is a um, there is a notion of gender equality being present in such sectors and which actually um, if you d dwell a little uh, deeper into such issues both within the garment industry and the tea industry which is very similar uh, we'll find that there are very subtle gender discrimination which is at play and uh, this kind of gender discrimination uh, only we researchers try to understand that but uh, the, f the workers themselves actually fail to uh, notice that and that's particularly because they are quite happy that they're getting the wages and they're surviving both at the subsist uh, sorry, subsistence level as you pointed out and uh, they, it's so similar when you're talking about the quality of life and you're talking about the food quality etc these are exactly the things which we talk about on the tea plantation garden workers and the only thing i just wanted to know i'm not very sure Fazia, you can also point out whether they are peace rated workers the wages they receive whether it is peace rated or it's like daily wages or monthly wages so it's not peace rated so that that means at least they are in a slightly better condition than the uh, tea garden women workers where they have to they are it's peace rated work you are given a task to complete unless and until you complete that task you don't get the daily wage that you are uh, that you have uh, that you get so uh, there are this uh, certain um, and what was most very interesting was that that the very concept of men being the breadwinners have been challenged by this industry the garment industry where women are workers and possibly they are the sole earners of the family and at the same time the entrenched masculinity which dr joshi pointed out that women not being the breadwinners but at the same time they want to exert full control over the women or their spouses in various forms by by uh, displaying their masculinity the something which is evident during the covid period when many men lost their jobs and their frustration was you know like transferred to the home and especially to on their on their spouses and um, this is something i think uh, it's prevalent in not only in the garment industry but in most of the sectors where men are unable to um, become the breadwinners or earning very low wages for survival and at the same time this is also true that these women are entrapped within this industry like as she pointed out that they had very low savings and they had nowhere to turn to because job opportunities were so low and uh, it's very similar to the uh, entrapment of the women and men, both men and women in the tea gardens uh, or the tea plantations where uh, it is very difficult to move outside and one one thing which is very different i'm trying to just say it because um, since we did not mention anything about the tea plantations in uh, in india um, it's what one thing which is only different is that even though they are migrant workers they may be within the uh, bangladesh territory and but uh, at the same time they are not very much different from the local uh, local people outside the garment factory because the garment factories are also located in dhaka and in and around dhaka and uh, every uh, but in case of the tea garden workers they were completely uprooted from different they were santals and they were uprooted and brought to this tea garden especially in the doers areas as you know and therefore there was a cultural division absolutely a cultural segregation between what was there inside the enclave tea enclave and outside which is the agricultural area so the local uh, local population could not mix with them nor did the uh, uh, garden workers find any kind of resources or help from the local population so this was a very uh, um, subtle way of entrapping them or keeping them within the boundaries of the of the tea gardens and not to move out elsewhere and all of them became the ready source of supply of labor in the future years to come anyway 
So this garment factory workers, as we had mentioned, and Dr. Joshi mentioned, that even though they were earning, they were workers, so, but economic empowerment, the way it has been defined, uh, you know, like you, are, you have to be an earner, you have to take your own decision about how to spend your earnings and etc. Autonomy on decision making, this is very much lacking for the workers in the garment industry, which Dr. Joshi pointed out. And that is why we really are unsure that as per the statistics, the presence of women workers means that, you know, uh, we really inflate the position of, winf of women in the society, saying that they are women workers and earners, and therefore they are economically empowered. And however, in the real, real, uh, in the reality, what we find is that this is far from the truth, because they are subjugated. They do not f have the autonomy. They do not have the autonomy of decision making, and also to decide on what, how their earnings are going to be spent. So this, uh, uh, all these things lead to what, what I, what I could surmise from Dr. Joshi's um, the presentation was that there is a real gap between the what the researchers actually think about. Um, or define economic empowerment and um, and the reality of what exactly the re economic uh, empowerment should be. Anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Joshi, for your presentation. You give a very good outline of the garment factory. So I, I think there are certain questions which I think, Dr. Joshi, you need to take. I cannot read. No question. OK, OK. There are comments. There are comments. There's a question, uh, ma'am. Uh, I'm reading it out for you. Gender equality encourages the notion of women's economic independence. But this independence also is not without its drawbacks, as they are thought so self reliant that men at times rely too much on them and expect them to manage home and outside work with little support or no support at all. How would you assess this idea of men looking upon such women as super women? So I, I think I would just say that, um, you know, thanks so much for, for this comment and question. I think it actually captures the heart of what I have been trying to emphasize, and also what um, Sanchari, Dr. Sanchari Roy has um, just mentioned. So I think this this visioning and this idea of, of paid work being, you know, the, the way forward for empowering women or sort of giving women a rightful space is therefore very much masculine in its thinking in much of the same way as in which men you know, are beginning to look at women, um, and and as Sylvia Chan points out, on relying on women to not just perform, you know, to become super women, so to to excel in the domestic as well as in the productive space, right? And I think it is these ideas of masculinity that we need to challenge. Uh, and rather than you know going along with the flow and assuming that the way forward for empowering women is through paid productive work, um, so I think at the heart of what I have been emphasizing is is this sort of uh, patriarchal thinking in science and definition of what is economic growth, what is economic empowerment that that needs to be challenged in much of the same way that men's ideas about you know, women to function as super women needs to be challenged because I, I think, you know, what is called for um, is much more uh, a recognition and value for domestic women's unpaid, invisible domestic care work, number one. Number two, understanding that, you know, paid work in the formal or informal industry you know, does not necessarily, you know, guarantee uh, an, in, an improvement 
in women's lives unless the work is you know is is decent work as defined by ILO which has so many conditionalities of you know what is decent work it begins with living wages that are you know cognizant of inflation rates it recognizes the rights of women you know to and and the the their their domestic and productive what the domestic and productive demands um, so you know how do we, how do we make it possible for women to work in this space while still functioning as mothers and wives and 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 daughter-in-laws etc how do we ensure that there is more flexibility for women in, in this space how do we ensure that you know women's voices and experiences actually count in what is being negotiated at the table in terms of improvement of of um, of the type of work and and i think the ready-made garment factory is a classic example where you know the, every five years there is national protest for and and negotiation for salaries or after the infamous um, accidents in bangladesh you know where there was a with a lot of emphasis by international buyers there was an improvement in factory working conditions. All that is good. All that is important. All that is necessary. I don't mean to, you know, um, deny any of that. But I think the emphasis is that you know other things need to be improved as well. Women's lives and their work need to be looked in a much more holistic way, and the recognition that women, you know, should not be expected to function as super women. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your. Very yeah, and I just wanted to um, say a few things to um, Dr. Dr. Sanjari Roy um, when she made her comments about uh, the, the few things. Um, so first of all, um, in in the garment factory, there are so many regulations. So one, starting with you know the fact that if you arrive late, you miss your day's wage, and not allowed to enter the factory. Um, it is paid work at the end of every month. Um, but and a fixed amount of the paid work but within the factory floor itself uh, there are you know requirements on how many tasks and how many pieces of tasks that women need to complete and and also uh, their their status as migrants uh, you know it's very interesting so although there isn't this historical uh, you know a migration that happened as in the tea garden workers and there is much more sort of uh, you know migration within the within nearby areas villages etc but what we notice is that there is a very stark divide between the the locals and the factory workers so even though they are all bengali even though they are all women you know there is a class um, divide definitely um, because the locals were catering to, to housing for these uh, garment factory workers, but there is also a looking down upon migrants, you know, and as women um, who are working within the factory. And so what is interesting is that in none of the factory locations we, we noticed, in our research locations, we noticed uh, local women working in these factories, you know, so no local woman is servicing at the at the very lowest rung of the ready-made garment industry. So all of these workers are migrant women. And, and there is a distinct separation and divide between these women and the local women in maybe ways that are not very unsimilar to what thank you, you mentioned for the tea gardens. OK, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, uh, we have uh, Professor Fozia Manan. She wants to uh, put in an observation, ma'am. So, uh, uh, it is a very uh, uh, good presentation, Dr. Altan. Okay, the good presentation, and uh, it is a uh, you know giving us uh, so much of new thoughts and ideas. But my question is uh, that uh, all these ideas of you know the e economic empowerment and women's advancement is coming from the liberal feminism, and that is completely from the Western. Uh, feminist thought. So in the South Asian region, because we know that it is not working in that manner, the women are having a different realities in their own lives as you, you know, uh, elaborate in your 
uh, presentation. So what do you think that how the is South Asian feminism need to look at or what kind of issues needs to be raised in this uh, manner? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Fauzia. Actually, I think COVID-19 was a classic example which showed that there isn't very much a difference of women's lives, whether in the global north or the global south. So in fact, uh, the biggest, uh, I think, you know, uh, arguments for the domestic care economy to be recognized as, as a formal, you know, as part of the formal economy has, has come essentially from global north uh, feminists who I think struggle in very much the same way as, as uh, you know, women in the global south struggle. I think what is distinctly uh, different for Zia is that, you know, there is a class and an economic uh, sort of a pattern that exists here in the global south. Um, and some very interesting studies, in fact, done in, in the Kolkata region, which point out that um, this issue is not so much about women. It's really about masculinity and femininity. And, and the fact that when, you know, there was this classic study in, in Kolkata, which looked at how uh, middle class women, upper middle class women, their relationships with their male domestic helps in the house. And the fact that the gender roles were completely reversed, and here it was the you know the the the, the uh, lady of the house who assumed a very masculine role, uh, and it was the male masculine servant who had to be very feminine and adopt many feminine traits to sort of have a good working relationship within the household. So I think the point that I want to make um, uh, here is, I think, you know, is, is also this issue about if we look at it from a South Asia perspective, then I think intersectionality is really important to bring about the fact that class, caste, uh, and other issues, uh, age, disability, come into play in how we think about, uh, you know, uh, paid work, opportunities for work, uh, demands for domestic and productive work, etc. Number one, and also how these roles can be reversed, uh, you know, between men and women, masculinity and femininity, depending on where we are across the social hierarchy, socio-economic hierarchy. That is what I would um, say that that would be very different from looking at, at these issues. But I think globally, the world over, I think, you know, there is, um, I think that there are a couple of instances and incidences that have shown that, you know, we, we actually, there is a certain element of similarity on what women are going through. If you look at the whole Me Too movement um, that happened in the, you know, Hollywood film industry, and then some sort of echoes of it in, in the Indian Bollywood industry as well. What's really interesting is that women have been marginalized for so long and so silent, uh, you know, in, in an industry that is one of the top, uh, economic, uh, you know, areas to work in. So the fact that these highly rich and supposedly empowered women were being sexually harassed and marginalized for so long and unable to speak out. Now, how does that make their situation any different from what we would see in the, in the global south, you know, um, and, and sort of the harassment of women? So I, I think fundamentally what I want to end with by saying, Fauzia, is that I wouldn't say there is such a distinction between the lives of women in the global north and the global south. Um, but I think if we want to approach things from a more South Asian perspective, then I think we need to look at context and contextual issues yes. and how these come into play in, in, you know, in how we exercise our masculinity, femininity at work and at home. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Joshi. And uh, in fact, the final part of your uh, explanation was very, very important, things that we also discussing yesterday. Thank you so much for being with us uh, and uh, sharing your valuable time with us, okay, and your views. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Professor Shanchari Rai Mukherjee for chairing the session. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yesterday at a point of time, I say time is patriarchal. And uh, I am so sorry. Uh, I am I'm being, uh, I'm being forced to actually continue the session without the coffee break. We'll just have the coffees passed on so that we can finish it on time. So um, may I very humbly request the speaker for our next talk, uh, Professor Dr. Ronjita Chakraborty, to kindly come up on the dais. Ma'am, if you have a presentation or PPT, do you have that? <laughs> okay, yes. So thank you. I also humbly request Professor Dr. Fozia Mannan to be the chair of this session. Tai Deva Ajay. Ashun, please. Someone please silence my phone. Sorry uh, for that phone. And uh, ma'am, please be seated. Another kind of presentation. slides PPT I take the opportunity to introduce the speaker and uh, apart from the fact that we have literally seen her um, not grow up but then we are uh, we are in always awe of ma'am I call her Ronjita Di in person and um, I would like to introduce her even though she said no need to introduce me but I take this uh, opportunity. So, ma'am is actually a professor at the Department of Political Science, University of North Bengal. And she has, uh, she has her research interest centered around gender studies and human rights, public administration, development studies, environmental studies, and India's government and politics. She has received the university gold medal uh, both at her undergraduate and postgraduate level and has been teaching for more than 15 years. She has authored a book titled Women's Empowerment and Gender Insecurities, A South Asian Perspective. Apart from that, ma'am has always been very vocal about academic spaces uh, being gender friendly, if I may put it that way. And she has been very active in voicing our issues and also speaking about our experiences. So with that, I hand over the mi microphone to Professor Fozia Mannan, who shall be the chair of this session. So also, this is my an honor and privilege to be here. And uh, I, sh I should not introduce in before uh, uh, Ranjita Chakrabarti will uh, discuss her. Uh, research findings. Please start. The microphone is over to you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> so basically, um, I will uh, uh, looking at the audience. Of course, I, it will be a mixed uh, language in the sense that um, with English and Bengali, I would be kind of uh, doing it. And uh, today, I have decided to speak on uh, the land rights, basically using it as a case for understanding how gender inequality and marginalization happens and how it is, even if it is not intended, it happens or it takes place. And here I am using land. Now basically, if you, I, I have started my argument from understanding what is women's economic opportunity, which is an index that is defined by the economists and they say that this index is understood by how we actually how the laws the regulations the customs they take note or they take 
uh, they uh, they kind of develop the opportunities or they open up the opportunities of women and this is uh, very important in the sense that when this indexing was done iceland it got a rating of 83.02 whereas india it got 41.95 although is it south asia but i will be focusing my arguments on india of course taking some kind of understanding from the rest of the countries now another index that is there that is called gender inequality index it basically focuses on three parameters that is reproductive then economic empowerment and of course the um, political empowerment and uh, when i am trying to understand it i am using the framework again of that it is argued again that access to resources would mean that you are empowered মানে ধরে নেওয়া হচ্ছে যদি আমার কাছে রিসোর্সেস থাকে তাহলে আমি অনেক বেশি ক্ষমতায়ন আমার আছে তো রিসোর্স বলতে এখানে বোঝা যেতে পারে আমার কাছে অর্থ আছে আমার কাছে ভূমি আছে ল্যান্ড আছে বা আমার একটা পলিটিক্যাল পজিশন আছে আমি হয়তো কোথাও পঞ্চায়েত বা আমি এক জায়গায় পড়াচ্ছি সো আই এম ভেরি এমপাওয়ার্ড এইবার এই জায়গা থেকে আই এম স্টার্টিং অন দিস আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ডিং যে আরেকটা থিসিস খুব চলমান যেটা চলে সেটা বলা হয় যে যেখানে লো ইনকাম কান্ট্রি সেই জায়গাগুলোতে কিন্তু দেখা যাচ্ছে যে ক্ষমতায়ন কম এবং ওখানে আরেকটা জিনিসও দেখা যাচ্ছে যে ল্যান্ড ওনারশিপ সেখানে কিন্তু অনেকটাই কম যেখানে হাই ইনকাম কান্ট্রিজ যেমন আমরা আমাদের ভারতবর্ষকে নিয়ে আমরা দেখছি যে ইকোনমিটা অনেক হাই ইকোনমি কিন্তু সেই পরিপ্রেক্ষিতে আমরা এইটা দেখার চেষ্টা করছি যে ল্যান্ড ওনারশিপের রেটটা কতখানি এবং কি অবস্থায় সেকেন্ড থিং যেটা আমরা ইকোনমিক অপরচুনিটি এমপ্লয় আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড করা বোঝার জন্য করছি সেটা হচ্ছে বড়োইংয়ের পার্সেন্টেজ বড়োইংয়ের পার্সেন্টেজ যদি আমাদের পপুলেশন দেখি সেই অনুপাতে কিন্তু দেখা যাচ্ছে বড়োইংয়ের ক্ষেত্রে মেল অনেক এগিয়ে কম্পেয়ার টু ফিমেল বাট দেন দ্যাট গ্যাপ ইজ নট ভেরি হাই গ্যাপ কেন হাই নয় বেশিরভাগ ক্ষেত্রে দেখা যাচ্ছে যে যেমন আগে আমরা জমি মর্গেজ করে করতাম এখন কিন্তু দের ইজ আ কাইন্ড অফ অনেক বেশি সাপোর্ট দেওয়া হচ্ছে মুদ্রা লোন মুদ্রা লোন বা গয়না জুয়েলারি বন্ধক দিয়ে লোন অ্যান্ড জুয়েলারি ইজ সামথিং দ্যাট উইমেন হ্যাভ ইটস নট মেন উইমেন হ্যাভ ইট অ্যান্ড এই ক্ষেত্রে কিন্তু মহিলাদের ক্রেডিট বা বড়োইংয়ের পার্সেন্টেজটাও অনেক হাই দেখাচ্ছে আরেকটা জিনিস যেটা আমরা দেখতে পাচ্ছি যে অ্যাগ্রিকালচার আর এন্টারপ্রেনারশিপ খুব বেশি ইনভলভ এবং এখানে মহিলারা অনেক বেশি ডিপেন্ডেন্ট না ওয়েন উই লুক অ্যাট দি রে ওয়ার্কার্স তখন দেখা যাচ্ছে যে মেয়েদেরকে বেসিক্যালি তাদের মার্জিনাল ওয়ার্কার হিসেবে দেখা হচ্ছে অলদো তারা কিন্তু তাদের জমিতে পুরোটাই কাজ করছে স্পেশালি আমি যদি গতকালের ডিসকাশন থেকে তুলে আনি উইচ ইজ কোয়াইট সিমিলার ইন মোস্ট অফ দ্য কান্ট্রিজ প্রফেসর মান্নান যেটা বলেছিলেন যে যেভাবে মাইগ্রেশন হচ্ছে মাইগ্রেশন হওয়ার ফলে আমরা কিন্তু বেশিরভাগ ক্ষেত্রে দেখছি যে পুরুষরা মাইগ্রেট করে যাচ্ছেন এবং তাদের যে জমিটা সেটা কিন্তু মহিলারা সেখানে চাষবাস করছেন কিন্তু এই যে চাষবাসটা করছেন সেখানেও কিন্তু একটা আমরা প্যারাডক্স দেখতে পাচ্ছি সেই প্যারাডক্সগুলো আমরা বলছি এবার আমি ভূমিটাকে নিচ্ছি কেন অ্যাজ ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট অফকোর্স আমি এখানে রুরাল উইমেন ধরছি যে যেখানে ভূমি দ্য ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট ল্যান্ড বিকামস ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট অ্যান্ড ইট ইজ নট জাস্ট আ প্রপার্টি কারণ ল্যান্ড একটা আইডেন্টিটির প্রশ্ন ল্যান্ড অলসো গিভস অ্যান আইডেন্টিটি জমির মালকিন জমির মালিকানা সেটা কিন্তু একটা আইডেন্টিটির সঙ্গে লিঙ্কড আছে যদি আমরা সোসাইটি বা আমরা গ্রামে সার্ভে যখন করছি তখন দেখতে পাচ্ছি এবং এটার সঙ্গে একটা আরেকটা লিঙ্ক আছে সেটা হচ্ছে তার সামাজিক অবস্থান সোশ্যাল স্ট্যাটাস অ্যান্ড পলিটিক্যাল পজিশন তার কতখানি জমির আছে তার হোল্ডে সে ভেদার সে জমির মালিক কি না সেটাও কিন্তু ডিটারমাইন করছে তার সামাজিক অবস্থান এবং তার রাজনৈতিক অবস্থান এবং রাজনৈতিক ডিসিশন মেকিংয়ের ক্ষমতা এবার আমরা যদি দেখি ভারতবর্ষে ল্যান্ড রাইটসটা আমরা কিভাবে ট্রান্সফার পাচ্ছি সেটা হচ্ছে ইনহেরিটেন্স একটা হচ্ছে জন্মসূত্রে যেটা পাচ্ছি ট্রান্সফার ফ্রম স্টেট বা টেন্যান্সি অ্যারেঞ্জমেন্ট যদি এরকম হয় এবং আমরা এখানেও আবার দুটো ভাগে দেখতে পাচ্ছি উইচ আজ বিকাম ভেরি রিসেন্টলি কারণ একটা পেপার পাবলিশ হচ্ছে জি টোয়েন্টি জন্য একটা পেপার পাবলিশ হয় যেটাতে আরও বেশি উই আর অ্যাকচুয়ালি আমরা খুব সেলিব্রেট করছি পেপারটাকে কিন্তু এটা কিন্তু একটা অন্য দিকে নিয়ে যাওয়ার চেষ্টা করছি উইচ আই এম ট্রাইং টু হিন্ট 
তো সেখানে একটা বলা হচ্ছে ওনারশিপ রাইটস মানে আপনার জমি ইউ আর দি ওনার অফ দ্যাট অ্যান্ড দেয়ার ইজ এ ইউজার রাইট মানে আপনার জমি নয় ইউ হ্যাভ বিন লিস্ট অ্যান্ড ইউ আর ইউজিং ইট এখানে যে কনসিডারেশন হচ্ছে যে আমরা যখন জমি অধিকার নিয়ে কথা বলছি তা আমরা সবাই জানি এখন আমি যখন বলবো যে হ্যাঁ আমরা তো ইকুয়াল রাইটসের কথাই জানি প্রপার্টি ইকুয়াল রাইটস ইন ইন্ডিয়া দ্যাট ডাজ এক্সিস্ট বাট দ্য কোয়েশ্চেন ইজ শুড উই নট ডিফারেন্সিয়েট বিটুইন আ লিগাল রাইট অ্যান্ড এ সোশ্যাল রাইট নাও লেট মি এক্সপ্লেন এ লিটল বিট যখন পরিবারে হয়তো জমি আছে চাষের জমি আছে এবং যখন মেয়েটি এবং ভাগ হচ্ছে তখন যখন ভাগ হচ্ছে জমি বন্টন হচ্ছে শেয়ারিং অফ প্রপার্টি হচ্ছে তখন যদি মেয়েটি যদি পরিবার থেকে তাকে দিয়ে দেওয়া হলো দিয়ে দেওয়া হলো ওকে দেয়ার ইজ আ ডিফারেন্স দ্যাট গিভিং আওয়ে ইট ইজ ওকে বাট ইফ দ্য গার্ল সেজ দ্যাট আই ওয়ান্ট এই আই ওয়ান্ট যখনই বলছে যে আমারও ইকুয়াল শেয়ার আছে এই প্রপার্টির ওপরে তখন তাকে আমরা কিভাবে নিচ্ছি সমাজ তাকে কিভাবে নিচ্ছে সে কি ভালো বোন বা ভালো মেয়ে হতে পারছে নাকি তাকে প্রশ্নের সম্মুখীন হতে হচ্ছে যে শি ইজ ক্রিয়েটিং ট্রাভেল ইনসাইড দি হোম সে তার বাড়িতে সমস্যা তৈরি করছে সো ভেরি অফেন উইমেন ডু নট টেক দ্যাট রাইট তারা কিন্তু সেই অধিকারটা ভোগ করতে চায় না যদি দিল ভালো যদি না দিল দেন অলসো আমার এটা একটা সিকিউরিটি আমার বাড়িতে আমার ম্যারিটাল হোমে যদি কোনো সমস্যা হয় আমার পরিবারে যদি সমস্যা হয় দেন আই ক্যান অলওয়েজ ফল ব্যাক অন মাই দিস হোম যেটার দরজা খোলা থাকে দ্য ডোরস উইল বি ওপেন ওয়াই বিকজ আই হ্যাভ নট ক্রিয়েটেড এনি ট্রাভেল আমি তার প্রপার্টি শেয়ার নেই নি উইচ ওয়াজ মাই রাইট বাট আই এম নট টেকিং ইট বিকজ আই ওয়ান্ট টু এনশিওর পিস সেকেন্ড প্রবলেম যেটা রয়েছে সেটা হচ্ছে ownership and effective rights now ei jaga ta khub interesting ownership hoyto apnar jomi ta apnar name ache kintu effective rights mane shetai jekhane when you are able to decide what do you do with your land whether i uh, invest it whether i sell it ami eta bikri kore debo na ami eta rekhe debo na lease debo na ki korbo na ki foshol folabo shei decision ta ki ami nite parchi whether i am able to do it or not so that is also something which determines the ownership thakle you are not the owner of the land but whether you have an effective right on it or not that is also something that needs to be discussed and uh, third hocche ei je rights gulo onek onek jaygay kintu jomir bonthon jemon north east er bibhinno jaygay jomi ta kintu bonthon ta emon bhabe hoy na je individual ke dicche jemon amra bhabi that we are very used to thinking that i am purchasing a land as an individual it is always not so like that ekhane community land land ta kintu community to shekhane jekhane community land hocche shekhane kintu odhikarer je definition ta shekhane ta kintu palte jacche ebong onek jaygay dekha jay je jodi mohila jomi ta bikri korte chan tokhon tar husband ke proshno korte tar husband er permission nite hoy ba poribarer permission nite hoy whether to sell it or not now that is also something which is not really or rather it is kind of creating questions or problematizing the whole conception of land rights jeta niye amra eto ta celebrate kori now basically charte bishoy khub important আমি বেশি দূর যাব না আই উড জাস্ট ফোকাস অন দিস ফোর পয়েন্টস একটা হচ্ছে ওয়েলফেয়ার দ্বিতীয় হচ্ছে এফিসিয়েন্সি তৃতীয় হচ্ছে ইকুয়ালিটি চতুর্থ হচ্ছে এম্পাওয়ারমেন্ট না ওয়েলফেয়ারের ক্ষেত্রে একটা জিনিস বেশিরভাগ অ্যাজামশনসগুলো যেটা চলে যে পুরুষের ওয়েলফেয়ার মানি মহিলার ওয়েলফেয়ার এসপেশালি সো ইন কেস ওয়েন দেয়ার ইজ আ হাজব্যান্ড ওয়াইফ রিলেশনশিপ এক্সিস্টিং যে যদি হাজব্যান্ডের নামে হয় তাতে কোনো সমস্যা নেই হাজব্যান্ডের নামে হয়েছে তার মানে মহিলারও ওয়েলফেয়ার হয়েই যাবে বিকজ তার তো পরিবারে যাচ্ছে সুতরাং ঠিক যেই আর্গুমেন্ট বা যেই লজিকে দেখা যায় যে ফার্মে তার জমিতে কাজ করছে যখন সেখানে কিন্তু আনপেড ওয়ার্ক হয়ে যাচ্ছে সে তো তার নিজের বাড়ির জন্য করছে বা সে যখন বাড়িতে এসে হয়তো বাইরে কাজ করছে বেদার ইট ইজ আরবান অর রুরাল যখন সে বাইরে কাজ করছে অ্যান্ড দেন এগেইন কামিং ব্যাক হোম অ্যান্ড দেন এগেইন ওয়ার্কিং তখনও কিন্তু ঠিক এই আর্গুমেন্টটাই দিয়ে দেওয়া হচ্ছে ইট ইজ সামথিং দ্যাট ইউ আর ডুইং অ্যাট অ্যাট ইয়ার ওন প্লেস তো এটাতে আবার টাকা পয়সা কি ঠিক যেই প্রশ্ন থাকবে এটা তো ভালোবাসা দিয়ে করা হচ্ছে নাও দ্যাট ইজ আ ভেরি ইন্টারেস্টিং ট্র্যাপ যে যেখানে এইরকম একটা আর্গুমেন্ট দিয়ে দেওয়া হয় যে দ্যাট 
you your rights jeta tumi bolte paro je amar eta odhikar ami keno eta korbo that question is nipped at the bud because it's again uh, uh, the, the the idea is about that welfare eto tomari welfare er jonno hocche tomar husband er kache jacche to it's for your welfare tomar poribar er kache jacche tomar welfare tomar dadar kache jacche bhai er kache jacche tumi bon you will always get it second is that the idea of uh, improving women's lives এবং সেখানে কিন্তু আমরা মহিলাকে একটা আলাদা হিসেবে এন্টিটি হিসেবে কিন্তু আমরা দেখছি না অ্যান্ড সেকেন্ডলি যেটা আমরা দেখছি সেটা হচ্ছে মেন ইউ টক অ্যাবাউট এফিসিয়েন্সি অ্যান্ড ইউজার রাইটস বা ইফেক্টিভ ওয়ে অফ আমার নিজের অধিকার আমার নিজের জমি সেটাকে আমি যখন এফেক্টিভলি ডিল করব তখন আমার অ্যাকসেস টু ক্রেডিট বা ইনপুটসের ক্ষেত্রেও দেখা যাচ্ছে সেখানে কিন্তু সমস্যা হতে যদি আমার নামে জমিটা না থাকে তখন বেশিরভাগ ক্ষেত্রে কিন্তু আমি ডিসিশানটা নিতে পারছি না ইভেন ইফ ইট কামস টু মি যে আমি কি ফসল ফলাব বা কি ওখানে ব্যবহার করব কি সার দেব সেগুলো কিন্তু আমরা ডিসিশানটা নিচ্ছি না এবং সেটা কিন্তু ইট কেম আউট ইন ভেরিয়াস স্টাডিজ বিকজ আমি এই যে আর্গুমেন্টসগুলো করছি বেসিক্যালি ইট ইজ বেসড অন ফিউ অফ প্রাইমারি স্টাডিজ অ্যান্ড মেনি অফ দ্য স্টাডিজ দ্যাট ওয়ার কন্ডাক্টেড বাই ভেরিয়াস অথার্স অ্যান্ড অলসো এনজিওস না অনেক ক্ষেত্রে দেখা যাচ্ছে যে এফিসিয়েন্ট ইউজ অফ ল্যান্ড যে নারী মহিলাদের কাছে যদি ল্যান্ডটা থাকে তাহলে এফিসিয়েন্ট ইউজ হবে না এই মিথটা কিন্তু একবার একটা ব্রেক করা হয় প্রধান বলে একটা এনজিও তারা ট্রাইবাল ডিস্ট্রিক্টস ইন ওড়িশাতে তারা একটা কাজ করে ভেরি রিসেন্টলি এবং সেখানে তারা স্বনির্ভর গোষ্ঠীর মহিলাদেরকে দিয়ে কাজটা করায় গ্রুপ ফার্মিং এবং দেখা যায় যে এই ল্যান্ডটা তাদের যেহেতু গ্রুপ আমরা ওনারশিপের কথা এখনও আমাদের ভারতবর্ষে নেই সেই জন্য কি হচ্ছে তারা একটা অন্য কারোর জমি চাষের জন্য নিচ্ছে লিজ করে অ্যান্ড ওয়েন দিস ওয়াজ টেকেন দেন হোয়াট হ্যাপেন দে স্টার্টেড ম্যানেজিং ইট বেটার সেই মহিলারা যেই কাজটা যেই ল্যান্ডটার থেকে আউটপুট যত হচ্ছিল তার থেকে বেশি প্রোডাকটিভ করার ফলে হোয়াট হ্যাপেন নেক্সট টাইম দ্য ইনপুট কস্ট ওয়াজ ইনক্রিজড ল্যান্ডস রেন্ট ওয়াজ ইনক্রিজড কারণ মহিলারা অনেক বেশি এফিসিয়েন্টলি ওটা করছিল ফাইনালি ইট বিকেম ভেরি ডিফিকাল্ট টু কন্টিনিউ আর এই এক্সপেরিমেন্টটা কিন্তু যদিও ইন দ্য কাইন্ড অফ দে দ্য স্টিল কনসিডারিং ইট বাট ইট হ্যাজ বিকাম ভেরি ডিফিকাল্ট নাও when you talk about equality and empowerment also these are very much linked it has been seen that there is a direct linkage jokhon mohilader hate jokhon land asche it was found in way back at a struggle hoy bodh gaya the 1979 e 1979 e jokhon ei mohilader hate khomotayan hoy in the sense that they got lands and they became owners of lands because husbands were alcoholic সো দে কুড নট ডু মাচ ওয়ার্ক যেহেতু তারা কাজ করতে পারতো না তখন মহিলারা সেই কাজটা নিয়ে নেয় এর ফল যেটা হয় সেই সে তার ফলে তারা কিন্তু অ্যালকোহলিক হাজবেন্ডসদের এগেনস্টে কন্টেস্ট করে অ্যান্ড দে ওয়ের এবল টু রেজিস্ট অ্যান্ড ব্রিং চেঞ্জেস নট জাস্ট এগেনস্ট দেয়ার ওন হাজবেন্ডস বাট অলসো এগেনস্ট দি পঞ্চায়েত এগেনস্ট দি পলিটিক্যাল লিডারশিপ দে ওয়ার এবল টু স্টেজ আ স্ট্রাগল আ সাকসেসফুল স্ট্রাগল হুইচ অ্যাকচুয়ালি লেড টু দিস আইডিয়া দ্যাট কোথাও না কোথাও ল্যান্ডের ওনারশিপ ডাজ গিভ আ লট অফ পাওয়ার টু দ্য উইমেন নাও আমাদের অবস্টেকলসগুলো কি ইউজুয়ালি দ্যাট ইজ কাম আউট ফ্রম দি স্টাডিজ স্টাডিজ ইন্ডিকেট যে আমরা যখন দেখছি হিন্দু সাকসেশন অ্যাক্ট তো সেখানে কিন্তু এগ্রিকালচারাল ল্যান্ড ওনারশিপের ক্ষেত্রে কেউ কোনো কথা বলছে না ইট হ্যাজ বিন কাইন্ড অফ কেপ্ট আসাইড why is this silence nobody knows why are we not talking about we are not very sure about it secondly there is also a strong male resistance in fact amra banglay khub garbo kore boli we talk about land reforms that brought, has brought in a lot of uh, kind of um, changes but if you look at the land reforms and the jokhon operation borga holo ebong title is a ownership jokhon distribution holo very few women actually got it most were men this was number 1 number 2 ekono jokhon ekta recently ekta study hoyeche in the district of bakura and it came out in that study je purush ebong san preference er phole poribar theke tara mohilader ebhabe socialize kore to take or to demand their rights as a bad thing to do so women don't even demand their rights they think ami kintu eta home break korchi and this is this argument is not a very new argument 
constituent assembly when constituent assembly uh, was there or it, uh, they, when this session was happening and there was a discussion about rights one legislator from west bengal he said thik ei bhashay kotha ta bolechilen that do you want to make a code jeta you want to make codes for hindu succession and do you want to make a code jeta te amader ghor gulo bhenge jabe whenever the daughter is demanding rights or you talk of giving away the right or, or or sharing the property as equal then we are all kind of discussing it just take the case it is not very just take the case how many uh, facebook posts are coming about amitabh giving away his property to his daughter he holds so much, he has so much of money but that small home is something that is becoming a big point of discussion so it actually needs to be discussed and secondly arekta jinir jeta hocche cultural construction uh, especially with regard to mera bie hoye gale when women get married they will go away so they will also take away your share of property the father and the brothers they do not really want ebong jokhon eta chasher jomi hoy tokhon kintu eta aro beshi problematized hoye jay ebong shei jonne dekha jacche je bibhinno jaygay bibhinno dhoroner initiatives নেওয়া হয় যেমন যেখানে মহিলারা ইয়ে করা হচ্ছে বা যেখানে যেখানে হয়তো মহিলারা বলছে যে না আমাদের প্রপার্টি লাগে ইফ ইউ গো টু দ্য কোর্টস ইউ উইল ফাইন্ড ইউ ক্যান ডু আ স্টাডি অফ ইয়ার ওন ইট ইজ ভেরি ইন্টারেস্টিং এরিয়া টু রিসার্চ দ্যাট হাউ মেনি কেসেস আর ফাইল্ড এগেনস্ট সিস্টার্স বাই ব্রাদার্স ইন দ্য কোর্টস দি ওয়ের উইচ আর ইজ প্রপার্টি কেস মানে যেখানে বোনকে দেব না শেয়ার সেই জন্যে ভাইয়েরা পরিবারের মধ্যে একটা ডিভিশন হচ্ছে এবং গিয়ে কোর্টে কেস চলছে অ্যান্ড দেয়ার ইজ আ কনফ্লিক্ট গোয়িং অন সো দ্যাটস আ ভেরি ইন্টারেস্টিং পয়েন্ট অফ স্টাডি ওয়ের ইউ ক্যান লুক ইন টু দ্যাট ওয়েদার আমরা যারা বলে থাকি যে উই আর আরবান উই আর উই হ্যাভ অল দ্য রাইটস দের উই অ্যাকচুয়ালি পিন আমাদের মাইন্ডস উই আর এবল টু অ্যাকসেপ্ট দ্যাট অর উই আর স্টিল বিং বাউন্ড বাই দ্যাট অ্যান্ড উই আর স্টিল গোয়িং ইন টু দ্যাট ফেসবুক পোস্ট পোস্ট অ্যান্ড সিইং অমিতাভ তার মেয়েকে কত টাকা দিল এনিওয়ে let's come back to the thing and we also see that uh, there has been a uh, limited control over credit and cash and even if there are uh, agencies like there was uh, uh, there are policies whereby you are given that ownership of land kintu dekha jacche je administrative bias o kintu sangatik thake if you see that very often there is a tendency that uh, i don't know how many of you have seen but i have encountered myself that when i joined my service my um, uh, the person who want who was putting down uh, the name was insisting that you put in your uh, husband's surname not your surname and my argument was that i studied and using the same surname why should i change my surname he is not changing it why should i change but this is something it's a, a khub choto ekta bishoy kintu you will see that everywhere it is there that there is a tendency to always always as very little maybe women have felt it more that when we become doctor we feel liberated because now no longer will call, someone will call us either you are miss or missus but even if uh, men i have never seen <laughs> i always tell my uh, students that uh, whenever you are uh, looking at a man but then this way of saying it also matters how you think when you look at a man how many of men are uh, introduced as doctor mr so and so but women even if the woman is professionally very good doctor miss doctor mrs you have to put in that it, it, it probably it, it's out of the context but then i think it's very much relevant because again what i'm trying to say is administration is not objective it is a part of a social system and social biases do enter your administrative system which does not allow certain bias certain ideas certain constructions to be broken and that is um, a point and, and the simple thing is that people are so very much worried about divorce and the second thing that argument just like rape that women invite rape second thing that comes is ei je mohila ra educated so they are very conscious ejone divorce hocche ejone these are these conflicts hocche ejone you have nuclear families you don't talk about communities but then these are also points that need to be uh, kind of uh, brought up now i will give you a case of a state in india uh, gujarat which 
conducted a study. There was a group organizing for land, the working group on women's land ownership in Gujarat. This was started in June 20, uh, 2002, and uh, they did a study of 12 districts. And in 2014, they came out with a report 22.2% of the land went to women, out of which 48% went to widows and 44% went to uh, people, women, because of government tax benefits. And here lies the interesting catch. 2%, uh, around 5% went to people who were single child, single daughter, so they were allowed to take it. Now, this 44%, khub interesting, acta golpo chole. The, golpo, the story was like that, that if you transfer the ownership of your land to women, then you get tax benefits. So, men started transferring their lands in the name of their women because to get that tax benefit. Now, the officer who was, con who was doing that, he was contacted and he said, it, to, no, it is not the truth. It was just a story that went out and it actually helped women. But did it really help women? No. When it went to the women, the women, there was a documentary and when they went there, they said that they did not have the right to decide ki cultivation hobe, ki sharda hobe, kokhon hobe, everything was decided by their male relatives, whether it was the son or husband or father, it was like this. But this resulted in a land ownership transfer. Why I am bringing it up, I will discuss after this. Now, in West Bengal also, there was a, there was a push for joint titleship, joint titles, husband, wife, a joint title. Kintu, women were not very interested to do so because, again, that thing, now, why I am saying this, why I brought that uh, case of the Sarkari Lab of Gujarat was that uh, our data, if you look at the data, National Family Health Survey, very recently, it uh, says that there has been a spike in land ownership, may there onik bishi, tadir land ownership hoche, among states, jegulo tara bolche, je 50% uh, moto hoje jache, shi jaga gulo dakache, the otherwise human development index, se, it's very low. But uh, with regard to land ownership, that has uh, kind of increased. Now, the uh, question is, why it has increased? And if it has increased, so does that mean that we are in a state of realization? realization there is a shift. And that is something that needs to be noted. Now recently a paper has come up which was actually um, rejecting or rather questioning the observation of uh, United Nations Selector report that came out in 2016 which tried to look into the land rights of women and in that uh, they pointed out that in Nepal it is around 19% women own land. And this paper which came out in 2022, it said that no, it is basically dependent on where women stand in the social network. So women, if the woman is a widow and the matriarch, poribare uni korta, tahole kintu uni land ta pachin. Shuturang, jokon amra erukum calculation kochi, tahon dakhajachi ta land ownership onik high. Kintu, effective rights are khetre kintu, she is still dependent. But when she is behaving herself in relation to her daughter, but daughter-in-law, tar jokon relationship ta dakha jachche, tokon kintu, it is very much related to the earlier thing that uh, Dr. Joshi just now pointed out. The way we construct, that is the emulation. Emulation hoche, yakjon masculine hishebe, male hishebe, she uh, but not the mother in that sense of the term mohila hishebe noy ekjon je barir korta hishebe she je model ta dekhe eshe she model ta kei tini kintu emulate korche and she is also suppressing the voices of her own daughters ta nijer mayor against e she kintu tokhon tar voice ta ke suppress kore dicche so they are never uh, what you would say they uh, they are never together there is always a, again, a 
কাইন্ড অফ আ ব্রেক মানে যেই সিস্টারহুড হতে পারত অ্যালায়েন্স হতে পারত সেই অ্যালায়েন্সটা কিন্তু হচ্ছে না যার ফলে এগেন উই আর কামিং ব্যাক টু দ্য সেম পয়েন্ট বেয়ার উইথ স্টার্টেড উইথ সো দিস স্টোরিজ উইচ উই ট্রাই টু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড উই ট্রাই টু লুক অ্যাট দিস স্মল স্টোরিজ অ্যাকচুয়ালি কি ওয়াজ আ রিফ্লেকশন অফ দ্যাট হোয়াট or what are the voices or how these voices are also kind of captured by various intersectionalities ebong kalke jeta bar bar uthe aschilo je there are a lot of uh, different voices which are maybe they are women but then there are so many intersections jeta kintu ekta opor ke kete jacche so it is not that there exists a sisterhood but rather there may be multiple positions and this complicates and problematizes the whole issue and that leads us to look into the issues from our own understanding and not taking because e je data discrepancy data gulo kintu ek ekta data set ek ek rokom if you look at agricultural land survey data so it gives a different kind of an observation jekhane dekhacche land ownership onek kom similarly if you look at the nfhs survey data it gives a different idea just like in the first presentation মানে আমার অ্যাটেন্ডিং অ্যাটেন্ড করার ডক্টর জোশী শি ইজ শোড অ্যা প্যারাডক্স বিটুইন দি জেন্ডার ইকুয়ালিটি ইন্ডেক্স অ্যান্ড দি সোশ্যাল নর্মস জেন্ডার সোশ্যাল নর্মস সেখানে কিন্তু ইস ইটস ইটস এ কাইন্ড অফ এক জায়গায় যেখানে মহিলারা পার্টিসিপেট করছে অ্যান্ড উই আর সিইং দ্যাট দে আর দে আর ভিজিবিলিটি অ্যাজ ওয়ার্ক ফোর্স অ্যাট দ্য সেম টাইম মেন ইউ লুক ব্যাক ইউ সি দ্যাট দে আর নট ইফেক্টিভলি এবল টু কন্ট্রোল দেয়ার ইনকাম অ্যান্ড ইট ইউজ ইটস জাস্ট দ্য সেম and there are lot of obligations that again i would uh, that which i like very much yesterday uh, professor manans that is feminist obligations that there are certain obligations that are put just like one of the obligation is good daughters never demand a share of the father's property thank you uh thank you uh professor ranjita chakraborty for raising the very very significant issues particularly in the context of south asian region because we know it very well the land is not is just a land it is uh, it is a uh, you know the first element of uh, you know the mode of production so it is completely associated with different power structure and she actually has illustrated it so very well so it is uh, even i can add in con- in the context of bangladesh that even they are very rich and very affluent and educated family in bangladesh i know ma- in many uh, they are not willing to you know transfer their land rights to their you know the female members sisters or uh, the wives and etc and the we are arguing that in bangladesh that if the you know inheritance law will not change it, the men and women are not getting equal rights and she is using a word very important thing the effective rights we have uh, land on my name but whether we can actually uh, effectively use it or not so it not only that you can see it in the agriculture production system the how women are marginalized so we know that in 1970 the easter boast of hamilton done a uh you know the huge research in three continent and she actually figured it out that women are very much in agriculture but they are never ever recognized as a you know labor force and interestingly in bangladesh in uh, 1984 suddenly it's shown that the it is a highest number of you know the uh, almost the 60 or 70 uh percent women are in the labor agri labor force but uh, in the uh, there and then the you know researcher is very you know surprised that why it is happened hotat kore eto beshi shongkha narira emon ki utpadan byabosthar poriborton holo je taderke utpadane dekha jacche definition ta change hoyeche shekhane bola hoyeche je post harvesting e kaaj ta hoy shekhane narike krishok hisebe বলা হতো না ভাবা হতো না যেই মাত্র সংজ্ঞাটা পরিবর্তন হয়েছে সেখানেই দেখা যাচ্ছে যে নারীর অবস্থান তো সেই বিষয়গুলো বাংলাদেশের ক্ষেত্রে যেমন একই রকম যেটা উনি এখানে তুললেন অ্যাক্রস দ্য ক্লাস ফ্রম এগ্রিকালচার টু দ্য ইউ নো দ্য ইন দ্য এডুকেটেড ফ্যামিলি ল্যান্ড ইজ ভেরি ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট বিকজ উইদাউট দ্য রিসোর্সেস উইমেন ক্যান নট অ্যাকচুয়ালি অ্যাডভান্স দ্যাম সেলস নট বিং এ এন্টারপ্রেনর অর নট বিং এ ইউ নো লিভ দেয়ার ওন লাইফ ইন্ডিপেন্ডেন্টলি সো থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ সো রেজ দিস ইস্যুস অ্যান্ড লেট আস থিঙ্ক অ্যাবাউট দ্যাট হাউ ক্যান ইউ অ্যাকচুয়ালি চেঞ্জ দ্য সিচুয়েশন ইন ফিউচার 
Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I uh, would very humbly request the house if there are observations. So we have, yes, we are coming. You raised your hand. We are coming to you. Professor Ma. Just an observation to just compliment whatever Professor Chakraborty has talked about. Actually, basically, when we talk about land, uh, we think in terms of two types of land. One is what the agricultural land that she has been talking about, and the other is the land or the house or the property. So two things are related. One is the inheritance rights and property rights, and on the other hand, it is the agricultural land. Now, agricultural land becomes prominent because right from the start, when we think of an agrarian society, it has been agriculture pro. And therefore, the kinship and the family structure and the patrilineal structure that we have actually has a very, very important impact on holding land. Because if you own land, you have the power, you have the wealth. So that is where actually it's a sociological point that that is from where the the uh, the, the thought of kingship kinship actually comes, and that is why the land has to be passed on to the son and their sons and so on, and if it has to be divided, it has to be divided within the family structure. That means amongst the brothers and everybody, but not to the daughters who are married to another clan, and that is where the conflict arose. So that is where the division, when we have the Hindu, Hindu Succession Act, the, it was completely silent about agricultural land because agricultural land had a totally patriarchal view or a patrilineal structure which could not be disturbed. And even though women were working as family labor and which late, much, much later in the 1980s could be recognized as economically productive work because it, I was talking about the supply chain or the value addition yesterday. This is where actually women's work gives value addition to the product which is ultimately sold by a male. The earnings do not come to the woman, but she's putting her in her value. So all these aspects come, uh, um, even though we need, we discuss it every time, but actually the solution, I don't know where it uh, lies, because agricultural land, in fact, after the, uh, what do you say, uh, the Operation Barga in case of West Bengal, and uh, there has been, has been talk that why women were not given the patta, the patta of the land. And in the 1980s or 1990s, I remember there was a very good article by Jayati Gupta in EPW where she says that many women were interviewed throughout West Bengal and they had said that why don't you get take joint patta because like at least you'll have to have a stake or a, you can claim a part of the land that is being, that you are sowing also, uh, sowing the seeds and you are harvesting and doing everything, but at the same time you do not claim, uh, cannot claim ownership. Later on, when some joint pattas were actually distributed, but it was finally stopped because women themselves did not want it. Because not for not for the reason that well my husband is owning it so it's mine not not because of that but because it was in the 80s and 90s they realized that in spite of wife battering in spite of everything they have to stay there because they have a joint patta so they are not free to leave that now even though it is a very rare phenomenon that a uh, that a rural woman is thinking of a divorce and going away but at least they put a claim saying that we do not want a joint patta. If it is an individual patta only, only I will take it. And that was a very big step for the women in the rural Bengal area. And one more thing I just wanted to add out here, even this, though it is related to owning a land, as I said, that land uh, provides credit worthy worthiness because it is an economic resource. And if you have the economic resource, then you have uh, can get loans and you can further have your own irrigation system and all that. And there's an interesting part, interesting, uh, no, I can't say story, it's factual because uh, we were doing, in fact, Deepa, myself, we were all doing this project, international project, where we had to, uh, Jalpaiguri area was one of the field areas and we had uh, 
and this was about uh, admi accelerated development through minor irrigation where a minor irrigation project was being funded by dfid and it was throughout west bengal and jalpaiguri was one of the districts which was chosen and we had gone there to find out about the water users association because many farmers had to come together to form this water users association and surprisingly what we found was that the this water users association was dysfunctional in case of this district so we we questioned everybody but they could not give a proper answer then we went to the government the line departments and we asked that what was the matter because the money was coming flowing in and the work is not starting and after some time the money is going to go back then they said that it was very interesting that the dfid which was designed sitting in england or wherever the the structure of the admi project it had the uh, concept that the water users association where 70% will be water the uh, water user uh, users association uh, the association will be formed by 70% of the farmers who will be males who will be owning the land and 30% will be females who will be owning the land and in jalpaiguri they couldn't find any female who owned the land and therefore water users association could not be formed and therefore the money was lying there and so what the, what in fact the fid came forward again and they said okay they we can do something else with this you can have a sub committee where the wives of the husbands who actually owned the land you came from the sub committee of course they did not have any voice and that is how they showed and they got the money so when you ask them that whose land is it they say it's my land but when you tell them do you have it in paper then they don't know what is this paper no that is the most interesting part and in case of inheritance rights also even though we say that the siblings can share the property of the parents of the father and everything but there is there are two aspects to it one is the daya bhaga and the mitakshara so i even if you gain it even if you are widow and you gain, gain the property or inherit the property you cannot sell it that is where the decision making lies you cannot do anything with the property which you have inherited from the family from your husband or your father in law or anything so these are the subtle discriminations where women are actually sidelined from this issue yesterday i was talking about gender as an analytical category we are talking about class and caste where who being the analytical category out here landed gentry becomes the higher class and the and the landless become the becomes the lower class and it also depends upon like tribal land division or you have scheduled castes who are owning lands and all that but never ever, ever anywhere do we find gender as a category when we talk about land so this is very important it was only in the late 80 uh, 1980s and 1990s that this land rights or property rights issue actually came up that we need to think or you need to take gender as an analytical category when we talk about the land rights thank you uh, i think i am audible uh, uh, just adding to ma'am uh, yes uh, that is there and another thing that is very risky what i was saying in the beginning is a paper release very recently with relation to g20 where uh, it has been pointed out that um, basically after the success of group farming ebong ekhane kintu uttorbongo ache uttorbongo bihar ebong kichu rajyo ache jekhane group farming ebong eta ekta khub interesting proposition ei karone that group farming has been found to be very very successful and profitable economically profitable in this case you are not allowing the person to own the land but you make the person work in it and now this is the model that is being go that is going to come up like creating farming cooperatives now this is to what extent it is going to help women is it going to give the kind of support or the empowerment that it was that we would see the case of amul the milk cooperatives where women gained a lot or are we going to have a situation jeta ami ei jonne pradan ta use korlam je pradan er case kintu dekhache je the moment it was found to be efficiently used then people jumped in and then they started increasing the rates and it became very unequal system to thik erokomi ekta system er dike kintu promote 
there is a promotion or rather there is uh, there is a celebration that this is a very good proposal we should go for group farming but at the same time when you are using this uh, self help group shornibhor goshti ke babohar kara hocche for this group farming but then you are not talking about the ownership and user rights are also very very unequal user rights where women do not have the bargaining power so here we need to rather also as if uh, since you are young people and you are also researchers and also looking at the things i say you need to question these points that uh, uh, these policies or these documents they come up and if they are not critically looked into then what will happen a lot of freedom will go away and new problems would arise uh, which you be it would be very difficult and maybe many voices would remain against side so uh, the purpose of bringing this up was also because jajal is uh, uh, at a rural hinterland and since you uh, students are uh, uh, there who are belonging to this region so my objective was to also make this kind of questions come up in the minds of the students who question so that was the purpose of the paper thank you thank you ma'am thank you professor mannan and professor chakraborty for a very wonderful session and a very different uh, thing when we talk about inheritance and um, though it's not related to land but then i would like to say that there is also another thing uh, just a, just a passing mention i will not take much long just uh, 30 seconds that is about the jewelry so i have also heard that that meke to biye te goyna diye diyechi ar land keno debo erom dhoroner kotha ami shunechi to me to biye te goyna peyeche jewelry peyeche that person has got jewelry so why should she again claim inheritance e sob dhoroner jinishpatro anyway so we move on uh, with our next talk and i very humbly invite professor dr nidhar sarkar for his presentation and I also invite Professor Dr. Himadri Roy to kindly be the chairperson of the session. So I invite you on stage, Professor Roy, Professor Shorkar. Professor Shorkar has a presentation, online presentation. आ चुके तुम्हें देखो ये online बोल ची PPT आ चुके एक तो देखो गोविंदो I think uh, I think this is very interesting. We start uh, this session on a very interesting note, and which I think is uh, visible to everyone because henceforth we have got three lectures. and uh, the three lectures will be delivered by uh, professors who are men and who are talking on our issues but himadri roy sir would perhaps redefine what we all mean exactly by men but still with due regards i think this is uh, the part where we actually start talking because since yesterday uh, many of the professors professor pillai professor Uh, mukherjee all, all of them had said that men should come in and listen boys should come in and listen because otherwise this entire exercise falls flat so i think this is a very very uh, important point a turning point going no further i would like to introduce professor dr nichar sarkar with whom i have had the honor of working for more than two decades and he has always been a feminist he has always thought read and he has written about our lives our thoughts and um, our issues for that matter he is widely published he has um, uh, uh, books on 
um, performance studies and on uh, he has published in very established journals like post-colonial interventions. So he has asked me not to say any further. He needs no introduction. End of the day, I would just like to say that the topic that he has chosen today, abject as a site of resistance in Koshik Ganguly's or Thangini and Shunno Ebuke, I think uh, we should all be very thankful to him for choosing such a important site, an important site, the body, again, into discussion. So I hand over my microphone to Professor Dr. Himadri Roy, Director SOGDS, IGNU New Delhi, to chair the session. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, without wasting much time, I would uh, request Professor Sarkar to start his presentation because we are running out of time mostly. Thank you. Sure, sir. Thank you. Professor Roy, uh, first of all, the most important part, what I often forget, and you won't forgive me for that, acknowledgement part. Thanks to ICSSR sponsorship, thanks to Chachol College Economics Department, uh, thanks to Center for Women's Studies, IQSC, Raigon Universities, and two very uh, dynamic and wonderful ladies who have made this possible, uh, pull things together. Uh, I have seen them how, how relentlessly they have toiled over the past few weeks, past few months under the able mentorship of my one of my favorite pieces. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so I think acknowledgement part is over. Uh, my dear scholars and students are here also present uh, that I, I must say that uh, it's always a pleasure. But because when I say that it matters how well you articulate, they will test me. They will take my test. Sir, how well you articulate. Anyway, let me come back to uh, the title of the topic. Okay. So, uh, since it is a cinema, uh, recently I have had uh, a very uh, energetic experience of, I mean, I have had a lot of performance in my research area. So, I do love performing a beat also here when I am on the stage. Anyway, let me uh, go back to the memory. Uh, recently, uh, I was in the company of many great filmmakers in Kolkata Nondon, uh, thanks to my dear esteemed colleague, Professor Pinaki Roy, a long month long, a month long course uh, on film studies, etc. So uh, the people ask me what you are doing here. So I have an answer today. Because they are documentary filmmakers or short filmmakers, most of the participants there, they ask me, sir, why are you here? Today I have the answer why I am here. I love reading cinematic texts like any other cultural text. We all very easily understand that. That a cinematic text is by default a cultural text. So when I say I take up a cinematic text, I say that I am going for a cultural analysis of it. And Shangyukta has pointed out in the way of introduction that my concern is body. But I don't inhabit that body. Then there is a problematic. So how much do I really know about the body and its problematics? That uh, came through uh, my daily family experiences also. Uh, there will be some personal stories, therefore I avoid uh, uh, pulling them up. So let them go behind. Let me uh, just give you who are not regular Bengali movie watchers or from other provinces of this uh, uh, country or outside country. Koshik Ganguly has made a very strong name for himself for working over the last uh, two decades or more than that. Uh, Ganguly is a filmmaker and a script writer also. So he is doing uh, directorial part. He is doing uh, the script right, writer's part. So a writerly involvement and a directorial involvement, that is the twofold kind of uh, involvement or engagement with which Ganguly has kept his audience uh, 
so captivated over the past uh, two decades or little more than that. Uh, here I take up two cinemas, two cin or two cinematic texts. Sometimes I alternately we call them cinematic texts. One is Shunno uh, Ebuke. If I go uh, chronologically, then Shunno Ebuke was released in 2005, and Orthangini, a very recent film, in May or June. Uh, I had a uh, rare opportunity to watch it uh, non at Nondon, and there I decided how these two cinemas can be connected to the key theme and the concept that this seminar is attempting to proffer, how they can be related. I was thinking of that. So I struck upon, uh, I, 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 I experimented with various titles because I am in love with title making. Though sometimes I find that I am a very bad title maker. So it has again, uh, it has again come back to me that this title somewhat uh, somewhat should uh, sum up my argument abject as a site of resistance those who are from social science background they may know or may not know there is no problem french philosopher julia krishteva uh, introduces the term abject an essay on abjection this is the subtitle then the main title is Power of Horror, an essay on abjection. So, Krishtevan uh, structure, Achha, agai bole ni hai, ami khoma prarthi, bangla tehi bol chiyeta. Kaushik Gangolir bangla chobi dhekhano jo ami shob European thinker ter kotha bolbo hai. Tar jonno, amar ke shamne ebong pechone, jato ta para jaya tiroshkar kora jete pare. You are open to do any kind of uh, scathing criticism, but please, at present, I will be engaging mostly with some of the very powerful theoretical insights by very important French philosophers, Anglo-American philosophers like Julia Krishteva, Adrian Rich, or uh, Judith Butler sometimes. Kintu just theory will I will touch upon them. Just, uh, oh, first of all, abject. So this abject is something that is a bodily reality. But that is that produces a revolting, something that I want to expel. So there are certain things that I want to expel. junior student So what I uh, want to say, abject is something that is you are expelling from. So not a, here, not necessarily expelling from your body, expelling from your or ejecting from your cultural realities. So there are certain realities or certain physiological, bodily realities, gynecological, serious gynecological issues that you want to drive out of your cultural normative framework or concept. These two films, one dealing with Mishunnoye Bukhe Thang Shudu Korchi Kana Namar Clipping Tao Shepa Bearing Chikada Hachi Jekhane a group of artists are visiting Khajuraho Shekhan Kar Sculpture and even Shaygulo during their tour they talk a lot about the portrayal of women's body there they think that these bodies have been magnified out of proportion to prove that they are erotically erotically highly attractive erotically highly desirable and they are not natural is it a natural sorry, is it a natural feminine body that is portrayed by the great artists at khajuraho this is the point of uh, this is the point at the outset and eventually shoumitra a brilliant painter marries tista they get in love they come into touch with each other but uh, and shoumitra is the painter and artist of feminine bodies. So, he is deeply obsessed with the physical realities and the feminine perfection of that body. But ultimately, after the, anyway, sorry, uh, at, at the occasion of the night of their marriage, uh, he is revolted finding that Tista is flat chested or, or almost uh, she, she is 
really physically so unattractive. Immediately, Shomitra gets so deeply, he wants just runs out of the room and he declares that he has been cheated and betrayed because it was never. Tista was forced to use some paddings to look attractive and a normal breasted female figure. So that led to their separation, though eventually it proves otherwise she point a but this is the uh, triggering point where the problem starts, where an artist's imagination or idealization of a feminine figure is cl uh, clashes with or clashes against the real wife's physical beauty or the experience of unveiling his own wife and finding much to his repulsion the reality of a woman without having no breast almost. This is the Shunno e buke. You all know Nojrul Islam song Shunno e buke paki mor ay phire ay. So Shunno e buke is a snatch of that song from Kaji Nojrul Islam. So uh, the title, uh, the subtitle is very interesting, Empty Canvas. Gangoli has deliberately chosen canvas is portrait and the painter. So empty canvas, this is the emptiness. So I am calling that and then Orthangini, or Orthangini is uh, a middle class family story where then here again come back the story of separation because uh, Shobha, the protagonist, here she cannot bear a child to the family and after 17 years they are separated not because of this uh, so-called unproductiveness or failure to reproduce. Though eventually it is found that no, Shubhra is not responsible for that. Responsibility lies on the shoulder of her own husband who is a professor who, which is played by Koushik Gangoli. Again the same pair returns. Rationally, you may call it that Koushik Gangoli, Churni, uh, sorry, Koushik Shen and Churni Gangoli pair comes back in both these films. It is 2023 films, uh, 2023, so abject as a site of resistance. But I am calling this normative framework and what the duto body portion are these biological realities, how to overcome this determinism. When I call it a site of resistance, then does my does my unattractive unreproductive infertile body offer some resistance then resistance to what next slide yes just for uh, viewing it's it's for viewers arthangini and shunnoe buke okay uh, then the re resistance to what the resistance is to offer a resistance to the cultural norms and the biological realities. The cultural norms are set by and dictated by, by heteronormative and patriarchal assumptions. So we have certain assumptions about the perfect feminine body, ideal feminine body, functionally ideal body, but the reality and the experience, the cinema, uh, as a uh, scriptwriter, Gangoli challenges those uh, those age-old assumptions through this cinematic text. Next slide. Let me go over it, uh, because we have to. Uh, no, no. The previous one, the place of uh, the place. I yes, the place of abject is where meaning collapses. The places where I'm not. Oh, it must be radically excluded from the place of living subject, propelled away from the body. It, it must be propelled away from the body and deposited on the other side of the imaginary border. So it has been placed on the other side of the imaginary border. Next one. Okay. This is my starting point also. Theoretically, I am uh, heavily engaged because these are filmic texts and I will try to share some filmic moment and clippings with you to give you the uh, theoretical underpinning is very important, but this is not uh, a paper, scholarly paper. Uh, my concentration will be on the cinematic experience. Women are somehow more biological, more corporeal, more natural than men. This more 
in every uh, single part is very important because it is italicized. So <laughs> men are not that biological, men are not that corporeal and men more natural. And the next one you can read on your own in our culture, in no part of a human's body is left untouched, unaltered from head to toe. Dawkins is again a feminist thinker. They all are feminist thinker. Okay, I can come back to this point. So please pass over to the next slide. Well, now, another important thinker, Naomi Wolf. I heard uh, someone from South India yesterday evening. She was mentioning Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf. That was a very good presentation also about two Malayalam movies that I enjoyed. I chaired the session. So, Wolf is saying beauty is the last best belief system that keeps male dominance intact. Because we never love a black, ugly, uh, uh, too slim, too fat woman. Therefore, beauty is the last best belief system. It is the best belief system also. So, Ganguly, especially in the 2000. Uh, the film, the early film in Shunno Ebuke is really underlining this very fact that beauty is the last and best belief system that the more beautiful your wife is, the more dominant you become. The Naomi Wolf is pressing another very challenging point here. Why I connect these two films? It's not arbitrary. There is a very clear connection between them. How, how, how and where I find the justification? Naomi Wolf is saying that a beautiful lady must give birth to a very beautiful child also. Beautiful mother, beautiful child. So this is very simple reaction. So your wife is not beautiful. Your child is not necessarily beautiful. So this is myth. This is beauty myth. I am not saying this. This is long established beauty myth which she wants to deconstruct through this extremely uh, popular uh, feminist text. I am just mentioning or touching upon this feminist text because I think it is better to go to the cinemas. Please next slide. Well, we will watch the cinema very soon but before that one essay, Breasted Experience, The Look and the Feel. It is a wonderful essay. You can read online the breasted experience, breasted experience, the look and the feel. So I raise the question, can we call it a cinematic rendition of breasted experience, the look and the feel? Marian Young is saying what matters is the look of them, how they measure up before the normalizing gaze. Again, the gaze is normalizing. They will find it interesting. So this is the normalization of the process. If you are not possessing a normal body, then you are pathological invariably. So Shunno Ebuker Tistao Javon pathological, Temni Orthangini Shupra Shaman pathological. Karun Akjon Mote Shundorinon, male normative that biological reality. Te, are Shubha Hoche Tototai unproductive Karutri Shantare John Modana. Judiot are husbanded John Modana. That will be eventually uh, better among students there Bolboje to abstract uh, Judidine Shishe Dekte Pare. Anyway, let us start with the cinema. Do a minute for a cinema Gulu Amra Deki. Cinema Damia Onkoch, can we go? Okay, uh, I, I cannot really, uh, let, let me find out if they can short it out, otherwise I will have to uh, do without uh, running the cinema. Here we will find, a clipping to the clip, which is our year. Every year we do it, but we always do it. Who is We can use our own laptop, no? Okay. Okay, let, let me uh, come back to the reality of the situation here. The husband is quite repealed. Okay. Okay. No, no. Just clippings. Two, three minutes clippings. 
relevant portion of this. No, no. Ah, this one, this one. Manushir, Shuri is fascinating. Hmm. After that, you protect the Shuri, protect the Shuri, that's all. What is it? I'm here, I'm here. Shuri, right? Yeah. Yeah. I said, a size it called that. Okay, uh, let, let me, uh, before they can manage it, uh, let me go to the, uh, let me go to another very beautiful experience by Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord herself, uh, great feminist thinker and Afro-American uh, writer and she's, uh, she was forced to uh, uh, removal of one breast. So she narrates the experience of the single breasted woman. What they will do and she refused to go for any kind of replacement or synthetic arrangements. So uh, I have one very important uh, observation from or comment from Lord. When normal means the right color, she is talking all about the breast. Where normal means the right color, shape, size or number of breasts, a woman's perception of her own body and the strengths that come from perceptions are discouraged, trivialized and ignored. So when it comes to the color, shape and size and number, the strength, come, the strength that come from the perceptions are discouraged, trivialized and ignored. So there is a trivialization after that cancerous operation and Lord was very uh, strongly against, revolted against even that and she thought that uh, that's these single breasted ladies they will form a new, uh, new fight of resistance. So again what I am saying that single breasted or flat chested these are so uh, some of the common uh, biological issues. Right from here.
সব বলতাম কিছুটা অস্বস্তি আর কিছুটা মানে সবকিছু এমন তাড়াতাড়ি হয়ে গেল যে ছোট থেকেই এরকম আমার কিন্তু এর তো আমার দোষ না এর তো আমার কোন হাত নেই অথচ তোমার ওই জায়গাটা যে ভালো না খারাপ সেটা তুমি আমাকে কারণ আমি শুধু ওই জায়গাটা নই আমি 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 পুরোটা আমি তাই তোমার ও জায়গাটা আগলি what she is saying but you said i was beautiful so this ugly this abject returns so my title is again justified i never leave any ground without justifying my title i fight a lot over it i am conscious what phrases i am using and what terms i have chosen to explain my argument anyway let me what matters is the look of them ja bollen tista sob ek kotha no one can challenge how they measure up before the normalizing gaze so purush 
तंत्र तो पुरुष चोख दिए जो देखे ता जो विश्लेषण कर सौंदर्य के सौंदर्य के संज्ञायित तरा करते चाय समय चूर्णी गांगुली हेल्दी चाइल्ड हजबैंड सब एक्सेप्ट कर So again, we find that what seemed to be very useless part of Tista now uh, can be proved, or is proved as very uh, effective, and it can nourish a little child also. So the breast is the not only ful fulfilling the uh, erotic desire, but also for uh the health of a newborn baby so here lies the importance not the size not the color not the number all these things may be uh, excluded just now pankaj i think we should go now we should go over to arthangini eta ke ki amra oh okay okay uh, this part is very important okay. just one and half minute run korbe ha karon arthangini ta baki royeche ekono kotha noy This is a private problem. Studio the log dekhi ni. Amar body diagram ekhi. Bojhan aur kono door karte lagi. Tarthe ke ek din shakul ke ashe to daako na. Pushak kuri dadi puri. Shabai dekhi porok kuri bojhe sak. Tomar na power kosto to. तैरी Very sorry again to stop here uh, because Pankaj, you should go over to the next film. Uh, Shobai, uh, I, I think there is enough food of thought. Food for thought. Shobar kide paache, but there is a lot of food for thought here also. Next film, that ne ek tu bolbo. 
just very briefly uh, next film ta jodi do ekta clipping relevant dekha jay shekhaneo problematic actai then there is another problem je shobha jini 17 bochhor ekjon adhyapok ke biye korechen she suffers all of a sudden it, it, it is a matter of open discussion that she, she is not a mother or she cannot bring a child but the problem actually medically lies it is testified that the medically it is her husband okay can we run can we run okay right now age dekhe di pore kotha cinema dekhtei hoy ar ki we idly talk it is kachari shobar bhalo lage na thik ache eshob acha tori na to jit kisher bolto bhalo kothao theke ekta medical checkup to tai korabi ba असुविधा थे चेक कर समस्त सामाजिक रेसपन्सिबिलिटी बुप्रा सन्तान शेष दाता तो जीतते Uh, again, we can, we can stop here. We, ha we have learned what is the reality. She is leaving the home uh, because again, it's fine that everything is thrust upon, or the expression is entirely with the wife. Uh, so uh, she leaves open the chance for her husband to remarry. Oh well, a kind of relevant quotation. I will ask. I will request everyone's attention. Simon the Beauvoir's uh, The Second Sex, five hundred one. so it again proves why bova was so much correct about that this is the blessing this is what you are born for bachcha lana hai aapko kisi bhi kimat par so this is the womanhood that we glorify that we celebrate ha to mane enthusiastically amra onek bole phi ami u heteronormative and patriarchal domination ma'am bolle na sokal bela je trapping mane trapped amra ki entrap मन 
This much of the cinema experience. Last line, we last uh, this. It about concluding your remark. I mean, the it has been uh, summed up by great, another great feminist thinker, Elizabeth Gross. In a lecture, rewriting the female body as a positivity rather than as a lack. It I explained what you know, classroom for a by the discussion with the body. We are racing, to, we should rest towards the lunch hour. Uh, it I was an object as a site of resistance. Can I mean, Resistance money is a positivity, it's not a lack. Aristotle, Jokon Bolishan, women are women for certain lack of qualities, are Shekanteke, a Lacanian lack. Darsh Jotu Darshuni, John Machin, Shawaikano, Nari Bidish, the Shuku, and Sheskolan, Shuka Pujbar, you look at a Shawai again. Anyway, Tara Bishon, Tade, the Ramra enriched to take it to Nari Bidish, fundamental weapon, Kyotani Amra Bashir Kothabuna. So rather than as a lack. So that is the ending. It sums up my argument, I think. Thank you for all your patience and uh, very attentive listening. Uh, sir, now, my chairperson. Over to sir. Imadri, sir. Thank you, Professor Shorta. This was uh, intensely invigorating presentation, I would say, because Thank everyone you, was keen to see how this, what you have said is portrayed or represented in the films or the screenings that you have shown. It's not only about the body that is familial experiences that it undergoes or erotic gaze that has been thrown by the masculine, um, what do you say, masculinity over here in the society, but also a certain, certain kind of determinism that you have talked about, also a cultural reality that you have been discussing. Uh, actually, what Mar Marion Young has talked about and Marjorie Garber also deals with it, that emptiness of body begins from the other gaze, then from inside, because the inside gaze is still strong and it will always be that. And where Butler, Christopher, Rich, you pointed them that they do not expel their own body and their own existence. I think that you have clubbed it very well. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sharkar, for bringing a lots of things which I wanted to say, but uh, you've already talked about it, so I won't go farther than that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, audiences who have listened so patiently and heard him and talked about about it uh, and I'm sorry the, this is a plenary session no questions nothing uh, let the lunch be for questionings and everything because there are I think two more panels uh, plenary speaking uh, and so we uh, conclude this session here okay thank you very much again continue to think please not talk or discuss so stay here ghar jake bhi so stay here ab log kahi mat jaiye आप लोग कहीं मत जाइए हम लोग तो कहीं नहीं रहेंगे भाई वी आर कल्चरल थिंकर्स वी हैव टू मोर टॉक्स एंड वी हैव देम नाउ मैम वी शैल ब्रेक फॉर लंच आफ्टर द टॉक्स ओके बिकॉज़ दैट इज द वे आई थिंक दैट वुड बी कन्वीनिएंट बिकॉज़ पीपल विल बी ट्रैवलिंग बैक एंड वी रियली वांट टू लिसन सो अ वेरी वेरी हंबल ओके मैम uh, I'm just calling. Please, someone, please call Tulika Di for a. Yeah, please, please. No, no, ma'am, please, please, just. Uh, very uh, humbly, I would request Professor Sharkar not to get down from the stage and to just change places with Professor Himadri Roy. But somehow I have this thing that the chair is on this side and the presenter is on that side, which is again uh, nothing normal, but. Uh, just, uh, you know, we are used to that somehow. It doesn't work, actually, because absolutely. Anyway, um, really, I am still not out of the days, DAZE and DAYS both. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sharkar and Professor Roy, for that session. And I now request.
Professor Nija Sharkar to act as the chairperson of the session. And our speaker right now is Professor Dr. Himadri Roy. So we'll just take one minute, don't go away, uh, to just get a few things in order and we shall start this session. Just one minute and my time starts now. Okay. Yes. Yes. I uh, very humbly take the honor of introducing Professor Dr. Himadri Roy. Professor Roy is the director, Center for, um, I'm sorry, School of Gender and Development Studies, SOGDS, IGNU, Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi. And uh, he has um, also been a professor at that, at the same school. And um, apart from academics, he is a novelist. He has written two books and uh, I, I shall go in the, you know, in, the, in the process of introducing him, sir, him, but at the same time, I would like to say that I'm very proud that Professor Roy could make it here in person because he is actually a person who was born in North Bengal, brought up in North Bengal in Shiliguri, my own hometown, and he writes about North Bengal, and he writes about the same-sex experiences in his novels. He's a gay novelist, and um, and apart from that, he has also published a lot of work. I, I would like to name uh, the names of his book. I would like to say La Amour of Siliguri, Tales of Hope Chasers, and Travels of Entrapment. So he has written three books till now, and the fourth one he is writing, which um, I will not reveal. Um, one more important thing about him is that he's also an activist. His, uh, his talks, his deli uh, deliberations, all over, whenever I have been able to watch it, has uh, been on his lived experience as well. Because I am I'm so proud that when we talk about voices and experiences, uh, he shall talk about the voices, experiences, and the entire concept. So I now please hand over the mic to the chairperson of this session, Professor Nijhar Sharkar. So uh, introduction part is over. We are eagerly waiting for the discussion. Professor Roy has visited our university previously. Uh, what is this battle against heteronormative <laughs> codes and formulations? And what is this cultural battle like? Please. Uh, thank you, Professor Sharkar. Uh, thank you, Professor Sharkar. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, for introducing me. But I will rectify there. I'm not a gay novelist. I'm a novelist who writes on gay men. Now, the fact is very important over here. When you introduce yourself, how do you introduce? You introduce your identity in various forms. Your name may be the first identity, but if you carry, if you say your surname along with it, that becomes your family identity. Now, in a place where we are sitting, it's Chachol, right? All of you have entered the place. Have you ever noticed the buildings that you have entered? Probably the galore, uh, the architecture you have seen. But Shamne Jakta Pukura Chhe, Shateko Lakho Kore Chho. That's a colonial structure. That's a structure that divides the line from the common to the higher scales. Intersectionality Oi Pukutta. Ota Bishon important Aama Dher Jonno Ehi Khani, Karun Aamra Jai Dhukbo Pukutta Pair Hoye, Aamra Dekbo Shoi Shabir Akta Angon. That is the school. That is the gaze that most of us avoid. Or maybe the masculine people or the masculine gaze looks very inquisitively over there. But Tarpore Jeta Ache, Sheta Ache Kanune Dorja, Sheta Tomaka Artke Debe. Jovaner Kathamote Parakar Age, Kanunke Hateni Egotehabe. 
that's why the court is between the school and the college and the college is also very interesting the entry of the college is just a gate nothing is visible from outside as you enter the gate you see the entire college which is almost an antur mahal of knowledge there it begins now i will be talking about mental hygiene in such places a small place chachol where mental hygiene may be a scientific term of preservation and promotion of mental health but actually are we preventing or promoting what we are doing we are setting boundaries of normativity eto kon amra hetero normative er kotha kalke theke shune jacchi continuously but i would not use the word called heteronormative i would rather use the word hetero patriarchy which is heteroarchy now over here normativity er kotha amra onek shunechi fuko shes vik amra shobar kotha bole jai eker por ek there are many other philosophers theorists who have been talking right now you have seen grose's comments you have seen arian uh, young's marian young er comment gulo kintu tar sathe amra ekta shobshomoy bhule jai je if men do it they are permitted and that's normative if women do it they are non normative and therefore men who accept those women who does it becomes non normative or feminist in qua sense the discourse then begins the discourse of heteroarchy begins there it is not only about the performativity that men and women is doing in this normative things covid jokhon hoyechilo shobai amra barite bondho shobai kaj be বেছে নিয়েছি কে কি করতে হবে ভেরি ইন্টারেস্টিংলি দেয়ার আর দ্য ডিভিশনস অফ ক্লাসেস অ্যান্ড টেকনো নলেজ টেকনোলজিক্যাল নলেজ কামস ইন টু ফোর ফ্রান্ট তখন দেখা গেছে আমরা আর্ধেকে কিন্তু টেকনো স্যাভি নই আমরা বুঝতে পারছি যে আমাদের কোথায় উইকনেসেসগুলো রয়েছে মেন হেল্পিং অ্যাট হাউস হোল্ড ওয়ার্ক ইন কোভিড টাইমস ইজ ভেরি নর্মাল দেন আর দে বিকামিং ফ্যামিলি are they changing are they changing their concepts are they changing their notions in rurban probably it was not possible why i am using the word rurban because it's a mixture of rural and urban jekhane amra sob kichui dekhte pai edi country side er doi kal ke enjoy korechi othocho ekta shohorer moddhe boshe jekhane 5g cholche 4g cholche internet e amra class virtual online session cholche sob kichui cholche যার ফলে আমরা বুঝতে পারি যে রার্বন জিনিসটা যে কত কঠিন যারা এখানে থাকে তারা বুঝতে পারে সন্ধে হয়ে গেলে তাদের ফিরে যেতে হয় কেন বিকজ ল্যাক অফ টেকনোলজিক্যাল নলেজ হ্যাজ বিন কিপ আওয়ে দে হ্যাভ বিকাম নন অ্যাকসেসেবল টু দোজ টেকনোলজিক্যাল নলেজ তখন শুরু হয়ে যায় হোয়াটসঅ্যাপে ছোট ছোট ক্লাসেস করে লেকচার করে পাঠানো ফেসবুকের মেসেঞ্জারে লেকচার করে পাঠানো যেগুলো রেগুলার কলেজেস অ্যান্ড ইউনিভার্সিটিস তাদের কাছে এই টেকনোলজিক্যাল পারফরমেটিভিটিটা ভীষণ একটা হিন্ড্রান্স হয়ে দাঁড়ায় আর ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্টলি ওয়েন ইউ সে দিস উই অলসো হ্যাভ দ্য মোস্ট কমনলি ইউজ ইন লা দিস লাস্ট থ্রি ইয়ার্স দ্য সেন্টেন্স ইজ অ্যাম আই অডিবল very interestingly we always say am i audible we have never said am i visible this is where it is very important because urban ne to amra shobai digital detoxification korei aschi amader ekhon ar hobe na ami kichukkhon bondho rekhe phone boshbo but i have seen since the day one the day timing it began most of us are hooked into our social media accounts and constantly using our phone আমরা তাহলে ডিজিটাল ডিটক্সিফিকেশন ব্যাপারটাকে কি আরবান সেন্ট্রিক করে দেবো নাকি রুরাল সেন্ট্রিক বা রারবান সেন্ট্রিক করতে পারি বাট এখানে একটা উইমেনের প্রিভিলেজ আছে দ্য প্রিভিলেজ ইজ ওয়েন দে আর কুকিং দে উইল কিপ সেটাকে ইয়ে করে রাখে কিন্তু সার্ভাইলেন্স ব্যাপারটা সার্ভাইলেন্সের যে ব্যাপারটা ডিজিটালি এটা ভীষণ একটা নর্মাটিভ ব্যাপার হয়ে গেছে দ্যাট ইজ ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট দ্যাটস ওয়াই উই নেভার সে এম আই ভিজিবল এখন এখানে ভিজিবিলিটিটা ভীষণ ইম্পর্টেন্ট যেটা নিয়ে অনেকটা কথা বলেছে প্রফেসর সরকার আমাদের বলেছে যে কীভাবে বডিটাকে আমরা অবজার্ভ করি কীভাবে বডিটাকে আমরা গেজ করি 
Now, these gays, I'm not, I'm not going into the politics of gays, I'm not talking about, but I will be talking about Emily Chang's Broto PR. Because discrimination does not always come from negation, does not always come from abjection. Sarah Ahmed obviously says that digital torture, digital abuse. You have to attend your classes by 8.30, 9.00, 9.30, you have to attend your classes by 8.30, 9.30, whenever your class hours begin. If you have a video off, or if you have a video off, or if you have a video off, or if you have a video off, but still, your availability is to 24 into 7, especially people who are in power. If you have a video off, or if you have a video off, Especially for women, it becomes really tough. Why I'm talking about because the power dynamics over here is vertically discriminating. Upur theke niche of the discrimination ta khub interesting bhabe dakha jaye. Choto choto shahore ra always the people who are discriminating the gram or the rural are by the urbans, and the people who are being discriminated. Also falls into the category of behavioral attitude. I've noted over here many things that people do carry a servile attitude to the seniors or the teachers. I don't know why, because there is probably the dynamics of power over here works in a very different way. It's a kato to shotti ami jani na, kintu vertical je discrimination ta, it onik ta vertical heteropatriarchy ki moto onda patta. Individual holds right on another individual if you are below the status. The vertically, you are below the status. Descending order is below the status. If I am a teacher, I have the whole right to hold you the way I want to. As a student, you cannot object to it. What you do is you gather a community. You build a communion. To object against me. शेखाने अच्छे में very interestingly, अमरा vertical heteropatriarchy पे अमी शब्दों में देखी जे value equality तके खूब importance दावा है. And therefore we fight for it. And this conference is exactly what it is doing. They are fighting for it. And it is important for us to see how the agencies over here working for the upliftment of such discriminations. Locationality and positionality shrapshame boundary actor create kare. We have always been told men cannot cry, boys don't cry. Kintu very interestingly akhun on it Instagram relay amra dekhte pari men are crying. One of the greatest examples was Bobby Diol broke into tears when Animal, the film, got super hit. Public reactions made him cry. It is a whole vertical discrimination. Akhon horizontal discrimination is very interesting. Horizontal discrimination is almost homoarchical. Same sex say, khopishi discrimination hoye hoche. Because friends bully the friends. Classmates bully one person. Akon ei bullying bapata bishon interesting because it individually impacts karo. Teachers discriminating teachers, classmates discriminating classmates, friends discriminating friends on basis of intersectionalities. Karka se gari ache, karka se iPhone ache, karka se boi ache, bhalo boi, theoretical boi. Each of accessibility gulo, amra institutionalize kore diyeche. And then it becomes normative. Like bullying is normal. It has to happen. That is where it is very important because Rarban psychology ta, we shon ta invisible circle to iri kore. An invisible circle of protective sanctity. Protective sanctity is not the case. Protective sanctity is the case. Most of the time, we remain recluse. We become introvert. Purposely, we become introvert. We don't have to say anything. Not like extrovert, what we saw in both the films. Bukhe, Shunno. Shunno is Bukhe and Ardhangi. 
যেগুলো আমরা এক্সট্রোভার্ট দেখেছি সেগুলো নেই ভয়েসেস অফ রেজিস্ট্যান্স you have just noticed it so i'll not go on that but before that i'll come to, uh, to conclude my talk i'll not take much time uh, it's almost like 20, 15 minutes i'm talking so uh, i'll come to the voice resistance data hoy seta equivocal hoye daray and many time it faces lots of mental stress the mental stress er to urban centric je concept of digital detoxification seta ki ekhane detoxification hote pare the people who are doing trauma studies probably can look into it this is exactly what i was talking about horizontal discrimination তোমার স্বাধীনতা নিয়ে কথা বলার রাইট নাও দিস ইজ আই কনক্লুড বাই সেইং দ্যাট দ্য ভয়েসেস অফ রেজিস্ট্যান্স যেটা কথা আমি বলছিলাম যে ইনভিজিবল সাইকেল রিয়ালিটি যেটা আছে উনি তো বডির ব্যাপারে বলে দিয়েছেন সেই জন্য দ্যাটস ওয়াই এম নট গোয়িং টু দ্য বডি এনিমো অ্যান্ড দিস ইজ ভেরি ইট ইজ ইম্পর্টেন্ট দ্যাট প্রোটেক্টিভ স্যাংটিটি হ্যাজ টু বি মেজার measured by you yourself no one else can measure for it and trauma studies people probably look into it and today morning we have heard uh, uh, jeris also who was talking about uh, heteronormativity in many ways one of this heteronormativity that she was trying to point out is about the discrimination not only happening horizontal but also happening vertical and most importantly the homo uh, what you call the queer community faces the vertical discrimination more than the horizontal discrimination vertical discrimination and bullying is most important bullying jeta hoye thaki sob shomoy and bullying has been converted into many kind of uh, many kind of what you called men uh, disorders or uh, psychological problems like anxiety depression jemon constant ekta emotional fear e bash korte hoy হঠাৎ করে কেঁদে ফেলা বা মেন্টাল স্ট্রেস হয়ে যায় খুব বেশি ওয়ারি কি কি হবে কি হবে টাইপস তারপর মেন্টাল হাইপার অ্যাক্টিভিটিটাও খুব বেড়ে যায় যে আমাকে করতেই হবে এই সব অ্যাংজাইটি সিমটমস দেখা যেতে পারে এই কোয়ের কমিউনিটির মধ্যে আর ডিপ্রেশনটা তো একদম এক্সট্রিমে চলে গেলে সেন্সিটিভিটি যেমন বুলিং হতে হতে একটা সেন্সিটিভ ইয়েতে চলে যায় লো সেলফ এস্টিম ক্রিয়েট করা হয় পার্পাসলি অ্যান্ড লাস্ট বাট নট লিস্ট melan palite okay dhakka dewa hoy this is how the protective sanctity also brings lots of important thing and that's probably uh, uh, professor sarkar ar amar lecture ta basically otar kothai boleche je professor sarkar talked on body and i talked about the society and the psychology of the society thank you very much thank you professor roy extremely helpful uh the little brief i wanted it to continue for a few more minutes anyway <laughs> uh what uh, professor roy has drawn our attention to is uh the kind of uh, the power dynamics that uh, is very much operative in a very remote area like chachol or even uh, a city like metropolitan center like bangalore or calcutta so it is a beat uh, urban space or beat a rural space how it is ubiquitous whatever pronunciation the full hote pare okay <laughs> very sorry for that u b or u b i am not very sure anyway so power dynamics are koto gulo ami je point ta miss korechi it was interesting it was covered by professor roy that normativity hajaro bar bolar shonge shonge ami jeta bolini institutionalization যেখানে ইনস্টিটিউশন সেখানে নরমেটিভিটির প্রবলেম তো কোয়ার স্টাডিজের যারা রয়েছে ফিউচার প্ল্যান্স ইউ হ্যাভ ফর দেম ইট ওয়াজ হাইলি এনলাইটেনিং এবার আমি ওপেন করছি ইফ সাম ওয়ান ওয়ান্স টু ইন্টারঅ্যাক্ট উইথ প্রফেসর রয় ব্রিফ কোয়েশ্চেন মেক ইট অ্যাজ ব্রিফ অ্যাজ পসিবল অ্যান্ড অ্যালাউ হিউ টু টেক ইট আপ uh yes okay we have uh, yes yes there are many hands the first one is uh, tumi nijeke introduce kore ba it will be not to be a question plenary session hoy na sheta kintu amar mone hocche eagerness chokmuk dekhe ar ki sir er permission jodi dance sir ektu kotha bol man just 
ব্রিফ ইন্টারঅ্যাকশন নমস্কার স্যার আমি শ্রেয়সী গাঙ্গুলি আমি জলপাইগুড়ি থেকে আমার সাথেও কথা বলা যেতে পারে নমস্কার স্যার জলপাইগুড়ি থেকে এসেছি আমি পিডি ওমেন্স কলেজে জিওগ্রাফিতে পড়াই জিওগ্রাফি পড়াই তো আমি সেই বিষয়ে জিওগ্রাফির সঙ্গে আসবো তার আগে একটা জিনিস বলি আমি কুয়ের লিটারেচারের সঙ্গে যুক্ত আমি নিজে লেখালেখি করি যেহেতু মানে নিজের পরিচয়টা নিজেই একটু দিতে হচ্ছে না হলে পরে বিষয়টা উঠে আসবে না কুয়ের লিটারেচারের সঙ্গে আমি নিজে লিখি আমার উপন্যাস আছে সেই সংক্রান্ত বিষয়ে তো এবার এই কুয়ের বিষয়টার সঙ্গে আমাদের যেহেতু জিওগ্রাফিতে সাইট অ্যান্ড সিচুয়েশনের একটা বিরাট গুরুত্ব রয়েছে এই নর্থ বেঙ্গলে কুয়ের জিওগ্রাফি এবং সাইট অ্যান্ড সিচুয়েশনের যে ওভারঅল একটা আউটলুক এটাকে আপনি কিভাবে দেখছেন এটা আমার একটি জানার বিষয় এবং যেহেতু সাইকোলজি বা এই যে টেনশান এই বিষয়গুলো সমস্ত উঠে আসলো সেটা সামগ্রিকভাবে নর্থ বেঙ্গলের বিষয় কারণ আমি যখন নভেলে সেটাকে কনভার্ট করছি সেটা আমার মতো করে আসছে কিন্তু আমি যদি সেটাকে জিওগ্রাফিতে আনতে চাই সেই বিষয়টা অনেক বেশি স্ট্রাকচার্ড ফর্মে আরও আনা আমার মনে হয়েছে সেই জায়গাটা উপযুক্ত হবে তো সেই বিষয়টাকে আপনি কিভাবে দেখছেন খুব ভালো প্রশ্ন এটা ইন্টারেস্টিংলি এই জন্যই বলছি কারণ জেন্ডার জিওগ্রাফি প্রবাবলি বিশ্বের অনেক জায়গায় আছে জেন্ডার জিওগ্রাফি বিশ্বের অনেক জায়গায় আছে তবে যখন তুমি নর্থ বেঙ্গলের কথা বলো ভেরি ইন্টারেস্টিংলি ইন্ডিয়াতে হ্যাপটিক বা ইমোশনস ইমোশনাল জিওগ্রাফি বা হ্যাপটিক জিওগ্রাফিটা ইউজ করা হয় কারণ সেটাতেই আমরা কার্টোগ্রাফিটা মেজার করতে পারি কার্টোগ্রাফির মেজারমেন্টের জন্য পারফরমেটিভ স্পেসেসের দরকার হয় কোয়ের বিষয়টা ওই পারফরমেটিভ স্পেসেসের মধ্যেই হয়ে থাকে যেমন ফর এক্সাম্পল তুমি দেখতে পাবে ছোট ছোট জায়গায় অনেক জায়গায় রয়েছে যে এখনও পুরুষরা মহিলা সেজে পারফর্ম করছে রাইট দিজ আর পারফরমেটিভ স্পেসেস বাট দিজ আর কার্টোগ্রাফিক্যাল স্পেসেস অলসো রাইট নাও ইফ ইউ সি ফ্রম দ্যাট দিস ইজ ওয়ান পয়েন্ট দ্য আদার পয়েন্ট ইজ নন প্লেস মার্ক অগের একটা ভীষণ একটা ভীষণ ইম্পর্টেন্ট থিওরি আছে এটা যাকে নন প্লেস বলে কারণ অনেক সময় কি হয় আমার কাছে নর্থ বেঙ্গল এখন নন প্লেস ইন দ্য সেন্স লাইক আই ক্যারি দ্য মেমোরিজ ইফ আই গো ব্যাক টু মাই সিলিগুড়ি ওয়ের আই হ্যাভ গ্রোন আপ that siliguri does not exist anymore oi siliguri are nei amra jokhon siliguri boro hoyeche siliguri te mohananda was mohananda it is no more nala thik ache borshakale je mohananda dekhte pao seta amader gorom kaleo chilo that's why that has become a non place for me now this is how emotional geography works অ্যান্ড নর্থ বেঙ্গলকে দেখতে গেলে ইমোশনাল জিওগ্রাফিটাকে ভীষণ ইম্পর্টেন্স দিয়ে দেখতে হবে কীভাবে ওরা পাবলিক প্লেসে ইন্টারাক্ট করে দ্যাট ইজ ওয়াই ইট ইজ ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট কমিউনিকেশনস ইন পাবলিক আর কনভারসেশনস দ্যাট টেক প্লেস উইদ ইন দ্যাট স্পেস হাউ ডাজ দ্য কমিউনিকেশন টেক প্লেস এই কনভারসেশনস আর কমিউনিকেশনস ইন দোজ পারফরমেটিভ স্পেসেস বিকাম ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট ফর কার্টোগ্রাফিজ কার্টোগ্রাফিক্যাল মেজারমেন্ট দ্যাট ইজ হাউ জিওগ্রাফি আমার একটা পিএইচডি স্টুডেন্ট এই রিসেন্টলি জমা করেছে হি ইজ এ জিওগ্রাফি স্টুডেন্ট বাট হি ডিড অন বাই সেক্সুয়াল লোনলিনেসের উপরে তো দ্যাট ইজ ভেরি ইট ইজ বিকমস ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট দ্য জিওগ্রাফি স্টুডেন্ট হয়ে আমরা কীভাবে দেখবো জিওগ্রাফির স্টুডেন্টদের জন্য ইমোশনাল জিওগ্রাফি বিকম হ্যাজ রিসেন্টলি কাম আপ অ্যান্ড ইট ইজ ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট আর মার্ক অগের এই নন প্লেসের কনসেপ্টটা ভীষণভাবে ফিট করে ওর মধ্যে আশা করি শ্রেয়সি ইউ আর হ্যাপি উইথ অ্যান্সার থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ অ্যাকচুয়ালি ওয়ান মোর হ্যান্ড ওয়াজ রেজ অ্যান্ড আই হ্যাভ টু ডু দিস মেক ইট শর্ট ওকে রজত স্যার I'm Rajesh Subramanian Mondol I am working on pederasty sir and I have a question sir you you have uh, talked about uh, institutionalization sir how far or how does institutionalization um, go into the making of uh, what I call queer elitism does it go a long way or does it at all now when we talk about elitism elitism sorry uh, you have already pointed out the intersectionality that is required now sit down sit down please sit down shorja uh, why i was talking about over here the discrimination horizontal discrimination is 
that is where the institutionalization takes place now one of the intersectionality is falling in love with older men Toma research to outer opore, right? Pedestrial research. Now, the fact is, uh, very interestingly, falling in love with an older woman is permissible in the society. But falling in love with an older man, a man falling in love with an older man, is not acceptable even in the queer community. Because age is a major factor. When we, uh, when we try to, um, what you say, um, phenomenologically understand the whole idea, we see that what abjection comes is the first is age, second comes the location. Because the distance is too far, we cannot travel so much. These matters. This is why I'm saying that uh, Shannon Gilraith at a very important point points out that uh, on the basis of gender and gendered performances, we try to create a power tropes of bodies, which uh, cinema and that implicates in even in our study, Vicky Price is talking about capitalist body. How women's body become capitalist? Prothome Amra Shashmakta positionality. Um, he is trying to, from the very beginning here, we have been seeing that hourglass figure, gradually that is also been taken over by now any kind of body is presented. Recently, we have seen Miss Nepal performing in. Miss, uh, a world contest where she was little plumpy from the other side what we have been saying. Therefore, essential construction that we are talking about, Tasha Oren talks that essential construction of body affects the psychology of every individual. And therefore, this abjection becomes so important that we cry, try to institutionalize mm. that abjection. I think Roger, they have answered you. Thank you. I think uh, we should move on to the uh, next question. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, Pinaki, Pinaki was like lost in listening to you. I remember I, uh, looking at him. Uh, thank you so much, no, Professor no, no, Roy. I, I, yes, I concluding remarks. I, I, concluding remarks from the chair. Professor Roy, uh, we are heading towards next sessions but really i mean non placeless egulo notun kore jannam khub emotional geography egulo ke khub sundor kore jannam thanks a lot to mane chair kore ar ki kalo amar khub bhalo legeche sir je ajke kotha ta bolchilen na aging ta aging niye kalke koyek jon deal koreche we have some good presenters also yes yes through online presence don't underestimate them please a round of applause for them also Yes, yes. Our online have papers nice. and online presentation is still going on. We are doing the parallel sessions due to the crunch in time. And we have presenters from all over South Asia. Let me tell you that. Not only from India, but from uh, regional countries. Uh, I'm sorry, neighboring countries. I'm sorry for this. <laughs> regional country. A new parlance I've invented by mistake. Anyway, um, thank you so much, uh, professors. May I now very humbly invite Professor Dr. Pinaki Roy, our next speaker, actually the last but not the least, and I'll speak about him, but first of all, sir, please can you come to the dais. May I very humbly invite Professor Dr. Fozia Mannan to be the, to chair the session, and she's from East West University, Bangladesh, and uh, Professor Roy, um, if I start reading his uh, CV, it would perhaps take me till the evening coffee break because he is a prolific academic and a speaker at regular conferences and everywhere. But apart from that, what sets him apart actually is his interest in, uh, like in, in, in the issues and themes that concern women um, and 
men who are uh, who think about or who, who behave or act like um, non-men, let's say. So Professor Roy has um, published in various international journals. He has a lot of uh, books and articles. And most of all, he was awarded the highest academic award of West Bengal. I just forget the year at this moment with Shikha Ratno, 2000, 2020. And uh, apart from that, I should also say that he has been my PhD supervisor. So that way, I am so very happy to welcome him on stage. And, and now I hand over the session to uh, Professor Manan. Uh, because it is almost, uh, you know, the you know we are must be very hungry and uh, looking for our lunch so i should not extended my any you know uh, before uh, i start the session i would request the presenter to present her uh, present his uh, paper ma'am for your permission i would like to invite dr shambhita chatterjee to co-chair my session if that is possible that is permissible I take this as a rare moment of honor and gift from Professor Roy. I forgot to mention that he is also my uh, very esteemed colleague. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Manan. Professor Manan, Professor Manan Dr. Chatterjee, and Dr. Kaur. And uh, so basically, I'm going to speak about women combatants of select South Asian countries, a very brief survey. And it is uh, somewhat full of information, so I would basically try to cut it down because we are already uh, late for lunch and we are extremely hungry. So uh, just let me skip over most of the parts. Uh, okay. Uh, today I am going to speak about the role of South Asian women during times of modern conflicts and how they have joined and worked for their own country's military forces. I cannot say that their countries are always maintaining gender equality as far as the number of female soldiers are concerned. But in the 21st century, the situation is changing first and for the better. It needs to be mentioned that it is a censurable misconception that during the two world wars, especially during the second world war, the South Asian women, particularly those from India, scarcely, if at all, saw active duties as warriors. For example, the expatriate women of Indian origin settled in Southeast Asia directly fought against the English forces in Southeast and East Asia during the Second World War. For example, as personnel of Rani of Jhansi Regiment of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose's Indian National Army and other regiments. Critically acclaimed publications like Narayan Channels, I have seen Netaji, Peter Watt Face, The Forgotten Army, Joyous Labourers, Women Against the Raj, and Vera Hildebrand's Women at War focus on the early 20th century combat experiences of Indian women. It is however true that a considerable number of Indian women associated with armed forces used to work in auxiliary branches of army and voluntary forces, especially those catering to the health needs of soldiers of various, various expeditionary forces. They participated in the Indian military nursing service during both the world wars and were enemies killed in action or taken as prisoners of war. They were also trained for the air raid precaution or given night duties to operate searchlights for tracking enemy fighter and bomber planes. Some of them, including Noor Inayat Khan, worked as special operations executives. But unlike in some European countries, they were not requested to produce children as war services. The Nazis, for example, awarded silver second class medals to those German women and girls who produced at least six to seven children during the war period. So there was a kind of a prize for producing children. The more the children, the merrier. So you must at least produce six to seven children per family. Otherwise, your rations would be withdrawn. That was what Germany was trying to follow during the Second World War. Okay. Nevertheless, during due to the lack of dependable statistics and constraints of time, I would like to omit these two World War periods from my analysis. Indian women, but now it's a, it's a very uh, it's a, a very unknown part of our history. Indian women's participation in modern warfare began immediately after the Indian independence, which was accompanied by the tumultuous and all-destroying partition. The role of female combatants in India 
first became noticeable during the mindless violence of the partition and in a very wrong and condemnable manner. Approximately 0.1 million women were raped during the partition and as Gita Chaudhary writes, many of these rapes occurred through the help of women who were acting like soldiers actively help their male acquaintances drag women of different religions away for raping. In the aftermath of the partition in post-independence India, another very unknown chapter, the Kashmiri women's militia first attracted international attention. Around 100 young Kashmiri girls and women with leftist leanings were given intense, intensive combat training to defend Kashmir in face of intermittent attacks from Pakistani terrorists and non-formal warriors. As Andrew Warhead writes, the convening of militia was largely overseen by the small band of communists in Kashmir and their supporters. It seems only to have mustered in Srinagar and probably to have consisted of under a hundred women, many of them teenagers. The women's militia never saw active service, but it continued to drill and train in the use of forums with an Indian army instructor well into 1948. The members of the KWM did not formally see action they were trained to attack the Pakistani invaders during the first Indo-Pakistani War of 1947, in which, uh, okay, I'll just skip that out. When China attacked India on 20th October 1962, there were once again different contingents of Indian women, some of them with few days of training and some without, who took up rifles and ready themselves to face the mighty PLA. This specifically happened in the Indian states of Russia and Arunachal Pradesh. Much before Lata Mangeshkar sang Arandhi in this I Mary Logo on 26 January 1963. As her post-war efforts, this has got a very bad history, this song. I'm not going into the details. Lata Mangeshkar actually was trying to avoid singing that song. And her sister, who was actually given the responsibility of singing that song, she had actually escaped from India so that she does not have to sing the song free of cost. Lata Mangeshkar had also asked for a hefty sum, but because it was supposed to be sung on 26th January, she didn't have... Huh? Oh, 26th January, she actually had uh, to uh, forfeit the amount. Okay. Uh, it, uh, it is a very bad history, the song. Thousands of Indian women in Assam and other northeastern states had grouped themselves to face the Chinese military personnel, responding to Jawaharlal Nehru's appeal to them to defend their own country. Though, there has been a near complete silence as far as the cultural field is concerned regarding the realities of the 1962 Indochina War. Uh, books are uh, fictional retellings like Eclavens, the regiment and Henry Jesudian, so in the Cobra Strikes, are uh, trying to focus on the roles of non-combatants and women during the 1962 war in which India suffered a defeat. Indian women also did not have to. Uh, Indian women all did not have to face many services to uh, did not have many services to offer in the role of direct combatants during the 1965 Indo-Pak War, but they medically attended upon with widely appreciated skill those thousands of Indian soldiers who have been wounded in action. As the war concluded, a number of Indian female military nurses and medical officers were decorated for their war services. Once again, during India's 1971 war with Pakistan, Indian women associated with armed forces were not sent into direct combat. However, as testimonies be emerging in the 2010s are gradually revealing, within Indian government sent a number of Indian women to both West Pakistan and East Pakistan on Spanish duties. Former Lieutenant Commander Harvin Sikkars, Colin Samad, and uh, Meghna Gozar's 2018 film Razi, based on Sikkars' book, have rekindled discussions over this fact. Okay. Uh, by the time the two month and three week old uh, Kargil war broke out between India and Pakistan on 3rd May 1999, the Indian military forces had changed several of their policies towards women. Starting 1992, women were permitted to join several branches of the Indian Army, though on short service commissions. Though it would be nine years more for women to be inducted as permanent commissioned officers, Changes had begun. Alka Sharma, Anjana Vadoria, and Priya Jingan, for example, were three of the first 25 female officers who joined the Indian Army in 1992. In 1994, Gunjan Saxena from Uttar Pradesh and Srividdha Rajan from Kerala joined the Indian Air Force as pilots in supporting roles. As the Kargil war raged on, 
they were given the task of directly entering the war zone with their helicopters and bring the wounded soldiers back. Though India is still struggling to maintain gender equality in or for its military forces, Bangladesh has considerably advanced itself on this issue. In spite of several logistical and resource-based uh, challenges facing the uh, Bangladesh Army right now, the 0.16 million strong Bangladesh Army has well over 1,000 female soldiers. Within four years of India recruiting fully trained female soldiers, Bangladesh military forces began employing women in various branches. From various statistics and news items, it could be interpreted that approximately 900 women are presently joining, joining the Bangladesh military forces every year, and which is much, much more, more than what is happening in India right now. 900 women each year are actually joining pump posts in the Bangladesh army. Names like Suraya Rahman, the first female brigadier, Suzanne Githi, who became a major general in 2018, Jannatun Fidos, the first female paratrooper, or the Lieutenant Colonels Sanjida Hussain, Saida Nazima uh, Rehan, Farhana Arfin, and Sarah Ami, and the pilots Nazia Hussain and Saharina Aran, uh, Anwar have become inspiration for thousands of Bangladeshi women, women for careers in the Bangladesh Armed Forces. In fact, Bangladesh has paid, played such a positive role in inducting women in armed forces and giving them equal rights that Major uh, Manoj Narvane, the former Indian Army Chief said at the 2023 NATCON National Conference that India has lagged behind its neighbor on this issue. The tiny but developed South Asian country of Sri Lanka implies women both as soldiers opposing the national interests and as opposing forces. Among different countries forming South Asia, the Sri Lankan Army has a separate Sri Lankan Army Women's Corps since September 1979, far, far earlier than, when, uh, than India. Uh, headquarters at Borella in Colombo and comprising six battalions, the SLAWC puts female combat, uh, soldiers into direct combat actions. Uh, on the other hand, the Northeast Sri Lanka-based Tamil terrorist organization, LTTE, recruited as many female cadets as possible as per the philosophy of maintenance of gender equality. In fact, a considerable number of major operations of LTPE were undertaken by female warriors, including Kalaivan Rajanatnam or Dhanu, who assassinated Rajiv Gandhi, Nalini Sriharan, and the LTPE female officers like Brigadier Bhudusa, Brigadier Thorpa, Lieutenant Colonel Akira, and Major Sutaya. Had I got time, I would have actually gone into the details of these people, but well, I, I have got no time right now. We're actually suffering from kind of pangs of hunger. If Sri Lanka trumped India and Bangladesh in the so-called battle for gender equality in the military by creating an all-female corps, Pakistan's women joined Pakistan Armed Forces as soon as the country was created in 1947, another very unknown portion of history. That is, no one can actually imagine that Pakistan's female army uh, corps were created as soon as Pakistan actually came into force, or rather it, it came into existence. In Life Devoted to Human Welfare, published in the dawn on 11 June 1982, Munazar Samsi links Pakistan's women's war preparedness to Muhammad Ali Jinnah's frantic call in the 1940s. We should be prepared to train the Pakistani women in combat. Islam does not want women to be shut up and never see fresh air. As if responding to Jinnah's vision, Sheila Arin Pant, the wife of the first Pakistani Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan, took the initiative to start a women's unit in the Pakistan Armed Forces for providing logistical support to the 1947 war with India. A direct combat training program for Pakistan women was also undertaken. Brigadier Pant was, found, uh, was also the founder of the Women's National Guard for the Pakistani Army. We do not yet have the Women's National Guard in India right, until now. Pakistan has got that. Contrary to the popular and often prejudiced perceptions, the Afghan armed forces have at least 5,000 women combatants presently. However, this is not a new trend at all. Afghanistan has a long history of armed women fighting fiercely the oppressors. GSFP opines that oppressors like the Taliban have always had clear objectives, control of women's labors, livelihoods, and bodies. And the Afghan female warriors have valorously fought their uh, fought against their achieving of these objectives. A recent publication, Book of Queens, by Pardis Madhavi, 
a 45 year old afghan american academician focuses on a group of women afghan horse breeders who used the animals to fight against the russian forces from 1979 to 1989 and the taliban soldiers interestingly the nepalese army has also over 7000 female combatants presently and this equals to 7% of the indian uh, of the nepali military troops as gora pokhrel writes Women today are all present in all of army units except in the special forces. The number of women army officials and personnel had reached about 7,000. This equals to 7% of the total army population. The Nepal Army has plans to establish more women-only com companies in the near future. Okay. The Royal Bhutanese Army is also opening up its door to women in combat roles. As any now news reports on 28 August 2021. And 150 women uh, recruits of the Royal Bhutanese Army completed their year-long training at the military camps in Tejaling, Bhutan, and joined the army to play combat roles. Earlier, they could join the um, OR troops only as medical officers and nurses. And finally, Maldives. I am speaking about South Asia as a whole. Like Bhutan, the Maldives too is patronizing. Uh, uh, sorry, prioritizing recruitment of more and more women for its 11,000. personal strong Maldives national defense force female recruits have been given the prestigious rehendi award to bolster their morale on 1st march 2019 the news portal raje reported that how the maldivian defense minister maria didi had been arguing for the equal representation of women in the maldivian military in conclusion i must confess that i have very poor, poorly tried to make a review of the combat and roles of women in different south asian nations Women, in fact, have always played an important supportive role whenever their countries were invaded, and their roles should and could never be forgotten nor sufficiently praised. For example, 0.8 million women served in the Soviet army during the Second World War in different roles, and even 78 years after the war concluded, their contributions are still being praised. The South Asian women, with all the patriarchal rulings and impediments, have still gone out of their way. to cut the niches on the fields of combat and in their country's military troops in this conference focusing on gender equality i can only hope that the female participation in the armed forces of south asian nations would continue to increase to such a point that the number of female and male combatants would be equal right now only israel and north korea appear to have achieved this equality as far as possible thank you Uh, thank you uh, dr roy for uh, presenting a completely different issues in south asian region but there is a lots of research is going on in militancy and women and uh, he mentioned about bangladesh so because uh, i know about bangladesh this is happened because of i should give the credit to the our uh, prime minister sheikh hasina because she is the only person who actually lead the role and initially there is resistance from the uh defense uh people they said that no no women can't do that so she actually insisted and uh make a uh, you know the uh, make the door open for the women to join the air force navy and in uh, army and it, in in the uh, army section been researching on bangladesh and pakistan and i'm quite surprised to find that well uh, their roles regarding the induction of women in military is far more ahead of what we are planning right now exactly in india. that's i'm yeah. going to mention that even the women are now in the peacekeeping force yeah. even from the police and uh, all the women are doing in a very very you know uh, lead, i mean uh, they show their leadership in the in the foreign countries as well and i have seen when i'm in un in uh, 2018 and when i entered the <coughs> i got emotional when i talking about that that women are you know the one photo is there the two women wearing the air force dresses and they are bangladeshis is so proud of me and this is what shows what women feel seeing her i feel emotional too at this moment and i must say i have not revealed one part of my identity till now which i should i think should go on record i am a member of armed forces wife welfare association because my husband 
was in the Indian Air Force. So I am also a part of this story. Even though I was never a dietitian, I have not served in the army, but I have seen, I have seen the, uh, the, the journey that uh, women do to be. You know, I have seen my, my husband, uh, uh, he took voluntary retirement in the year 2015. And that time I have seen, you know, women pilots and women, uh, you know, technical staff coming out. And even when I see, you know, air hostesses or, you know, this is, I, I think I'm going a bit astray, but pardon me for that. When we travel, we see that, we see air hostesses and all in the glamorous positions and as, uh, you know, the, uh, as the pilots and all. But I have seen women pull those trucks. In Bagdogra, we have, you know, the uh, indigo people. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I should mention, I'm never politically correct, but, you know, I have seen people do that. So I must say thank you, Pinaki, for taking this, for, 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 Professor Roy, I mean, uh, thank you for this entire take because this was absolutely very different. And and the moment he told me, I kept it under wraps. Until that, I that is why I ran out. Even the press bite was going on, but I ran back because I just couldn't miss his paper. So thank you so much, Pinak, and thank you, ma'am. And your connection, your emotion with women or being a woman. আপনাকে দুই হাত জোর করে প্রণাম জানাচ্ছি যে আপনি এত ভালোভাবে আমাদের এটাকে মানে বলেছেন এবং বাংলাদেশ আরো শাইন করুক পাকিস্তান শাইন করুক শ্রীলঙ্কা শাইন করুক সবাই শাইন করুক আমরা শাইন করি উইমেনরা যেন একটু আমরা এগোতে পারি একদম তাই এবং আমার এক বান্ধবী আছে ওখানে थैंक यू सो मच फॉर द सेशन वी शैल गो ऑन दिस रिकॉर्ड थैंक यू सो मच आई थिंक इट वाज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट emotionally touching papers I, I, I heard during the two days of the conference. Thank you so much. With this, we break for lunch actually. Then we come back for the presenters. Uh, we'll, we'll not take much because 15, 20 minutes maximum. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back for this.
We shall be having the uh, offline sessions right now. I would be inviting around uh, five speakers on the stage. The first is Ivana Choudhury. Second is Dr. Ruby Dash. Is she there? Dr. Ruby Dash. Uh, Dr. Mohammad Jair Hussain. Achan? Nee. Bosho, bosho, bosho. Jomuna Dash. Jomuna Dash here? No. Okay. So basically, we are having only two presenters. First is the Ivana Choudhury, who is a research scholar of Raiganj University Department of English. And I have the privilege to supervise her work right now. And Dr. Ruby Dash, who is an assistant professor of philosophy of Orish Chandrapur College. Uh, so basically, ma'am, please come over the stage. Hello. আমার টপিক হচ্ছে শিক্ষা ও নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন একটি দার্শনিক বিশ্লেষণ বর্তমানে একটি বহু আলোচিত বিষয় হলো নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন কিন্তু প্রকৃত অর্থে নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন বলতে ঠিক কি বোঝায় তা নিয়ে মতপার্থক্য রয়েছে নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন কি কেবলই নারীর আর্থিক স্বনির্ভরতা নাকি সকল ক্ষেত্রে পুরুষের পাশাপাশি সমসুযোগ সমমর্যাদা লাভ করা কোন কোন বিশিষ্ট ব্যক্তির মতে ক্ষমতায়ন হলো এমন প্রক্রিয়া যা তারা ক্ষমতাহীন ব্যক্তিরা নিজেদের জীবন ধারণ পরিস্থিতির ওপর নিজেদের নিয়ন্ত্রণ বৃদ্ধি করতে সক্ষম হয় অর্থাৎ ক্ষমতায়ন হলো নিজের ওপর ভরসা বৃদ্ধি সচেতনতা বৃদ্ধি এবং সমস্ত প্রতিকূলতাকে অতিক্রম করার ক্ষমতা কোনো কোনো বিশিষ্ট ব্যক্তি আবার ক্ষমতায়নের ক্ষেত্রে তিনটি মাত্রার কথাও বলেছেন পাওয়ার টু অর্থাৎ নিজের চেষ্টায় বেঁচে থাকার ক্ষমতা ও নিজের শ্রমের সঠিক প্রয়োগ পাওয়ার উইথ অর্থাৎ নারীদের যৌথ ক্ষমতার প্রয়োগ এবং পাওয়ার উইথ ইন লিঙ্গগত আত্মমর্যাদার বিকাশ নারী ক্ষমতায়ন হলো লিঙ্গ সমতার সেই চিত্র যার দ্বারা একটি সমাজ তথা দেশের সার্বিক উন্নয়নের জন্য অতি প্রয়োজনীয় নারী ক্ষমতায়ন নারীদের সমাজের বিভিন্ন সমস্যার মধ্যে দিয়ে জীবন ধারণের ক্ষেত্রে সঠিক সিদ্ধান্ত গ্রহণের সুযোগ দেয় নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন নারীকে স্বমূল্যবোধ জাগ্রত করে একটি সমাজ কেবলমাত্র পুরুষ বা কেবলমাত্র নারী দ্বারা কখনই সুষ্ঠুভাবে পরিচালিত হতে পারে না সমাজে অগ্রগতির জন্য সমাজ পরিচালনা করার জন্য পুরুষের পাশাপাশি নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের প্রয়োজন কিন্তু নারীরা সমাজের তাদের পর্যাপ্ত সুযোগ সুবিধা থেকে বঞ্চিত হয় তারা পুরুষের সমান সুযোগ সুবিধা পায় না তাই নারীর ক্ষমতায় নিশ্চিত নিশ্চিত করার জন্য কার্যকরী ব্যবস্থা গ্রহণ করা উচিত পুরুষদের পাশাপাশি নারীরাও সমাজের প্রতিটি ক্ষেত্রে বিশেষ ভূমিকা পালন করতে পারে তা অবশ্যই নিশ্চিত করা দরকার নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের ক্ষেত্রে সমাজের সকল স্তরে এমন এক সুস্থ পরিবেশ থাকবে যেখানে নারী তার নিজ সত্তায় সমর্যাদায় অধিকারী হয়ে উঠতে পারবে তবে সেক্ষেত্রে শিক্ষার প্রসার ও সচেতনতা আবশ্যক কারণ শিক্ষার প্রসার ও সচেতন নাগরিক হিসাবে নিজেকে গড়ে তুলতে পারলে তবে নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন সম্ভব তাই সব থেকে আগে প্রয়োজন হলো উপযুক্ত শিক্ষিত হওয়া এবং নিজেকে দেশের একজন সচেতন নাগরিক হিসাবে গড়ে তোলা আমাদের সমাজে জন্ম থেকে মেয়েদের বড়ে করে বড় করে তোলার ক্ষেত্রে এমন কিছু আচরণ করা হয় যেন মেয়েরা পুরুষদের কাছে পরাধীন তারা যেন সর্বদাই পুরুষের উপর নির্ভরশীল কিন্তু এ ধারণা একেবারেই সত্য নয় প্রকৃতপক্ষে পুরুষের মতো নারী ও স্বাধীন কারোর উপর নির্ভর না হয়েও তারা অনেক কিছুই করতে পারে তাই যতদিন পর্যন্ত তাদের তারা সামনের দিকে এগিয়ে যাবে না যতদিন তারা অন্যের দাসত্ব স্বীকার করে থাকবে ততদিন নারীর ক্ষমতায় 
উন্নয়ন ঘটবে না এবং সমাজের ও দেশের অগ্রগতি হবে না এটি পরিবার তথা সমাজের সার্বিক উন্নতির ক্ষেত্রে একজন নারী ভূমিকা যথেষ্ট গুরুত্বপূর্ণ কিন্তু অনেক ক্ষেত্রে এই পরিবারেই নারীকে কোণঠাসা করে রাখা হয় দেশের উন্নয়নের জন্য নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন প্রয়োজন তাই কেবলমাত্র নারীর অধিকার সংরক্ষণ করলেই চলবে না নারীদের উপযুক্ত শিক্ষার ব্যবস্থা করতে হবে যাতে নারীদের ক্ষমতায়ন সম্ভব হয় নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের মূলত তিনটি দিক অর্থনৈতিক সামাজিক ও রাজনৈতিক নারী ক্ষমতায়নের প্রধান প্রয়োজনীয় বিষয় হলো তার আর্থিক সক্ষমতা দারিদ্রতা দূর না করা গেলেও ক্ষমতায়নের কোনো অর্থই নেই ভারত বাংলাদেশ শ্রীলঙ্কা সহ অনেক দেশে আদর্শ অর্থনীতি মডেল মডেলে সফল প্রয়োগের মাধ্যমে নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের যথেষ্ট প্রমাণ পাওয়া যায় ভারতের বিভিন্ন মডেলে ক্ষুদ্র ঋণ প্রকল্প মহিলাদের অর্থনৈতিক ও সামাজিক ক্ষমতায়নের মাধ্যমে অনেক দারিদ্র পরিবারকে দারিদ্র মুক্ত করেছে আর্থিক ক্ষমতায়নের আলোচনা প্রসঙ্গে সামাজিক ও রাজনৈতিক ক্ষমতায়নের আলোচনাও এসে যায় আর্থিক ক্ষমতায়নের মাধ্যমে সম্পূর্ণ ক্ষমতায়ন হয় না সামাজিক ক্ষমতায়নের ক্ষেত্রে প্রধান বাধা সৃষ্টি করে পরম্পরাগত ঐতিহ্য তাই সামাজিক ক্ষমতায়নের জন্য পরিবার ও সমাজের নারীর স্বাধীনভাবে মত প্রকাশের ও সিদ্ধান্ত গ্রহণের অধিকার থাকতে হবে পারিবারিক ও সামাজিক বৈষম্যের বিরুদ্ধে প্রতিবাদ জানাতে হবে নারীর রাজনৈতিক ক্ষমতায়ন রাষ্ট্রীয় পৃষ্ঠপোষকতার ওপর অনেকাংশে নির্ভরশীল রাষ্ট্রীয় সহযোগিতায় নারীর রাজনৈতিক ক্ষেত্রে অর্থাৎ পঞ্চায়েত পৌর প্রতিষ্ঠানগুলিতে আনুপাতিক হারে রাজনৈতিক প্রতিনিধিত্ব লাভ করেছে নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের ক্ষেত্রে পুরুষ নারী পুরুষের সমতা অবশ্যই প্রয়োজনীয় কিন্তু তার সঙ্গে শিক্ষা হলো নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের সবথে সব থেকে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ শিক্ষা হলো মানুষের জন্মগত অধিকার শিক্ষা ছাড়া নারী অথবা পুরুষ কেউই উন্নতি লাভ করতে পারে না শিক্ষার মাধ্যমে ব্যক্তির পারিবারিক সামাজিক অর্থনৈতিক সমৃদ্ধি ঘটে শিক্ষা আমাদের বিবেক বুদ্ধি জ্ঞান অনুভূতি আবেগ ইত্যাদির উৎকর্ষ সাধনে সাহায্য করে তাই শিক্ষা কেবলমাত্র পুরুষের জন্য নয় শিক্ষা পুরুষের মতো নারীদের জন্য সমানভাবে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ প্রাথমিক শিক্ষা হলো প্রত্যেকে শৈশবের একটি অপরিহার্য অংশ এর মাধ্যমে এমন এক পরিবেশ তৈরি করা হয় যা পরবর্তীকালে ব্যক্তিকে মূল্যবোধ গড়ে তুলতে সাহায্য করে তবে যে সমস্ত পরিবারে শিক্ষাগত মূল্যবোধের অভাব থাকে সেক্ষেত্রে মেয়েদের খুব কম বয়সে বিয়ে দেওয়া দেওয়া হয় ও তাদের ঘরের কাজের মধ্যে সীমাবদ্ধ করে রাখা হয় তাদের আর্থিকভাবে স্বাবলম্বী হওয়ার জন্য উৎসাহিত করা হয় না অনেক পরিবারে মেয়েদের সুশিক্ষার আলো থেকে দূরে রাখা হয় অনেকে মেয়েদের শিক্ষা দেওয়াকে অপচয় বলে মনে করে পরিবারে ছেলে সন্তানদের প্রতি অতিরিক্ত মনোযোগ দেওয়া হয় পরিবারে ছেলে সন্তান থাকাকে বেশি প্রয়োজনীয় বলে মনে করা হয় মেয়েরা হলো পরিবারের অর্থনৈতিক দায়িত্ব মেয়েরা বিয়ে হয়ে শ্বশুরবাড়ি চলে যাবে বলে তাদের শিক্ষার জন্য খরচ করাকে পরিবারের লোকজন অপচয় ও অর্থনৈতিক ক্ষতি বলে মনে করে এই প্রকার চিন্তা ভাবনা হলো সমগ্র নারী জাতির অবমাননা এবং মানবিক মূল্যবোধের অবক্ষয় তাই খুব দুঃখজনক হলেও এ কথা সত্য যে আমাদের সমাজে নারীর প্রতি অবহেলা নারী শিক্ষার প্রতি উদাসীনতা নারী পুরুষের মধ্যে বৈষম্য ইত্যাদি নারীকে তার অধিকার থেকে বঞ্চিত করেছে তার ফলে সমাজে পুরুষতান্ত্রিকতা ক্রমশই বৃদ্ধি পেয়েছে যা নারীর ক্ষমতায়নে বাধা সৃষ্টি করেছে নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন হলো এমন এক অবস্থা যে অবস্থায় নারী তার জীবনের সমস্ত সিদ্ধান্ত গ্রহণ করতে পারবে এবং সকল ক্ষেত্রে তার স্বাধীন ও মর্যাদা সম্পন্ন অবস্থায় উন্নীত হতে পারবে তার প্রকৃত ক্ষমতায়ন তখনই হবে যখন সে কোনো বাধা ছাড়া নিজের ইচ্ছায় শিক্ষা ও কর্মক্ষেত্রে অংশগ্রহণ করতে পারবে এবং নিজের জীবনযাত্রার মান উন্নয়ন করতে পারবে নারীর জন্য শিক্ষা হলো প্রকৃত শিক্ষা যা এমন শিক্ষাই হলো হ্যালো নারীর জন্য এমন শিক্ষাই হলো প্রকৃত শিক্ষা যা তার পরিবারের প্রতি প্রতিটি সদস্যকে শিক্ষিত করে তুলতে পারবে আর এভাবেই এক সুন্দর সমাজ গড়ে তুলতে পারবে শিক্ষিত নারীরা স্বাধীনভাবে মত প্রকাশ করতে পারে এছাড়া তার পরিবার ও সমাজের ভালো মন্দ নির্ণয় করতে পারে শিক্ষিত নারী ঘরে বাইরে সমান দক্ষতার সাথে তার দায়িত্ব পালন করতে পারে নারী শিক্ষিত হলে রাজনৈতিক ও সামাজিক ক্ষেত্রে তার সিদ্ধান্ত গ্রহণের অধিকার প্রতিষ্ঠিত হয় শিক্ষার মাধ্যমেই নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের অধিকার নিশ্চিত হয় ক্ষমতার ফলে নারী তার চলার পথে সমস্ত বাধাবিঘ্ন নিমেষে অতিক্রম করতে সক্ষম হয় শিক্ষার উন্নয়ন শিক্ষা অর্জন শিক্ষার পরিবর্তন পাঠক্রম ও পাঠ্যসূচি প্রণয়ন শিক্ষক প্রশিক্ষণ ইত্যাদি নানা বিষয় হলো শিক্ষার ক্ষেত্রে নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের অন্তর্গত তাই নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন সমাজ রাষ্ট্র জাতির উন্নয়নের জন্য অনস্বীকার্য যা মানব সম্পদে গুণগত মান ও পরিমাণ বৃদ্ধিতে সহায়ক বর্তমান দেশের প্রকৃত উন্নয়নের জন্য নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের শিক্ষা ক্ষেত্রে তার তাদের অংশগ্রহণ খুবই গুরুত্বপূর্ণ প্রকৃত ক্ষমতায়ন ছাড়া নারী কখনোই পুরুষের সমান মর্যাদা লাভ করতে পারবে না আর 
তার উপস্থিতি ছাড়া আমাদের সমাজের প্রকৃত উন্নয়ন সম্ভব নয় তাই পুরুষের পাশাপাশি সমস্ত উন্নয়নমূলক কাজকর্মে নারীরও সমান অংশগ্রহণ কাম্য ক্ষমতায়নের ক্ষেত্রে মহিলাদের আগ্রহ থাকা উচিত প্লেটোর ভাষায় নারীর কাছ থেকে পুরুষের মতো কাজ আশা করলে তাকে অবশ্যই সমান শিক্ষা দিতে হবে নারীরা যদি প্রকৃত শিক্ষা লাভ করে তাহলে বিভিন্ন কুসংস্কার সামাজিক বৈষম্য অনাচার বঞ্চনা ইত্যাদি থেকে নারী জাতির মুক্তি পাবে নারী শিক্ষা নারীদের আত্মমর্যাদা আত্মসচেতনতা স্বাধীনতা ও স্বাধীকর অর্জনে সহায়ক শিক্ষা নারীর মনে সমস্ত সংকীর্ণতাকে দূর করে তাদের মনের উদারতা বিশালতা ও মহানুভবতার জাগ্রত করতে পারে একজন প্রকৃত শিক্ষিত নারী বিশ্বের বিভিন্ন বিষয়ে জ্ঞান লাভ করে করতে পারে তারপর নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন আরও দ্রুত সম্ভব হবে আমাদের বুদ্ধির বিকাশের মূল হাতিয়ার শিক্ষা শিক্ষার মাধ্যমে আমরা আমাদের ঠিক ভুলের বিচার করতে পারি শিক্ষার মাধ্যমে নারী আর লিঙ্গ বৈষম্য ও বৈষম্যমূলক নিপীড়নের বিরুদ্ধে রুখে দাঁড়াতে পারে শিক্ষাই নারীকে স্বাধীনভাবে সমর্যাদায় জীবনযাপনে অনুপ্রেরণা দেয় তাই নারীরা আজ সর্বত্র নিজের চেষ্টায় পৌঁছাতে সক্ষম হয়েছে এমন কোনো পেশা বাকি নেই যেখানে নারীর অংশগ্রহণ করতে পারিনি তাই তারা অর্থনৈতিক সমৃদ্ধি লাভ করেছে দৈনন্দিন জীবনের সকল ক্ষেত্রে নারী সফলতা সত্যি আজ ঈর্ষণীয় শিক্ষায় দীক্ষায় জ্ঞান বিজ্ঞানের চর্চায় তাদের সর্বত্র অবাধ বিচরণ আমাদের দেশ তথা জাতিকে উন্নতির চরম শিখরে পৌঁছে দিয়েছে নারীদের চরিত্রে অন্যতম একটি দিক হলো দয়া মায়া স্নেহ সেবা ইত্যাদি একজন নারী এই সকল বৈশিষ্ট্য নিয়ে জন্মগ্রহণ করে এরপর নারীরা যদি প্রকৃত শিক্ষিত হয় তাহলে তার ক্ষমতায়ন আর তাকে আরও মানবিক ও মহৎ করে তোলে নারীর মানবতা এই শিক্ষার প্রতিফলন ঘটে তার পরিবারের প্রতি আর এভাবেই পরিবার থেকে প্রসারিত হয় তার সমাজে ও জাতিতে ফলে একটি উন্নত কল্যাণকামী মানব জগতের উদ্ভব ঘটে তাই বর্তমান শতাব্দীতে মানব জাতির সামগ্রিক উন্নতির জন্য নারীকে শিক্ষিত হতে হবে কারণ নারীকে সক্রিয় অংশগ্রহণ ছাড়া পৃথিবীতে কোনো উন্নতি সাধিত হওয়া সম্ভব নয় তাকে শিক্ষিত করে এবং ক্ষমতায়নের মাধ্যমে যে সমাজ উন্নতির উন্নতি করতে চায় সেই সমাজের উন্নতি হবেই তাই আদর্শ সমাজ গঠনের ক্ষেত্রে অবশ্যই নারী শিক্ষা আবশ্যক নারী ক্ষমতায়ন গুরুত্বপূর্ণ নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের সাথে খুবই ঘনিষ্ঠভাবে সম্পর্ক আছে কর্মক্ষেত্রে নারীর অংশগ্রহণ এবং সামাজিক রাজনৈতিক অর্থনৈতিক ক্ষেত্রে নার তার ভূমিকা বর্তমান যুগে উক্ত ক্ষেত্রগুলিতে নারীর অংশগ্রহণ ও ভূমিকা বৃদ্ধি পেলেও তা কোনোভাবে সন্তোষজনক নয় বিশেষত নারী কর্মক্ষেত্রে অংশগ্রহণ পুরুষদের তুলনায় কম শিক্ষিত হলেও যে নারী সমাজে পুরুষের সমান মর্যাদা পাবে এমনটা নয় শিক্ষিত নারীও সমাজে বিভিন্ন বৈষম্যের শিকার হয় কারণ আমাদের সমাজের মানসিকতা হলো পরিবারের উপার্জন করতে পারে এমন ব্যক্তিরই কেবল মর্যাদা আছে তাই নারীকে কেবল শিক্ষিত হলেই চলবে না সমাজে নিজের অবদান রাখতে হলে তাকে অবশ্যই নিজের শিক্ষাকে কাজে লাগাতে হবে তাকে প্রকৃত ক্ষমতায়ন তার তখনই সম্ভব হবে যখন নারীরা অন্যের মুখাপেক্ষী না হয়ে কর্মক্ষেত্রে সর্বত্র অবাধ বিচরণ করবে এবং অর্থনৈতিকভাবে স্বাবলম্বী হবে কর্মক্ষেত্রে নারীর তার নারীরা তার মেধা ও শিক্ষার যথার্থ প্রয়োগ করে ক্রমশই দক্ষ হয়ে উঠবে বর্তমানে নারী শিক্ষার হার যথেষ্ট ঊর্ধ্বমুখী কিন্তু নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের জন্য কেবল শিক্ষার হার বৃদ্ধি পাওয়াই যথেষ্ট নয় নারীদের উচ্চ শিক্ষায় শিক্ষিত হয়ে কর্মজীবনে প্রবেশ করতে হবে পরিবার তথা দেশের উন্নয়নের জন্য নারীকে যেমন শিক্ষিত হতে হবে তেমনি উপার্জনে সক্ষম হতে হবে তবেই নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন সম্ভব আচ্ছা তবে এক্ষেত্রে সমস্যাও কিছু কম কিছু নেই মাতৃত্বের মতো গুরুত্বপূর্ণ দায়িত্ব নারীকে পালন করতে হয় ফলে অনেক সময় অনেক কর্মজীবী নারীকে সন্তান জন্মের পর কর্মজীবন ত্যাগ করতে হয় এক্ষেত্রে সমাজ ব্যবস্থা কর্মস্থল ইত্যাদি বিভিন্ন বিষয় অবশ্য দায়ী থাকে অনেক ক্ষেত্রে দেখা যায় নারীরা চাকুরিজীবী হয়ে আর্থিকভাবে স্বাবলম্বী হওয়ায় পরিবারে তাদের মর্যাদা ও কর্তৃত্ব বৃদ্ধি পায় কিন্তু অনেক পুরুষতান্ত্রিক পরিবার তথা সমাজ নারীর এই ক্ষমতায়নের পক্ষপাতি নয় আবার এমন অনেক শিক্ষিত চাকুরিজীবী নারী আছে যারা পুরুষদের উপর নির্ভরশীল থাকতে পারে বেশি পছন্দ করে ঘরকন্যার কাজে নিজেকে এতটাই ব্যস্ত করে ফেলে যে তারা নিজেদের পেশাগত দিককে অবহেলা করে অন্যের ওপর নির্ভরতা তাদের দুর্বল করে দেয় আর সেই দুর্বলতা সমাজে নারীকে পুরুষের অধীনস্থ থাকতে বাধ্য করে শিশুরা যদি ছোটোবেলা থেকে দেখে যে তার মা অন্যের ওপর নির্ভরশীল এবং কোনো বিষয় সিদ্ধান্ত নেওয়ার তার কোনো ক্ষমতাই নেই তাহলে শিশুদের মধ্যে এক অন্য প্রতিক্রিয়ার সৃষ্টি হয় অন্যদিকে একজন শিক্ষিত চাকরিজীবী মায়ের সন্তানেরা অনেক বেশি স্বাবলম্বী উন্নত মানসিকতার হয় তাদের মধ্যে অন্যের ওপর নির্ভরশীল না হওয়ার মানসিকতা তৈরি হয় ফলে সেই সব উন্নত মানসিকতার শিশুরাই বড় হয়ে লিঙ্গ বৈষম্যমুক্ত সমাজ করে তুলবে এ কথা আশা করা যায় এ প্রসঙ্গে শ্রীমুদা বুভার একটি মত উল্লেখযোগ্য তিনি মনে করেন যে 
নারীকে নিজের চেষ্টা করতে হবে পরসত্তা থেকে সসত্তায় উন্নীত হওয়ার আর এর জন্য চাই অর্থনৈতিক স্বাধীনতা পরিবারের সংকীর্ণতার বাইরে বেরিয়ে নারীকে আরও বৃহৎ কর্মক্ষেত্রে বিভিন্ন পেশায় নিযুক্ত হতে হবে নারীকে আরও সচেতনতার সঙ্গে সমাজ পরিবর্তনের ক্ষেত্রে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ ভূমিকা গ্রহণ করতে হবে তবে এর জন্য নারীকে অনেক সংগ্রাম করতে হবে কারণ পুরুষতান্ত্রিক সমাজ সহজে এই অধিকার তাকে দেবে না কিন্তু তা সত্ত্বেও আশা আমরা আশাবাদী আমরা আশা করি যে নারী একদিন মানুষ হিসাবে পরিচিত হয়ে পুরুষের সমান মর্যাদা অধিকার লাভ করবে সমস্ত বাধা বিঘ্ন অতিক্রম করে তাক অবশ্যই একদিন যেমন শিক্ষার আলোকে আলোকিত হতে হবে অন্যদিকে অর্থনৈতিকভাবে স্বাবলম্বী হতে হবে সমাজ তথা দেশের অগ্রগতির জন্য নারীকে পুরুষের সমান দায়িত্ব পালন করতে হবে সরকারি বিভিন্ন পদক্ষেপ কর্মক্ষেত্রে আন্তরিকতা পরিবারের সদস্যদের সাহায্য এবং সর্বোপরি নারীর অদম্য ইচ্ছাই শক্তি পারে নারীর ক্ষমতায়ন ঘটাতে থ্যাংক ইউ Okay, I now, I now invite the next speaker, Ivana Chaudhuri, to make her presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Ivana Chaudhuri. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I am going to give a PowerPoint presentation with your permission, sir. The paper I am presenting today is entitled Displaying the Multi-Prismatic Picture, Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni's Portrayal of Indian Women and Their Immigrant Voices in the Political Empowerment. As we know, migration has been a universal phenomenon of human civilization from time immemorial when it comes to the word diaspora, it is synonymously used for exile. But the word exile is different from the diaspora. Exile means forceful migration, whereas diaspora emerges due to voluntary movements. The term diaspora refers to the people who scattered from their ancestral land and settled in the freakish land. Diaspora writers convey their fluctuating condition between the birth land and new land. Diasporic writers, particularly women like Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni, often delve into these impacts. Next slide, please. Let's start this conversation with a beautiful quote by Viku Parekh, where he says, Bunny and tree making a new home in the host nation, but the roots not always permanently secure its roots in the alien soil. Some roots detach due to yearning and become desperate for home and to breathe their last in the native land. Next slide, please. So this paper will show how Divakaruni's literature gives voice to the silent stories of Indian immigrant women and how it painted the canvas of their existence with experiences of rootlessness, alienation, suppression and oppression. The characters of Divakaruni face racial problems for being a minority in foreign country. Next slide. Now the major writings. Now the major writings that we are going to discuss here are Sister of My Heart, as we can see in the slide. In, it was published in 1999. Followed by the sequel, The Vine of Desire, 2002. The protagonists in the story are the two sisters, Anju and Shudha, born on the same day, opening their eyes to the ill-fated death of their fathers, also brothers of the same family, Gopal and Bijoy, respectively, on a ruby exploration journey. The story narrates around these two women caught between tradition and modernity of the 1980s and their sisterly love for each other. They separate only on their marriages. Anju migrates to America with her husband Shunil and Shudha stays in India with Ramesh. The distance does not separate them emotionally but only physically as the communication goes on through letters. The sequel is the reunion of the two sisters in America. It begins with a tragedy of miscarriage, emotion and trauma of the separation of son Prem from her womb which ends in an abortion that made Anju unravel in bouts of depression. Anju feels the need for her sisterly support and also gives a change to Shudha's tormenting divorce. Shudha visits America with a hope to make a life for herself and 
for her daughter Daita. Here Divakaruni follows the trend showing America as the land of opportunities and a life saver from difficulties. But gradually this perception of America changed when Anju in spite of having freedom, education and job found her life as hollow and meaningless in America. On the other hand, Shudha loses faith in life and relationship because of the betrayal of her husband and her sister. After living in America for many years, she cuts off all her family ties. Her bitter experiences of both the native and foreign lands turns her into a creative writer. Next slide please. Now marriage and motherhood become torturous for her. Tradition tells her to worship her husband and in laws. Though they ask her to kill the child in the womb itself, a reformist in her asks to break the fetters of tyrannical and dominant hegemonic male tendency. She thinks killing the child in the womb is a great sin and a mother in her doesn't bear it at any cost. She ponders over these problems and comes to the conclusion that there, that there is no alternative for her but to leave her in-law's house. Shudha struggle for her own identity and independence is very firm as she doesn't depend on anybody. She doesn't accept any help either from Anju or her own father. Her rejection shows a determined and independent woman in her. She decides to support her daughter on her own. She faces many problems single-handed. She undergoes betrayal at every nook and corner at the hands of her own people. Her in-laws exploit her for everything she thinks is right. And multicultural level such as individual, social, transnational that has been focused by the novelist, by our novelist Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni. American freedom brings a bridge in her belief of Indian tradition. She consciously starts weaving tradition with its efficacy. She grows suspicious towards those Indian traditions that suppress and exploit women folk. Next slide, please. Some remarkable instances where Divakaroni has mingled the famous parts of America as well as the Indian popularities like Kanchipuram silk, all India Radio or Akashbani Kalikot, Tanjore paintings where Anju proudly says there is nothing like our Indian fabrics. The emotional communication through letters also expresses the family bonds, responsibilities and yearning for home. The novelist Divakaroni being an immigrant herself from a middle class educated family from Kolkata, she herself exemplifies own experience. She says, Quote unquote, as a woman and an immigrant myself, I have obviously experienced or at least observed many of the challenges, problems and the gains of immigration that I write about, says Diva Karoli. Now the co novel constantly focuses on the transcultural, the characters seem to be shuttling between two worlds. The expatriates initially try to adjust with the new culture and society into which they moved, but at the same time, they are not willing to follow the new land's culture completely. Next slide, please. Their dilemmas are manifold, born out of the friction between tradition and modernity, between the expectations of their original society and the demands of the new world they inhabit. Divakaroni wishes to make women free from the cocoon of exploitation and separation. From the reading of these two novels, we can understand that her writings depict this predicament of Indian women who struggles to come out of all exploitation and leads towards achieving social, economic, political and spiritual freedom of themselves to attain their selfhood, identity confidence, rights and empower in their lives. It is the need of the present world to boost and encourage women to set their own targets, fight for equal rights and make a conductive atmosphere for them. Life in the motherland is less problematic and there are a number of helping people nearby. Neeraj Agnihotri in his article Diaspora Consciousness in Sister of My Heart communicates that Banerjee's writing affirms 
that diaspora is not merely a scattering or dispersion who emigrated from India to America face the clash of opposing cultures, a feeling owed by attempts to adjust, to adopt and to accept. Only the degree of that adaptation differs according to the generations. Diva Karuni observes her culture and homeland objectively. It retreats as a reminder of her identity, thus analyzes the relationship of women with universal problems of discrimination, displacement, disturbance and disorder, thus articulating the diasporic consciousness in this work. As we see, Shudha's journey in finding her identity starts with treating herself as a human being equal to men. Indian society is predominantly patriarchal and Indian women are bound to four walls. In such a condition, she doesn't get to know about the world properly. And when such a woman migrates to another country, the situation gets even worse. Next slide, please. Last. I'm just in the conclusion part. So lastly, to conclude, we can remember the statement in an interview stated by our novelist Diva Karuni herself that the force behind her writings is the desire to put women in the center of stories, to have their voices be the voices of interpretation, their eyes the ones that we see through, there just hasn't been enough of that in the world if you look back at literary history. So they must come out of their inferiority complex, societal stereotyping, economic and spiritual dependency, all of which that weaken them in their journey of success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ivana, for completing uh, within maybe 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Uh, so uh, I am opening this to questions once again, if any or any kind of observation. Okay, we shall pass on to the next paper. It will be presented by uh, Shohini Ghosh, who teaches at Nilarini Dotto Mohavita Bit, and he is also a visiting faculty of the of Sister Nivedita University, Kolkata. Uh, the title of her paper is "The Story of She" by her, locating the female narrator in Adi Parva, churning the, of the uh, ocean by Amrita Patel. Thank you uh, to our chair, our honorable chair. And this would be the opportunity for me to thank Chanchol College, the Department of Economics, and Women's Cell, Center for Women's Studies, Raigon University. And um, a very warm afternoon to all the dignitaries present here, all my seniors, juniors, and fellow presenters. Um, so the uh, title that I, I, I'll just repeat my title, The Story of She, by her locating the female narrator in the Adi Parva churning of the ocean by Amruta Patil. So this is a graphic novel which has been made by Amruta Patil which is based on the first Parva of Mahabharata. So here uh, in the Anthropocene the world is being ravaged by wars all around us and um, consciousness is drowning in the virtual and the digital of a post-human epidemic. And in this backdrop, the telling and the retelling of stories in myriads of manners of deconstructing previous age-old stories becomes very important. Uh, Mahabharata is such a classic text which has been narrated by the male, for the male, uh, keeping, uh, and, and it is about kings and not about queens. So here, uh, though this, this entire text has been represented by many others visually, uh, uh, by Amar Chitrakatha, by uh, Shibaji Bandhupadha and Shankar Ghoshin Vyasa, by Grant Morrison, uh, Amrita Patil remains unique in her presentation of the duology, Adi Parva, Churning of the Ocean, and Soptic Blood and Flowers. So um, uh, she has uh, gained a lot of attention as a graphic novelist. And what is important is that she does not locate herself as an author. She says that she is, uh, the, the, the name that she uses on the cover page always uses the word via. That is the story is being told through her. And it is not she who is telling the story. So uh, uh, here, in the, in the first book, it is very unique that 
it is ganga who is made the narrator of the first book of mahabharata and not any sutradhar um, of of uh, i mean the vaisampayana or or any lineage of the say seers are being located here so we find that it is ganga the age old ganga the goddess okay the myth the mythological character ganga and we know how uh, mahabharata's women are always portrayed as some uh, as great women who are teachers who are always challenging men teaching them preaching and uh, and 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 ganga is one such character though a minor character in the entire um, book uh, so uh, uh, so this is a ganga is telling the story in a post war era and uh, who must begin from the beginning in the post war dystopian era people by people by widows childless mothers thieves and the mutilated ganga sits under the tree amidst a miscellaneous distrusting crowd to weave a new the story of mahabharata orally so here we find a uh, we we recall buddha we recall the age old seer sitting under the tree which has been uh, uh, appropriated by the woman here this is the ancient oral culture which is androcentric in nature and she is actually appropriating the role of vyasa vaisampayana and ugrasravas as narrators and this is a cosmic tale told by a cosmic woman so at the very beginning we find a lot of distrust emanating from all the all, all the listeners strange woman in white who is this woman sitting brazenly talking to strangers in the middle of the night etc etc but slowly she gains uh, i mean she she is uh, making her place very strong uh, a child says um, that she would look more beautiful when she opens her hair and uh, ganga is saying that uh, she would not open her hair because if she opens her hair she would look beautiful and people would look at her and not listen to her stories so this is again following judith butler the gender of ganga is not a fabricated or inscribed uh, gender on the surface of bodies her words acts and gestures do not create an illusion of an interior and organizing gender core in declining to perform to mime her gender she sets a pace a discourse of primary and stable identity and this identity is androgynous in nature almost she sits in the glory of a woman shedding off performance of being one hence representing the form of wisdom and adulterated by age or culture so again we move on to body as the site of commo uh, commodification as has been wonderfully brilliantly explored by professor sarkar and um, i i do not have now much to add to him Uh, except the fact that um, she uh, ganga is uh, ganga is presented as a young girl with a calm smile and control figure features uh, resisting insults but not indulging in the gender fabrications as wolston might have termed as anxious to be alluring mistresses than affectionate wives and rational mothers so we find that ganga is a mother but not by birth because she has already killed seven of her eight vasus she gives birth to and uh, she is saying that motherhood is a complex and continuous construct and uh, uh, it it is a term from here we come to that uh, to to the term matricentrism matricentric is a term that focuses on mother it is a word used to describe the connection between the mother and her child in the semiotic or pre edipal stage which the eldest daughter tries to mimic so riley in his introduction to the book uh, is using this term matricentric uh, the mother centered mode of feminism and um, she claims uh, and and patil is is supporting that she is deconstructing the myth that surrounds the concept of motherhood as something divine she is saying quote unquote love and nurture not vaginal contractions do make a mother i'll repeat love and nurture not vaginal con contractions do make a mother so again uh, we will we, we are coming to a post modern era where uh, mahabharata is being looked from a different angle we see the use of uh, uh, of of language which is very colloquial 
there are abuses used certain um, i mean certain certain words that appeal today they are being inserted constantly so this is a text which appeals which which is made for us for for the today and here we find that uh, she is saying with narratorial wisdom ganga is saying with traditional wisdom and ecological wisdom too she is saying i am ganga queen of celestial and earthly rivers i feed your land i raise the fish i cleanse you of soil and sin i carry the remains of the dead i plant stories i carry stories if you are too far away from my shore call any river by my name and i will i will be she i am your mother until the end of the world i will stand by you so the provider protector nurturer corrector forgiver and the transmitter of ancient knowledge that is ganga and in her what we have is the matrifocal narrative she is telling the story of her quote unquote the story of the mother in the plot of sons and daughters how she is playing her role uh she is she is again telling the story from um, uh, she, she it 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 begins with an it is very significant that it begins with an instruction uh, uh from vishnu go forth be their mother and that is how she begins she reprimands the thieves she scolds she brings people on path and she has a lot of uh, archaic knowledge to confer vedic knowledge to confer and then again uh, the uh, and and she is uh, again again talking about how uh, she it, ganga is becoming a very difficult place for her to live in because of the pollution that is coming up uh, and uh, as as i'm uh, shortening so here we also find the role of prakriti and purush where prakriti is the natural uh, all all the natural elements and purush consists of the entire uh, human consciousness so without this conscious intellectual drive of man of human rather the prakriti cannot be cleansed and that is how she is saying she is again saying that uh, she, she she is uh, bringing up the navigators of the universe as the age old sages she is saying luminous figures weave through the tale continuously so again we find that in her we find a balance of gender she is not an excess she is holding hers her place very strongly and not indulging in, in any kind of an excess she is even acknowledging the role of age old wisdom in the form of the sages the seers and the saints and uh, that is how the the feminism of patil is very very fluid and is plural in nature um and and at times ganga even saying uh, reprimanding someone is it the story that is endangered or is it your eyes man woman male female these are the ways to explain abstract concepts in a form you would recognize the realm of deva asur is beyond gender so she is again trying to move beyond gender and uh, here we find that uh, uh, a a a uh, blanket terminology uh, is being uh, avoided by her and we find the multiple um, uh, it, it does not foster on binaries or on equalities or differences between sexes but on a rather idea of wholeness leading finally to the figure of the cyborg in a world that is post gender and this is how she is initiating into uh, she is initiating and initiating into the androcentric orientation of the narrative a story told by a woman for everybody and not only the woman thank you thank you we have come to the end of this session and i i hope uh, there will be questions for her also if, if there are any there are questions okay i declare this session closed now thank you professor pinaki rai for uh, this what happened ekhane hi hobe to okay okay i am um, passing on the mic for the announcement 
Okay, uh, thank you, Shanjukta Di. Uh, just an announcement for the paper presenters. Uh, I don't know when, whether everyone is here, but there will be two parallel sessions now. Our last parallel session, our last technical session, uh, one will be held here, chaired by Professor Himadri Roy. The participants would be Masiur Rahman, Neha Shornokar, Tania Bal, Rajot S. Mondol, Dr. Ruby Dash, uh, Dr. M.D. Jahan Hussain, Dr. M.D. Jiaur Rahman. So all of you would be here. And uh, the other session running parallelly to this will be held in the union room, uh, in the ground floor. It would be chaired by Professor Pinaki Roy. And the participants are and uh, the participants there are Sentu Shil and Dhritiman Ganguli, Pritika Subba, Shananda Shen, Sabi Rehmat, Biplab Mondol, Shohini Ghosh, Ayevna Choudhury, Jomuna Dash. So, okay, so they have, they must have been in the online session. Okay. Okay. So, the, okay, okay. I have been asked to repeat the names of those in the union room, so I'll just repeat them. Shanunda Shain, Sabir Ahmed, Biplab Mondol, Shohini Ghosh, Ayavna Choudhury, Jomuna Dash. Okay? Asheni. Even, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Okay, okay. So, uh, please proceed, those of you in the union room session, and the other session will be here, chaired by Professor Himadri Roy. Ekhane jara presenter aache ki shobai? Masiur Rahman? Aisho? Stage aisho? I think there is a little bit of a miscommunication. I just want to know how many people are left for the presentation. Please raise your hand. What is your name, ma'am? Sultana Razia. And? Please come to the dais. Rajat, come to the dais. Hack them. Amra ekhane akshate kore nichi. So we, uh, what we are doing is because many presenters have already presented in the online mode, we have uh, two people right now, two three people right now, three presenters who would be presenting in the offline mode. Shultana Rajya, please come up. And Rajat, you also grace the stage. So I request Professor Himadri Roy to kindly act as the chairperson for this session. <coughs> and uh, I think we can start the session with Sultana. Sultana, please. Uh, uh, I'm handing over the microphone to Professor Hibat. Masiur or Bakiyachi? Masiur or Bakiyachi? And Bosch. Sultana, uh, you may start your presentation without much wasting time because you have trained to catch also. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Chachal College and Raigunj University for arranging this historical event. And uh, I would uh, like to thank all the faculty also for giving this opportunity to introduce myself. I am Shultana Rajya, a research scholar from English and Modern European Languages, University of Lucknow, Lucknow. And uh, uh, we all know that uh, the topic is gender and uh, the violence um, and uh, all about women empowerment uh, across the world which are really belonging in South Asia and my topics is and um, uh, you can say that my uh, title is politics of culture gender and violence as an invisible chain in Bama's Sangati actually we all know that um, all the difficulties and discrimination are actually based on the gender and my research paper will actually focus on the representation of gender and violence as invisible chain 
to show how gender influence our everyday life and be a cause of violence with the help of Bama's autobiography, Sangti. And um, rape, sexual assault, harassment, sex slip. Uh, selective abortion, sexual harassment in educational institutions, workplaces, honor killing, domestic violence, inequality, socioeconomic status, control over women's sexuality, everything based on gender. And uh, we all know that uh, from yesterday and today, our uh, respected professors uh, already discussed about all the things and uh, they uh, well uh, described uh, how these things are uh, actually influence gender and how uh, discrimination actually based on this topic um, and uh, we know that gender creeps into our day-to-day -day life so smoothly that we take it granted and accept it what is going on in our surrounding is natural and something that needs no explanation the development of gender roles and violence on the basis of gender often begins as early as infancy. It is not only the problem of any particular community or society, becomes a glaring issue across the world. We witness many violent incidents where gender plays an important role even today. Gender shapes the meaning of violent acts differently for men and women and that meaning varies depending on the situational and cultural context. Gender-based violence both reflects and reinforces inequalities between men and women and compromises the health, dignity, security, and autonomy of its victim. Gender studies interrogates how gender becomes a discriminating tool in the distribution of labor, care, property, income, education, and political process in general. It is important to understand how gender is and is not experienced in everyday life. For this purpose, we have to understand what actually sex and gender is. It is often difficult to understand exactly what is meant by the term gender. In what sense, it differs from the closely related term sex. While sex refers to the biological, physiological characteristics that are defined for men and women, gender refers to the array of socially constructed roles and relationships, traits, attitudes, behavior, values, and relative power and influence that society ascribes to the two sexes. And while these things are um, minutely explained um, by Bama, she actually described male hegemony and dominant attitude towards women. Uh, we can see that female are actually um, face discrimination and uh, violence in their family, um, uh, in the working places, in the educational institutions, when they are trying to earn their wages also. In the family under the uh, patriarchal tradition, women have always been brutally treated by men. Women are subjected to mental torture and violence at home. In our daily life, everywhere we can feel gender discrimination, violence, which are basically perpetrated on women. Bama shows gender discrimination and violence, which start at the time of baby's birth, within quote and unquote, when they are infant in arms, they never let the boy babies cry. If a boy baby cries, he is instantly picked up and given milk. It is not so with the girls, even with breastfeeding. It is the same story. A boy is breastfed longer. With girls, they whim then quickly, making them forget the breast. If the boys catch an illness or a fever, they will run around and nurse them with the greatest care. If it is a girl, they will do it half-heartedly. Even uh, um, females or women have to face various type of superstition on, and social rituals when their menstrual cycle starts. Little heart-like room inside the house were made by 
uh, the relatives and the people and they have to stay there for 16 days at the time they are neither allowed to go outside for doing any work nor allowed to do any sorts of work inside the house they had to rub themselves with turmeric and have a bath every day where a freshly washed sari that's why i think that's why simon de Beauvoir, a feminist author really state that um one is not born a woman rather becomes a uh, becomes one in her a uh, widely renowned book, The Second Sex. And in the novel, Bama's novel, we can see that one of the female character who is the protagonist of the novel, uh, she, is going, uh, she was going to face the molestation against her and uh, the landowner was falsely accused her in front of the village panchayat and nobody was uh, uh, ready to hear her uh, um, um, speech that uh, he didn't, uh, she didn't uh, uh, commit any type of uh, mistakes or crime. Still, she has to face uh, um, honor, cri uh, honor crime, uh, what we can say, and uh, she has to pay uh, a compensation against uh, all the things which is uh, falsely accused against by her. And um, women face domestic violence and intimate partner violence also, which already talked about uh, by all the professors and the renowned uh, people and which is a glaring issue all over the world and in the south asian countries also and in the novel we also can see that thai is the lightest skin woman in the narrator's entire area but there was not a single day when she was not beaten by her husband people of her locality made a lot of fuss against her and forced her into marrying a man she didn't like from this, you can say that women doesn't have to choose their intimate partner also. They didn't give uh, the to, uh, total privilege or prior privilege to choose their uh, partner also. And uh, from this point of view, if someone uh, came to protest these situations, so he became more furious and uh, have to face various type of retortion and within quote and unquote who are you to speak for this monday she is my wife i can beat her or kill her if i wish you go and mind your own business then he abused thai some more you come on home you any passing loafer will come in support of you you motherfuckers daughter you will go with 10 men he began abusing her and beating her even more violently. We can see that men and women work together in the field and various uh, sector, but women never get the same wages like men. Men can do what they wish to do their wages but uh, with their wages but women are bound to fulfill their household responsibilities although both men and women came home after hard work in the field the men went up straight away to the bazaar coming home only for their meal but as for women from the minute they returned home washed vessels cleaned the house collected water gathered firewood went to shop to buy rice and other things boil some rice and fed husband and children before they eat and go to bed. The women never got proper rest and peace after working hard because at night they have to please their husband also. A woman is told she must stay with her husband until she dies and put up with every kind of torture. Even she can't go back to her parents' house they never get opportunity to choose a man according to her heart and live happily with them. If they dare to do this, they have to face severe humiliation and torture. Whatever a woman does or achieves, society give it no credit. It, uh, the only reason is that she was born a woman. And Bama clearly said in her novel that if you are born into this world, it is best for you. You were born a man, born as a woman, what good do we get? And um, I know time are very short and I'm coming uh, at the conclusion part. And um, Bama basically focused 
the male supremacy and violence by the men against women of a community. We have seen um, uh, from the above discussions how gender and violence go hand in hand in South Asian context, which mainstream feminists uh, uh, fail to understand. The growing number of horrendous crime can only be addressed uh, from the feminist standpoint also, in general, women have been perceived as the repositories of chastity, virginity, modesty, and honor. Patriarchal control over women has been exercised and justified in the name of protecting the owner of the family community. Lots of social and cultural factors exist to show the position of South Asian women different from that of their counterparts in the world. Gender-based violence is described as violence that shows the existing imbalance between men and women that perpetuate the subordination and de-evaluation of, uh, sorry, devaluation of women. This violence exists within the patriarchal framework which denies women's rights and reproduces the existing imbalance and inequality between the sexes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sultana, for making it crispy and short and pointing out exactly what you wanted to talk about gender and violences in Shanghati. Now, the important fact is you have pointed both uh, the family violence that occurs within the domain of domestic sphere as well as the intimate partner, which is very private. And it is very interestingly carried out across the, your presentation. Thank you so much. If there is any question from the... Ajudha, you have any question? You please put up your question then. It was a wonderful presentation. Well, obviously, gender is not natural. It is a constructed man-made. I would like to elaborate that. Uh, why uh, only women are considered inferior while comparing to men? Am I audible? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. 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 thank you. Actually, the, we do not want to consider women as inferior than men. But in the novel, ba Bama actually tried to explain the position of women, how culture and the cultural context will actually explain the position of women. And uh, she tried to explain uh, how uh, every day they have to face discrimination, how they have to face um, uh, violence in the working place, in the family. Uh, this is the point I am trying to explain here. And um, uh, this doesn't mean that I am trying to explain uh, women as inferior than men. This is uh, it doesn't actually mean that. Actually, uh, in the novel, Bama actually tried to explain all the positions and all the situations uh, faced by the women. That is the thing, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Ayodhya, for the question. Uh, yes. Because we are almost very sorry for interrupting the session, but we have only two more two more presenters. Actually, two last presenters of the uh, two-day international conference. So I would just like to take this moment uh, to say that uh, uh, thank you, everyone, and we shall have a valedictory session uh, at the end of it. But right now, I just want to say thank you to certain people. I think they are still online. One of them is here, who is uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Jadav. Yes. Okay, okay. You still have not presented. Okay, okay. We'll arrange that. I thought because your names were being announced, maybe you were not here that time. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, oh, yes, four of us are here. Uh, I don't know, but then you announced the names, right? Yeah. Okay, so then please come up and uh, is that the who are the ones who have not? Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, thank you, Aj Ajodhya. Uh, Ayodhya. We call Ay Ajodhya in my Ayodhya, mother tongue. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Jadav. Thank you. And uh, I think we will continue to meet online many times, many more times. Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. I also would like to thank Professor Nagaratna Parandi. I don't know if she is there. She is the chairperson, Department of English. Uh, Rani Chennamma University of Karnataka. She had on a very short notice, uh, on a very short notice, she has helped us today. So thank you very much, ma'am. And uh, 
I would also like to thank Professor Zinia Mitra. Zinia Mitra, who is the director, Center for Women's Studies at uh, University of North Bengal, who also did this honor and she had chaired an online session. Sorry for saying all these things in the middle of the session because I'm very worried about the network issues. So I would like to hand over to Sir for the next. Without wasting time, those who are left out, please come over on the stage. Uh -huh, time. Everyone now will have seven minutes of their presentation. Uh, now we'll uh, come, come, not from the, that side, from this side. Come over, come over, come over. Don't worry, we are here. We'll be, anyway, I'm chair, so I can't leave. All four of you join. Yes, we will start with uh, Rajut. Uh, Rajut, you make your presentation very short and crispy. Yes, I have a few slides. Five, six slides, okay. You want to show the slides and go ahead or you want to read out? Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, Rajat. By the way, Rajat is a research scholar of Raigonj University. So here, Rajat, you. Uh, uh, before, first thing first, I want to congratulate uh, Chachol College and, and uh, Raigonj University and my heartfelt gratitude to both the institutions. Uh, for allowing me to present myself in this in wonderful international uh, conference. Now, uh, before wasting absolutely any more time, uh, I would like to go to my first slide. My paper is titled uh, Umbang, Wimpud, Umad. Yes, these are the titles. History of Webs. Now, these are not my words. These wonderful words uh, were used by a very famous, almost notoriously famous uh, uh, writer, J.K. Rowling. And in her tweets, uh, can I have the slides, uh, sir? Yes. Uh, J.K. Rowling, uh, just please uh, go back to that. I won't take more than a second. OK, uh, share that tweet. Uh, she retweeted, repeat after us, trans women are women. It was shared in 171023. Next slide. I'll, I'll share the slides first. Right. Okay. This is, I'm not going to go through them. These are uh, pictures of uh, bathrooms or toilets or washrooms for trans people. Now, these uh, bathrooms and washrooms uh, are something that uh, one of the English uh, daily newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, is uh, is up in arms against. I, I will explain why. Uh, because there are plenty of rape cases. I would quote rape cases in those bathrooms and washrooms, as if all the rapes are committed by only trans women. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is again uh, uh, advocation for unisex bathroom or at least bathroom for uh, washroom for, uh, uh, for people who fail to identify with the uh, sex assigned to them and their sex and gender category do not necessarily correspond. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, she told me women only and this is, this is written outside. Uh, many public spaces, women only. Uh, I uh, would love to understand what does that phrase mean, women only. Next. Okay, cis is ideological language uh, signifying belief in, in okay, I'm not, uh, because of the time crunch, I'm not going to read them. Uh, and, and I will, I will uh, talk about that. Are we, are we done or do we have any other slides? I think one more uh, that will do. Can I have the last slide kindly? Uh, it's really sad that you think a rapist is going to be stopped by a sign on a door. Okay, fine. Fine, thank you. Thank you, I'm done with my slides. Okay, uh, when, uh, I will come back to those slides by the end of the talk. Okay, when a child is born, uh, when a child is born, uh, we apply uh, usually a couple of sexes to that child. 
but the problem with the application is that now this is important the problem with the application is that that is not necessarily based on the genitalia that is not necessarily based on the genitalia that is based on how the genitalia is read that is based on how the genitalia is regarded that is based on how the genitalia is considered let me cast my mind on a 2014 uh, uh, anecdote in uh, i think one of the countries in latin america i don't remember probably it's i'm sorry i, I can't remember the name of the country where it trans couple became uh, parents i won't use the word father and mother because both the words are extremely transphobic and and and, and because they, the, the the problem with that the wife impregnated the husband now the husband was expecting their first child and the husband had uh, ovary and the wife uh, uh, retained a penis. Obviously, they were trans men and trans women. Now, what to call them? What to call them? Now, if a male genitally, I'm quoting, 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 quoting in, if a penis is found in a woman's body, then does that organ still remain male genitally? If a uh, if a uh, vagina is found on a f uh, male body, then does that vagina does that vagina still remain a female genitalia? Now it becomes a free-floating signifier. It becomes a free-floating signifier. You know, almost gender therefore becomes almost like a circus tent. Almost like a circus tent. It can be uh, put up on a any ground on a, any what should I call any sexed body, right? And therefore. Uh, any sex body can uh, corroborate with any kind of gender, and there is no relationship between the uh, between the uh, correspondence of sex and gender. And 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 therefore, uh, I would go back to my slides because there was an amazing English newspaper uh, that's called the Daily Telegraph, uh, and which was. Uh, it's a very right-wing newspaper, uh, and it's raising its war cry against a, a, a Stonewall uh, magazine, Stonewall magazine in England. Now, what was Stonewall doing? Uh, Stonewall uh, was uh, creating awareness for gender-neutral toilets, gender-neutral bathrooms, gender-neutral washrooms in shopping malls, in public places, in everywhere, in schools colleges, universities, everywhere in many public spheres. So, and there, those awarenesses uh, are something that didn't go down well with, with the Daily Telegraph. Now, now, Stonewall was creating also another kind of awareness is that they were raising war cry against calling people uh, father and mother. They were saying that we better use the terms like parents or people who give birth to. Because the problem with uh, parents, I'm sorry, the problem with father and mother is that what to identify with the body who has uh, conceived a child who has penis? What to con consider that body? If I call that body mother, there's a problem. If I call that body father, there's a problem. So it's very uh, unfair on the trans bodies to use such gendered and sexist comments because they are still camouflaged within asymptomatic patriarchy. Uh, and the problem with asymptomatic patriarchy is very much like asymptomatic COVID patient. It's infected, but you still don't know where the contagion is coming from. So therefore, uh, uh, I am extremely uh, uh, saddened with the tweets of such a wonderful popular sir can i take one more minute uh, uh, i i am extremely i am not i am sorry i am extremely sorry uh, 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 that uh, uh, such a responsible uh, novelist like jk rowling uh, keeps uh, uh, tweeting and retweeting and one tweet that i have not shared i would like to quote it was shared by Rowling on Women's Day in 2020. And it's still in, his, in her official Twitter handle. And the quote is that, 
I'm quoting Rowling. Let's be united, all those who menstruate. Let's be united. I'm quoting, this is not me saying this. This is, I'm quoting Rowling, Rowling, whatever the pronunciation is, I don't know. The Rowling, uh, J.K. Rowling. And she wrote, let's be united, all those. And we had wonderful paper, papers yesterday on, on uh, Mashik, on Ritu Chakra, on Mashik Dharam, uh, towards the back end of the first day. Uh, and I was wondering uh, uh, about these things. It's fine, this getting together uh, of people who menstruate. But is this not another way of excluding all those women who are not cis, who are not heterosexual, who are not married, who are not uh, mother of children, and what about those women? Are they not part of feminism, the grand narrative of Western subversion? If this is how feminists are going to behave, then they, I'm sorry to say this, then they are dishing out the same kind of treatment that patriarchy had dished out to women. Now, therefore, we need to broaden the very category of womanhood beyond cis, beyond heterosexual women, beyond married heterosexual women suffering under domestic violence. Because there are many women who are neither cis, nor married, nor women with children, and definitely to remember my favorite writer, J.K. Rowling, neither menstruates. So therefore, there are women. They, these women are still available who do not menstruate. And they are still women. They are as much women as cis are. Thank you so much. And I request, I humbly request uh, the house and everyone, and I put my neck out, say, we need, we do not need gender sen sensitization. We need gender diversity sensitization. We need to be more inclusive across more sub-layers, more and more sub-layers of womenhood, and then the women empowerment would be uh, affected in the true sense of the term. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raju. That was excellent by presenting this way. And uh, you have uh, really sex to the body, what we call. Uh, according to Vivian Namaste, you have sex to the body here. And talking about transphobia and trans body is really amazing to talk about neutrality of toilets, neutrality, asymptomatic patriarchy, and many things you have brought. And especially critiquing Rowling is very important these days because uh, Rowling is, I feel from my understanding, Rowling is a very heterosexist misogynist uh, because when you read her vacation days, it is a very misogynistic novel. Anyway, we pass uh, to the third presenter. Uh, what's your name? Shanunda Shain. Uh, now Shanunda Shain will be presenting her paper. Uh, Shanunda, uh, I don't know your title and all. You want to present from there, standing, or you want? Stand. Okay. You have any PPTs? Oh. Introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Shanunda Shain. I'm from Heritage uh, College, Kolkata. I teach philosophy over there. So the title of the paper is uh, "Can AI be a means to gender equity?" A discussion. So uh, the, the main contention of my article is to find out two questions, whether uh, it is uh, safe to depend on AI, does it reinforce gender stereotypes, and secondly, does it help in empowering the woman? So before addressing these questions, let us talk about, just see what is AI all about. And as you can see in the presentation, I have tried to define what AI is. And mainly, you know, we all are talking about AI nowadays, how it is making our lives quote unquote easy, and the various fields they are being used nowadays. Sorry. Okay. So, in many developed countries, as I have mentioned here, for example, in Japan, you can see that 
uh, there are no stuffs in various departmental stores and where all you can go and buy the things by yourself. You do not need someone to be there. So as a result, you can see that the employees are also losing the jobs. As we are advancing, there is also a, a loss in the employ employment rate. And but people are also optimistic about it. As for example, we can quote here feminist uh, Donna Haraway, who has worked immensely in the field of cyborg feminism who is really optimistic about transcending this gender binary with the help of using this AI. Now the question is, is it safe to depend on AI as we, as we have seen and nowadays the cyborg fraud is in increase, privacy of data is compromised, okay, and as Virginia Eubanks, one of the feminists, you can see what she has to say about the artificial intelligence. And the other system in India where the population is being converted into a machinable reading data, machine readable data, sorry. Now what, what are the impact on gender as far as AI is concerned? Now many feminists are of the opinion that they lead to gender imbalances. The culture, the diversity, the diversity is missing. There is a tendency to homogenize and it's being already dominated by men the subjective factors like emotions they are not in in place the chatbots uh, which are usually uh, believed to be genderless they are in female voice and there is a whole trend going on which is called the feminization of robots and which is being accepted in the male dominated society and you can see various films where the robots are mainly female and who are serving the men's interests. Now, as a result, we can see that uh, the feminists are saying that uh, the, they are being filtered out in the, from the domain of employment and in the case of lending money also, they are being discriminated and in the case of face recognition also, not only the women but also the black marginalized men, they are being misrecognized. Now the feminists, there are, uh, the feminists are not unanimous regarding this view. Some are for it, some are against it. Like for example, uh, feminist Erika Hayasaki, who is really concerned about the misuse of the technological advancement. And uh, always these points are being uh, discussed that there is under-representation, misrepresentation of the data. Uh, it is not context sensitive in nature. Yet we can use this uh, intelligence to recruit people, to educate, and as well as to rethink the power structure. So in nutshell, we can see the problems. It misses out the cultural diversity. It, ten it is a tendency towards homogenization, bias towards marginalized people, and it lacks sensitivity, visibility, and, re and to give respect to people belonging from different communities. Now, the last slide of mine is, um, can we use it in a gender sensitive way? Yes, we can use it, but for that we have to uh, really be conscious. So uh, it has to include more women, their perspectives, their lived experiences, which, is, which are missing. And to talk about the culture of inclusivity, heterogeneity, and in this way we can lead towards a uh, transform transformative power of feminism. So uh, there is a need of, uh, which I would like to conclude, that there is a need for artificial intelligence. And uh, the feminists are talking about feminist artificial intelligence, FAI, to address the gender bias in the present context. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Shananda. This is uh, quite interesting to see that uh, in the place where we call that cyberspace is quite gender neutral but you have pointed out that there's a, it is not it is rather very insensitive towards the gender representations and you have uh, obviously uh, made Mindy Su's uh, comments uh, argument very clear that uh, the constructionism of gender in uh, cyberspace is not that easy which Haraway is, was also pointing out before but uh, what Sadia Plant says is uh, AI is uh, that we are talking about AI and its advancement for uh, implementing gender sensitivity and inclusivity, probably that will fail uh, Sadia Plants uh, and Ghazala's, both of their argument is that, that if you place them uh, on um, uh, uh, AI platforms, probably they will be copied 
quote unquote i'm using that word copied and may be used abused and misused all the time thanks a lot sananda now would i request mashur rehman to present his paper uh, he is a research scholar in raiganj university thank you sir for giving me an opportunity to present my paper in this international seminar and thank you ma'am sir of chachal college and raiganj university i am mashur rehman presenting my paper titled women's position in partition of india referring the text khushwan singh's trend to pakistan and mantoj kholdo a feminist approach khushwan singh known as one of south asian distinguished scholar with worldwide fame wrote in english language his magnum opus trend to pakistan is an instance of multicultural culturalism in india in this novel singh shows contemporary society and its partition where we can find discrimination against women on the other hand sadat hasan manto is an influential and controversial urdu writer renowned for his distinct and bold style in south asian literature in his short story called he presents a traumatically widowed father desperately seeking his missing daughter it amplifies the feminist discourse with a focus on the heinous crimes committed against women during partition mantoj works delves into the realities of life tackling themes like partition sexuality and the human condition here in these writings women are depicted as uh, submissive and an instrument of pleasure in other words they are more passive obedient dependent all kinds of activities in this attempt is to prioritize women discrimination during the partition of india through a feminist approach and also exploring how the authors depict the struggles and agency of women among these among among these uh, tumultuous events i want to say few words on historical context it was the great, greatest mass movement of humanity in history in the days and months leading up to partitioning partitioning of india in august 1947 near about 14 million people moved and 2 million people died as the new nation of pakistan was created the the borderline was arbitrary and artificial established in the in haste by a british barrister called cyril radcliffe and in trying to slice india along religious lines it turned from a muslim hindu and sikh friends and neighbors against each other in this respect historian kavita daya observes in india during the movement of partition that says quote after august 16 1946 ethnic riots involving hindus sikhs against muslims escalated all over the subcontinent the first historical novel of kushan singh trend to pakistan also titled as mano majra provides a, a vivid portrayal of impact of partition on women in this classical novel kushan singh tells about sikhs and muslim who lived together in peace for 100 years the novel is based on the hindu muslim riots of uh, 1947 which followed the partition of india it depicts the bitter and dirty truth of indian independence which we call division the novel actually uh, based on the main characters uh, mano majra it is a fictional village on the border of pakistan and india and in and is known for its railway station the novel introduces bhai mit singh who is fat usually was dirty and the caretaker of the town uh, gurudwara other characters are hukum chand uh, jagat singh actually most of the characters in the novel are male uh, characters there are only two female characters in the novel who manage to have some space in the novel they also are not much important in the novel uh, the first is nora the object of jagat's passion and second is hasina who is described as an object of the last 
for bureaucrat Hakim Chand, sorry, Hukum Chand. All the novels revolves around uh, a male thought. One can hardly find a woman in the novel. Women are described as weaker sex at a point in the novel. This shows the existing social condition. Uh, Hukum Chand says, quote, I know it all. Or our Hindu women are like that, so pure that they would rather commit suicide than let a stranger touch them. We Hindus never raise our hands to strike women, but these Muslims have no respect for weaker sex. Unquote. Women in the novel are represented as an object of sex. Apart from this, they have nothing of any significance. Nora is an object of sex for Jagat Singh. Their scene of love making is described in three pages. After having sexual intercourse with Nora, Jagat asked her whether she still will come tomorrow. This shows how he is obsessed with sex for Nora. Hasina, a 19 years old Muslim girl, is used as sexual sexual object by Hukum Chan. The magistrate has paid for her. The intimate scenes of Jagga and Nora and Hakim Chand and Asina are described simultaneously. So I'm just skipping. Uh, here actually women embody the resilience and suffering of women as she copes uh, with the loss of her family and identity. Singh highlights the vulnerability of women in a society torn apart by the religious and political divisions and partisan disturbs traditional gender roles, leaving women like Nora to navigate a landscape on uncertainty. I'm just skipping. And also, uh, the partisan is brutal and bloody. Uh, and to Sadat Usain Manto, a Muslim journalist, short story author, and Indian film screenwriter living in Bombay, it appeared ma uh, uh, maddeningly senseless. Manto was already an established writer before August 1947, but the stories he would go on write about partisan would come to cement his reputation. Uh, I'm just skipping. Uh, I'm just briefing the story where we can find the partisan of women uh, and the position of women in partisan. Koldo, uh, 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 short history of uh, Sadhatusan Manto, challenged the discourse of nationalism and problematizes it by bring, bringing forth the idea that nationalism is a discourse on optimized by the patriarchal ideology, Nationali nationalism is co-opted to uphold the patriarchal setup with an extension marginalizes women. This is done through a set of fine-tuned techniques of microphysics of power, as suggested by Foucault. These microphysics of power allow for the uh, institutional institutionalization and normalizations of patriarchy. This uh, centralizations men oil marginalizing and silencing women. I'm just finishing. Both uh, text underscore the importance of giving voice to women's experiences during partition. Here Nora, resilience and Sakinaj ordeal become powerful symbols of women agency and victimization, demanding a feminist critique to dismantle ingrained biases. By examining the narratives through a feminist lens, we unravel the layers of oppression that women faced and highlight their often overlooked contribution to shaping the course of history. By examining these texts through a feminist lens, we recognize the need to amplify women's voices and acknowledge their agency amid the chaos of historical events. Thank you for this. Thank you, Masur, for keeping your sh presentation very short and talking about partitions of feminine body and also not uh, making them objectification and rather subjectifying their body, not for a lust, but something more to it. And uh, I would not comment much on it. And I would pass the mic to the next presenter. What's your name? Together. OK, you will be presenting together. Okay. Sir, we 
thank you to all of my uh, teachers and uh, all of you present here uh, title of the paper uh, is gender development and women empowerment in selected south asian countries a comparative studies uh, corresponding author sent to sil and hitiman ganguly we are both the presenters uh, uh, we are a phd research scholar department of economics university of gorongo Women empowerment uh, has been a burning issue in South Asian countries, namely India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Maldives. Over the last decades, the health and education policies of these countries are, have been constructed in such a way uh, that can be helpful for redu reducing gender inequality and promoting women empowerment. This study provides a comparative analysis of gender development and the status of female related to males in selected South Asian countries, uh, which are mentioned above, for 1990 to uh, 2021. This analysis is based on some well recognized indicators like education, attainment, health status, income, labor force participation. Gender development and gender inequality indices, GDI and GEII, that is Gender Development Index and Gender Inequality Index, which are actually chosen to highlight aspects of gender inequality and inequality and development. When it comes to women uh, empowerment, it is not fundamentally about only economic empowerment, it is uh, also uh, social and political empowerment. The term empowerment encompasses so many dimensions of which economic dimensions are subset. So here we are uh, uh, only uh, uh, encompasses on economic empowerment. We know that there are some uh, deprivation associated with women in uh, the entire third world varying proportion. Whether it is crime against women, whether it is about their nutrition, whether it is about their education or their participation in labor force, whether it is about uh, level of education that they tends to attend. So there are uh, many aspects of this which are against the woman. Apart from this, we will have to take care of health of women in that we will have to study which diseases women suffers from generally. And within uh, that, uh, what is the incidence of anemia, particularly other respiratory diseases? What is the incidence of uh, antenatal, postnatal care of women? So when it comes to assessing the uh, atrocities against women, we will have to look into the notion of professor, uh, which are given by Professor A.K. Uh, Sen, uh, that is missing women, uh, problem of missing women. And uh, in that way, we may be interested in visiting the sex ratio of female male ratio, whether it is adverse or not, that is important. The unique next uh, of this study, of our study, is that we want to uh, explain the gender inequality in a uh, disaggregated way. The next part uh, will be developed, uh, represented by my Diti Van Gangu. In this study, we use the time series data set of well recognized indicator of the female health status. Here, here first, uh, the among the indicators, the life expectancy as female in difference from the male is measure of a indicator of the health. The education attainment of the of the female is measured by the mean year of schooling and the labor force participation as a female as a share of male is measure of the female participation rate. It is pertinent to mention that the higher value of the ratio female to male labor participation implies a significant number of the women are engaged in the economic activity as compared to male. Similarly, the income status of the female as compared to male is measured by the ratio of the female to male per capita G GNI. Uh, the data set of the selected variable is collected from the UNDP Human Development Report and in this study we explored this and analyze this data by using the gra graphical and tabular presentation. Among this, this and this uh, now we present the discussion. Uh, first we, we explored the health status of the women in South Asian countries. The gender development and women empowerment are closely associated with the women health status in the society. 
in this study among the indicators of the health status we use uh, come to your findings and conclusions conclusions findings and conclusions okay, okay. whatever you have found find okay. from this okay uh, i just uh, explain this bar diagram where portray the actual picture here we show the uh, here you see that among the countries the sri lanka has the highest uh, life expectancy of female compared to male and after that which is 8.7 years and after that the pakistan is 3.2 years and after bhutan nine uh, 3.2 and following them and uh, india bangladesh and lastly the maldives has lowest 1.8 year gap between female and male life expectancy and in the next section we explore the yeah, women education which is explained by my co-author is sent to shield uh, here uh, uh, bar diagram please go the bar, bar diagram huh. among the various indicators mean year of schooling uh, is con considered the best indicator to uh, represent the status uh, of women empowerment by uh, taking average of the uh, ratio over the period it is seen that sri lanka is in the highest position in terms of mean year of schooling uh, with uh, 0.92 and the second position is taken by bangladesh uh, followed by uh, bhutan uh, india maldives uh, and then uh, pakistan and nepal so nepal uh, nepal is uh, worst condition uh, with Zero point four four in terms of educational attainment. Go. And the next part is uh, presented by uh, Dhriti Man. Hmm. Now the we now I am explain the labor force participation of the South Asian countries. Here we explain the bar diagram and we see that the Nepal has highest female participation rate compared to male because. In the uh, uh, initial 90s or early 90s, the female uh, the, the participation in labor forces mainly arise arise due to the higher uh, the migration of the male workers from looking for better op employment opportunities or uh, the delayed retirement of the, the older women and uh, the low school attainment of the girls. And over the time, government initiated various opportunities to improve the status of the women, and they are gradually in increase the participation in the over the time. Similarly, the Bhutan government also introduced various initiatives like a uh, short and medium scale industries. In uh, as per the Asian Development Bank report 2016, the women in the total 36% of short and medium scale industries were operated or owned or managed by the women. Over the time. Mm, the royal government also introduced several initiatives to uh, encouragement or in, uh, engage the participation of the labor force. And lastly, the we explain the lowest of the lowest participation in the labor force is Pakistan. And lastly, the in, we explain the income status. Similarly, like in labor force participation, income is also highest in the case of the Nepal, and the least is the, uh, the Pakistan. Now we conclude this section. In the overall view, we see that the in case of the in health and education, the Nepal, Sri Lanka is the highest position. And in terms of the health and education, in terms of the health and education, in terms of the health and education. Uh, the the uh, Sri Lanka occupied the highest position, and following them Bhutan, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, and Maldives respectively. Beside the women participation in labor force and income is highest in Nepal, and following them Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Maldives, and Bangladesh, and lowest is Pakistan. Now, beside we also. Now we. Okay, sir. On the other hand, in gender e the development and e gender inequality index, the Maldives and Sri Lanka has the highest gender development uh, and least uh, is, is, uh, in the South Asian countries is Pakistan. In the most of the South Asian countries, the gender equality inequality reduced 
but the standard of living is not main the satisfactory because it, it depend on the several factors like cultural factor regional factor socio economic factor etc now we have conclude this section <laughs> thank you to all of my teachers thank you thank you uh, dritiman and shentu both of you uh, you have covered the uh, five uh, topics especially schooling life expectancy labor force uh, uh, income and health and education right sri lanka you have said that uh, stands highest. up highest in both the thing but life expectancy is also highest over there uh, and therefore you try to look out what happens that within the health and being education at the top most why life expectancy is little lower there yes shonjukta you had some question uh, sorry, uh, मेडिकल फेसिलिटी If we see the HDI index or GDI index, we see the the like Sri Lanka is higher. I understand, but did you go behind the socio-political or socio, uh, you know, socio-economic factors behind it? Means all of a sudden, an economy does not invest on anybody unless it gets something back from it. Yes. No. So yes. I think that is it. Is it like you want the women to be more uh, uh, live longer, live longer, live no, longer, and live longer? Health is. Uh, Life expectancy is not an appropriate measure, but it has several indicators of the health status. And also become the uh, reproduce as well as become the participant in the labor force, huh. so that it contributes to the GDP of the country. Yes, labor force participation and but GDP. But that is not women empowerment, isn't it? Women are being used, isn't it? No, we just provide a comparative study in overall outlook, not just a. I know, I know, I know, I know. Thank you. I was just, you know, being a. branded feminist for all through my life i will ask such questions okay, it was a wonderful you. presentation thank you ma'am thank you both of you it was a, such a wonderful presentations to draw the comparative analysis through statistics and that too also very recent statistics now we have the last presenter of the session biplop mondol he is a faculty assistant professor with kalna college uh, upper two a uh, good evening to all uh, my name is biplav mondol assistant professor department of political science kalna college so uh, i'm going to present my paper um, my paper is about cultural diversity and women the indian experience uh, first of all we need to know what is cultural diversity so there is a different meanings of cultural diversity so cultural diversity is the word that can mean a few different things sometimes it's used to talk about how society have become more diverse with the people of various races cultures religions uh, living together another way uh, people use cultural diversity uh, is to describe how a government or country deals with the diversity it's about promoting respect for the differences uh, in public like encouraging people uh, to be tolerant each other's backgrounds and sometimes uh, we talk about uh, cultural diversity uh, is just not about race or culture Uh, it can also include like the uh, gender sexual orientation or differences in how people uh, live their lives compared to what's considered uh, to the norm uh, one of the uh, famous uh, multiculturalist uh, uh, bigu parek uh, talks about two ways of uh, cultural diversity w one is the border approach uh, uh, i'm talking here is only uh, the broader ap approach uh, in broader approach including things like groups uh, fighting women or lgbtq plus uh, now debate uh, boils down uh, how much uh, cultural diversity and women's rights can work together it's about uh, finding a way the respect of different culture and religions uh, while also protecting women's rights in society uh, the idea is to choose a, a multicultural or cultural diverse approach that supports uh, uh, both women's rights and respect diverse culture Uh, in a public life 
uh, now talk about relation between cultural diversity and women. Uh, so cultural diversity, we already said that emphasizes the importance of recognizing, respecting the rights of different cultural groups within the society. Uh, and feminism, especially in recent times and recent waves, acknowledge that uh, women have a specific needs and experience that have shaped by social structure. This perspective challenges the notion of, uh, of formal equality and emphasizes the importance of integrating diverse perspective in public discourse. Uh, uh, so however, uh, multiculturalism, uh, where uh, we need to take, uh, uh, need to say, say that one thing, is here I use multiculturalism and cultural diversity in both the synonymous way. So uh, with the multiculturalism, there is a concern that granting our social rights to cultural groups uh, uh, might perpetuate uh, gender inequalities within those groups. And, and some uh, critics worry that accommodating cultural differences uh, uh, might inadvertently uh, endorse or ignore the gender discrimination within the minority uh, uh, communities. Uh, but uh, regarding this, uh, there is the way, uh, especially the uh, uh, new thinkers of multiculturalism, uh, they want to uh, uh, accommodate not only the community rights, they prioritizing individual rights and autonomy while acknowledging and accommodating cultural differences. It places uh, emphasizing of socioeconomic redistribution attempts to navigate, uh, navigate the balance between uh, recognizing cultural diversity and safeguards of women rights. Uh, now talk about Indian experience on cultural diversity and women. Uh, India, you know, uh, is, India is a very rich uh, cultural heritage and uh, women play here as a very important and crucial role in the uh, uh, diverse cultural landscape. So uh, when India was uh, shaping its rule and principle after the gaining independence, uh, there are uh, 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 different, uh, especially the constituent framers like uh, constituent assembly debate and uh, constitution uh, took several initiatives to ensure the uh, uh, women rights and uh, especially their identity, how to protect their identity. Apart from the constitution, India has also put the place a uh, different ways to recognize uh, honor women identity. Uh, uh, for the instance, there are specific laws, programs that focus empowering women. Uh, now talk about uh, uh, Indian constitution, how to uh, protect women rights. Uh, there are several uh, uh, article here. Uh, in our uh, constitution, uh, for example, uh, Article 14, 15, 16, 39, 39C, uh, 42. So uh, uh, fundamental rights, you can see the fundamental rights or directive principle. They all try to uh, ensure uh, 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 women rights and women uh, 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 try to safeguard the, against the discrimination based on their uh, gender. So uh, now talk about uh, post uh, constitutional initi initiatives uh, on accommodation of women. Uh, here, uh, first took initiative uh, uh, our pri uh, Prime Minister, uh, Pandit Nehruji. So uh, uh, he, after get independence, got independence, he saw that uh, uh, especially Hindu uh, laws that shows that the, uh, them as an inferior. Nehru, as a India's leader, tried to change these laws. And uh, after a long struggle, uh, laws were passed to the given, uh, give a Hindu woman more rights. Uh, now, uh, there are a few certain uh, post-constitutional uh, initiative for the accommodation of women, uh, like uh, National Commission for Women in 1992, uh, Reservation for Women, uh, uh, Self-Local Government, especially 73rd and 74th Constitutional Amendment. Here, uh, 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 this uh, amendment uh, took a major initiative to protect uh, human uh, by politically uh, and other was is the national plan for act national plan of action for the guile child 1991 and 2000 and national policy for empowerment of women 2021 and finally and very recently 2023 uh, 23 a woman reservation bill has to uh, taken uh, some initiatives for the ensuring uh, women rights now, uh, uh, coming to the conclusion, in India, there is a lot of happening with the women's rights and cultural diversity. The mixed feminism, mix of feminism, cultural diversity, and Indian setting, setting is a complex. The countries of constitution tries to harder uh, to ensure equal treatment for women. There have been a big moments like when Nehru worked to change the old laws and giving women more rights 
in areas like inheritance and divorce and keeps working on this the setup of groups uh, set up uh, groups like national commission for women and made policy help women uh, and girls bringing together uh, feminism cultural diversity in india is very tricky now, the constitution promises equal rights but sometimes dealing with the cultural differences clashes with the making sure women are treated fairly it's tough to balancing act to protect human uh, women rights and respect cultural identities so in summary we say that so india has made uh, progress with the laws and efforts but there is still a lot of work to do and make a bridge be uh, gap between what law says and what actually happened balancing the cultural diversity and women's rights needs a careful approach that respects both cultural diversity and women rights that's all thank you thank you biplav that was quite a crispy presentation we're making it shorter and focusing only on the policies and cultural diversities you have talked about lots of policies that have taken place uh, after the independence in the constitution and the changes amendments that have been made interestingly when we talk about this i uh, the very first thing that comes into my mind is uh, if government is favoring the reservation policies or any kind of policies in women empowerment my question would be i should not ask question as a chair but uh, my question makes me ponder a lot but why the fund for the women centers across india by the ugc uh, is reduced almost like shutting them down now this is very important for uh, scholars like you to probe into that why academia instead of women study they have made uh, women studies a rather a more gender specific in their uh, all the policies they are making even in g20 they have talked about gender inclusivity and all but still in ugc when you appear for ugc net or jrf you see that only the subject is women studies not gender studies right scholars like you have to probe into it and i think uh, you have done quite a, a emphatic task by focusing on all these aspects and bringing more cultural diversity into it thanks a lot biplop and uh, this would be the last presentation if you any one of you have any questions to ask him okay thank you thank you for all of you for listening to it and thanks all the presenters who have been here and who have left thank you all of you for the Thank you, Professor Dr. Himadri Roy, Director, SOGDS, IGNO, New Delhi, for kia chhe. So we are we are very thankful to you for having come here, and uh, we have our convener, Dr. Tulika Kaur. I am handing over the microphone to her for a felicitation ceremony. And now we felicitate our Union Secretary, uh, Babu. Babu Sharga. Uh, and uh, I all also call uh, Sharab Jha to come here and TIC, our respected TIC. Uh, he is he is a social worker and uh, he is totally devoted to our college uh, so big, big uh, clap to college er students der ke control korar jonno tar kono bikalpo nei ebong college er joto rokom samoshya ebong development sob bishoye or uposthit buddhi khub bhalo kaj kore আমি সেই মুহূর্তে আমরা কিন্তু ওদের সহযোগিতা সব সময় পাই এ এই যেরকম এদিকে কলেজের উন্নতির জন্য ভাবে আবার সমাজের জন্য ভাবে এই যে কলেজে এই সুপার স্পেশালিটি হসপিটালে কখন রক্ত দেওয়া প্রয়োজন কার কোথায় চিকিৎসার সমস্যা হচ্ছে পুরো ঝাঁপিয়ে পড়ে রাত দিন চব্বিশ ঘন্টা রাত দুটোর সময় কোথাও দরকার হলেও ঝাঁপিয়ে পড়ে একটা গ্রেট সোশ্যাল ওয়ার্কার এবং আমাদের কলেজের জন্য আমাদের এই সময় আমি আমার চেয়ারে আড়াই বছর এই সময়ের মধ্যে ও যেভাবে আমাকে সহযোগিতা করেছে আশা করি ভবিষ্যতে ও খুব ভালো একটা আরও উপরে উঠবে এই কামনা করি ধন্যবাদ থ্যাংক ইউ নাও প্রেরণা প্রেরণা কামিয়া একটা কবিতা হচ্ছে হ্যাঁ ওটা হোক 
right yes and now we uh, actually we are in the last part of our program our conference and this is the valedictory session and now prerona you recite a poem uh, which is very much um ki uh, bolbo relevant with uh, women empowerment okay and women problem also शुभ सन्ध्या उपस्थित सकल यथाजोग्य श्रद्धा सम्मान और भलोबासा एक्चुअली ठीक ठाक प्रिपेयर नहीं मैम बोलें जो कि भूल त्रुटि है एक क्षमा कर देवें आज के निवेदन कवि सुबोध सरकार लेखा कृष्णकलि माहो हमें कृष्णकलि माहो एम ए पीएचडी हमार गा अमावस्या हमार चूल मेष पालक फालगुन पीठ सावताल बरगना दुटो थाई एक बाँकुड़ा एक पुरुलिया गड़िया हाटार मेरे मत आसला देखले भय फालिए आसिना बोमाई बा हाथ दूरे जावा बाबा कत बार हमार बी पड़िए दिए कत बार हमार दुखी माँ बोले मेरे बड़ होते नहीं डाक पे देखो इमेल दलित सम्मेलन पेपर पढ़ते चले हम तुम कृष्णकलि माहो एम ए पीएचडी जार का पीएचडी करतम से प्रफेसर के रचके नहीं जो चाहें कैन रईचक कैन उन्नी बोलें रईचके ना गेले पीएचडी पूर्ण है ना हमें बोल क्या फ्लैटे जो परि उन्नी आतके उठे बोलें ना ना हमारे बाड़ी ना हमारे पीएचडी एक बचर पिछिए गल फोन कर लर हमें रईचके जब होटेल घरे मुकुट मुड़े पड़े हाथ दिलेंवताल परगनार फूक खुले पेलें हाई देखते थकलें से दिन प्रफेसर के फेले पाली गलि कृष्णकलि माहो एम ए पीएचडी कत कष्ट कत अपमान सह्य कर जंगले रत जेगे बी पड़े हमें एखने एस क्यों के जगह झेड़े दे क्यों का जगह झेड़े दे ना पुरुलिया ना कलकाय माँ चेकिंग भेतरे एलम एम ए कृष्ण दाड़िए बाबा के देखे रेखो मानुषार एक हाथ नहीं अफिसर हमार नाम उच्चारण करल कृष्णकलि माहो अभी विमान सीढ़ी दिए उठे माँ विमान सेविका मैडम बोल हाँ नम्बर नहीं गए बसाल सीट बेल्ट बेधे फिलल प्लें रान दौड़ाते शुरू कर दौड़ 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 की गति की तेज की आवाज हमार मन हल विमान रान दौड़ दौड़ा दौड़े कृष्णकलि माहो एम ए पीएचडी कृष्णकलि माहो धन्यवाद थैंक यू प्रेरणा अच्छा प्रेरणार मत अत भलो पारिना तबु हमार मन हलो ओ जो बोलिए एक बोली दिस अल्सो भेरि माच रिलेटेड टू उमेन एमपावरमेंट एंड उमेन एक्सप्लेशन कवि मल्लिका सेंगुप्ते आपनी बोल मार्क्स छड़ा जे बनिए काथा बने जबिर जे मे से कम्पना शुरू कर आर्य पुरुष क्षेत्र जे लालन कर शिशु से जो श्रमिक नय श्रम का बोले? आपनी बोल मार्क्स 
কে শ্রমিক কে শ্রমিক নয় নতুন যন্ত্রের যারা মাস মাইনের কারিগর শুধু তারা শ্রম করে সেই পথক যাকে বুঝতে উপহার দিল সেই শ্রমিক গৃহিণী প্রতিদিন জল তুলে ঘরে মুছে খাবার বানালে হার ভাতে শেষে রাত হলে ছেলেকে পেটে দিয়ে বসে কাঁদে সেও কি শ্রমিক নয় আপনি বলুন মাস শ্রম কাকে বলে গৃহশ্রমী মজুরি হয় না বলে মেয়েগুলো শুধু ঘরে বসে বিপ্লবীর ভাত রেতে দেবে আর কমরেড শুধু চার হাতে কাস্তে আতরে আপনাকে বানায় নেয় এই অভিযোগ কখনো বিপ্লব হলে পৃথিবীতে সর্ব রাজ্য হবে শ্রেণীহীন রাষ্ট্রহীন অল পৃথিবীতে আপনি বলুন শ্রমিক কে শ্রমিক নয় আর মেয়েরা কি শুধু বিপ্লবের সেবা দাসী হবে ধন্যবাদ now this is the thank you giving program and vote of thanks that is ami dicche oi ta ta after 28 hours now this is the last part and oh sorry 20 uh, 48 hours this is the last part and i think we enjoy very much actually our resource person are not our resource person they are resourceful person actually they are resourceful person they are they have full of resources so this is the last part and i think we all feel sad and now this is the very hard things to give thanks to all now first i give, uh, give thanks to dr professor dr sanjari rai mukherjee without which constant support and continuous support it may not be possible to conduct such a successful conference now our, uh, i thank, uh, i give thanks to our distinguished speaker uh, professor dr shadika alem vice uh, honorable vice chancellor of jagannath university dhaka ডক্টর দীপা যোশী জেন্ডার অ্যান্ড সোশ্যাল ইনক্লুশন লিড ইন্টারন্যাশনাল ওয়াটার ম্যানেজমেন্ট ইনস্টিটিউশন শ্রীলঙ্কা ডক্টর ফৌজিয়া মান্নান চেয়ারপারসন প্রফেসর ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ সোসাইটি ফ্যাকাল্টি অফ লিবারাল আর্টস অ্যান্ড সোশ্যাল সায়েন্স ইস্ট ওয়েস্ট ইউনিভার্সিটি ঢাকা ডক্টর কাঞ্চন নামা জেন্ডার স্পেশালিস্ট মেম্বার অফ NGO and UN Global Forum Nepal. He tried again and again but failed to join because now she traveled to, from India to Dubai. So he failed to join. Okay. And I also give thanks to Lindsay Churchill, Professor of History and Director, Women Research Center, Oklahoma University, Central University of Oklahoma, USA, Dr. Jadis Hanson, Fulbright Program Advisor, Nebraska University, Professor Ishita Mukhobata, Professor Department of Economics, Professor Dr. Meena Pillai, Dean and Faculty of Arts, Professor Institute of English Director, Center for Cultural Study, University of Kerala, Professor Himadri Roy, thank you so much, sir. Director and School of Gender and Development Studies. Professor Ranjita Chakravarti, Department of Political Science. Professor Pinaki Rai, Dean, Students Welfare and Professor, Department of English. Thank you very much, sir. Professor Nidja Sarkar. And now, I give thanks to our uh, teacher in charge who gives us constant support. Uh, Dr. Oh, sorry, Sri Ajit Vishwas sir. And now our advisory committee 
Professor Dr. Deepak Kumar Roy, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Raigon University, Professor Dr. Shokata Pai, Honorable President, Governing Body, Chachal College, Sri Omit Roy, Coordinator, IPSC, Chachal College, Professor Dr. Shukrata Saha, Raigon University, Dr. Dullab Sarkar, Registered Raigon University, and my Favorite Dada, Dr. Sholil Kumar Mukhopadhyay, Principal of Shamshi College. Now, I give thanks to our organizing committee and organizing committee of Raigon University also, and special thanks gives to Devajyoti Tarabdar, Dr. Devajyoti Tarabdar. Dr. Muhammad, uh, Dr. Ali Akbar, Dr. Muhammad Moin Sheikh, Dr. Sajan Sarkar, Apur Namondol. I give special thanks to Devajati Sarkar and Apur Namondol, Srimadhi Shonglita Mishra, and another special thanks gives to Dr. Sarkar. Without his constant, constant support, it's not possible. And I also give thanks to Tanwai Pande and uh, Sudipta Ghosh. Professor Shokutpar, Dr. Hema Rao, Simati Purvadas, Simati Momita Chatterjee, Simati Orpita Shah, Sri Pankaj Kumar uh, Karnokar, and Sri Darling Shah. I don't know. There he and I also give thanks to our total NSS team, the volunteer of NSS team. <laughs> they serve day and night, especially And my department, the Department of Economics, come here. I also give thanks to our total teaching and non-teaching staff of Tatsun College and the decorator team and a special thanks gives to Kutayo, technical teams, non-technical teams, Govindo, where is Govindo, I don't know. Thank you so much, Govindo, and our mic man, uh, Rindu, Rindu Sound, and our decorators team and food also uh, and i also give thanks to our funding main funding agency icssr and from here i also give thanks to uh, mr dipti kagwal uh, who sponsor uh, Thank you so much, Ditti. Thank you so much. Hello. Ditti Kagarwal, Pankaj Dalmia, Sudipto Ghosh, they contribute, they sponsor. Without their help, it will not be possible. So, thank you so much. And please come here, my joint conveyor. <laughs> 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 
Since no one is there to thank Dr. Tulika Kaur, let me take the privilege of thanking her and and uh, crediting her for this entire conference. So a big round of applause for the convener and the joint convener, both standing before you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, Student Union to Bulgaria. Hi. I'm speaking in English because this is getting recorded for records. So officially, I would like to thank the Department of Economics and Women's Cell and IQSC Chachol College for collaborating with Center for Women's Studies and IQSC Raiganj University because we really are very happy that we could collaborate academically with this institution and bring to light this wonderful two-day international conference. It is very important to note that such collaborations are very important for both the institutions and uh, the students get the maximum benefit out of it. So we have had scholars from all over India out here. We have had students from all the neighboring region, the girls from uh, the girls and boys from all the neighboring regions. That is the purpose of hosting such seminars and I think the purpose has been met. My heartfelt thanks and regards to Dean Students Welfare Raiganj University Professor Pinaki Rai who has come here and who has been here throughout the day. So a huge round of applause to him. I, uh, I do not want to repeat the thanks because uh, already uh, Convener Madam has already thanked everybody but I think on behalf of Raiganj University we thank both of us thank uh, Sri Ajit Disharsh, uh, the uh, teacher in charge of Chachal College, our dear students of Chachal College and all the staff and teachers and, and uh, students of Chachal College and all the participants who have come here. So this, this thanks is on the part of Raiganj University. I also like to say that due to certain important events, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor and uh, Honorable uh, uh, Respected Registrar and other members they could not uh, travel here, but they have sent their best wishes to the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can share my name. I'm Arik Tudan. Yes, I'm Arik Tudan. Thanks to all of you. Special thanks gives to our uh, Chachal College Students Union. And very, very special thanks gives to Rajat Supramondo. Yes. Uh, he is scholar of uh, Dr. Sanjit Tattachi. And I am a child of the Shuruta Jaman I am a national anthem. Please. Uh, on behalf of all the resource persons, uh, Ranjita, I have a message for you. I have a message for you. I have a message for you. কিছু স্মৃতি নিয়ে গেলাম এক মুঠো ভালোবাসা পেছনে ছেড়ে গেলাম ফ্রম বিহাফ অফ রিসোর্স পারসন थैंक यू Chanu Ganu Ganu Dinaya Kajayani Bharat Bhag Vidhata Banjab Shindu Gujarat Maratha David Utkalo Ganga Bind Himachalo Jumuna Ganga Utchalo Jano Dito Ranga Tabo Shubhana Me Jade Tabo Shubhana Shisho Maage Gahe Tabo Jayo Katha Jano Gano Mangal Dayak Jayo He Bharato Bhag Vihata Jayo He Jayo He Jayo He Jayo, 
दुई दिन इंटरनेशनल कन्फारेंस आज एखने शेष हल धन्यवाद Thank you.